Section 16 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 16, Chapter 5, Arianism, by M. H. Quadkin. Here was a deadlock. All parties had failed. The Anomoeans were active enough, but pure Arianism was hopelessly discredited throughout the empire. The Nicenes had Egypt and the West, but they could not overcome the court and Asia. The Eastern Semi-Arians were the strongest party, but such men of violence could not close the strife. In this deadlock nothing was left but specious charity and colourless indefiniteness and this was the plan of the new Homoean party, formed by Acacius and Eudoxius in the east, Ursatius and Valens in the west. A general council was decided on, but it was divided into two, the westerns to meet at Ariminum, the easterns at Seleucia in Cilicia, the headquarters of the army then operating against the Isaurians. Meanwhile, parties began to group themselves afresh. The Anomoeans went with the Homoeans, from whom alone they could expect any favour, while the Semi-Arians drew closer to the Nicenes, and were welcomed by Hilary of Poitiers in his conciliatory De Synodis. The next step was a small meeting of Homoean and Semi-Arian leaders, held in the Emperor's presence on Pentecost Eve, 22nd May, 359, to draw up a creed to be laid before the councils. The dated creed, or fourth of Sirmium, is conservative in its appeals to scripture, in its solemn reverence for the Lord, in its rejection of essence, usia, as not found in scripture, and its insistence on the mystery of the eternal generation. But its central clause gave a decisive advantage to the Homoeans. We say that the Son is like the Father in all things as the scriptures say and teach. Even the Anomoeans could sign this like the Father, as the Scriptures say, and no further, and we find very little likeness taught in Scripture. Like the Father, if you will, but not like God, for no creature can be. Like the Father, certainly, but not in essence, for likeness, which is not identity, implies difference. Or in other words, likeness is a question of degree. Of these three replies, the first is fair, the third perfectly sound. The reception of the creed was hostile in both councils. The westerns at Ariminum rejected it, deposed the Homoean leaders, and ratified the Nicene creed. In the end, however, they accepted the Sirmian, but with the addition of a stringent series of anathemas against Arianism, which Valens accepted for the moment. The easterns at Seleucia rejected it likewise, deposed the Homoean leaders, and ratified the Lucianic creed. Both sides sent deputies to the emperor, as had been arranged, and after much pressure these deputies signed a revision of the dated creed on the night of 31st December 359. The Homoeans now saw their way to final victory. By throwing over the Anomoeans and condemning their leader Aetheus, they were able to enforce the prohibition of the semi-Arian Homoeusion, and then it only remained to revise the dated creed again, for a council held at Constantinople in February 360, and send the semi-Aryan leaders into exile. The Homoean domination never extended beyond the Alps. Gaul was firmly Nicene, and Constantius could do nothing there after the mutiny at Paris in January 360 had made Julian independent of him. The few Western Aryans soon died out, but in the East the Homoean power lasted nearly twenty years. Its strength lay in its appeal to the moderate men who were tired of strife, and to the confused thinkers who did not see that a vital question was at issue. The dated creed seemed reverent and safe, and its defects would not have been easy to see if the Anomoeans had not made them plain. But the position of parties was greatly changed since 356. First, Hilary of Poitiers had done something to bring together conservatives and Nicenes, then Athanasius took up the work in his own De Synodis, 
it is a noble venture of friendship to his old conservative enemies. The semi-Aryans, or many of them, accepted of the essence, ectis usias, and the Nicene anathemas, and doubted only of the homoousion. Such men, says he, are not to be treated as enemies, but reasoned with as brethren who differ from us only in the use of a word which sums up their own teaching as well as ours. When they confess that the Lord is a true Son of God and not a creature, they grant all that we are contending for. Their own homoi usion, without of the essence, does not shut out Arianism, but the two together amount to homo usion. Moreover, homoi usion is illogical, for likeness is of properties and qualities, whereas the essence must be the same or different, so that the word rather suggests Arianism, whereas homo usion shuts it out effectually. If they accept our doctrine, Sooner or later they will find that they cannot refuse its necessary safeguard. But if Nicenes and Semi-Aryans drew together, so did Homoeans and Anomoeans. Any ideas of conciliating Nicene support were destroyed by the exile of Milesius, the new bishop of Antioch, for preaching a sermon carefully modelled on the dated creed, but substantially Nicene in doctrine. A schism arose at Antioch, and henceforth the leaders of the Homoeans were practically Arians. The mutiny at Paris implied a civil war, but just as it was beginning, Constantius died at Mopsucrene beneath Mount Taurus, 3rd November 361, and Julian remained sole emperor. We are not here concerned with the general history of his reign, or even with his policy towards the Christians, only with its bearing on Arianism. In general, he held to the toleration of the Edict of Milan. The Christians are not to be persecuted, only deprived of special privileges, but the emperor's favour must be reserved for the worshippers of the gods. So the administration was unfriendly to the Christians, and left occasional outrages unpunished, or dismissed them with a thin reproof. But these were no great matters, for the Christians were now too strong to be lynched at pleasure. Julian's chief endeavour was to put new life into heathenism, and in this the heathens themselves hardly took him seriously. His only act of definite persecution was the edict near the end of his reign which forbade the Christians to teach the classics, and this is disapproved by the cool and impartial heathen Ammianus. Every blow struck by Julian against the Christians fell first on the Homoeans whom Constantius had left in power, and the reaction he provoked against Greek culture threatened the philosophical postulates of Arianism. But Julian cared little for the internal quarrels of the Christians, and only broke his rule of contemptuous impartiality when he recognised one greater than himself in the detestable Athanasius. Before long an edict recalled the exiled bishops, though it did not replace them in their churches. If others were in possession, it was not Julian's business to turn them out. This was toleration, but Julian had a malicious hope of still further embroiling the confusion. If the Christians were left to themselves, they would quarrel like beasts. He got a few scandalous wranglings, but in the main he was mistaken. The Christians only closed their ranks against the common enemy. The Arians also were sound Christians in this matter. Blind old Maris of Chalcedon came and cursed him to his face. Back to their cities came the survivors of the exiled bishops, no longer travelling in pomp and circumstance to their noisy councils, but bound on the nobler errand, of seeking out their lost or scattered flocks. It was time to resume Hilary's interrupted work of conciliation. Semi-Aryan violence had discredited in advance the new conservatism at Seleucia, but Athanasius had things more in his favour, for Julian's reign had not only sobered partisanship, but left a clear field for the strongest moral force in Christendom to assert itself. And this force was with the Nicenes. Athanasius reappeared at Alexandria, 22nd February, 362, and held a small council there before Julian drove him out again. It was decided first that Arians who came over to the Nicene side were to retain their rank on condition of accepting the Nicene council, none but the chiefs and active defenders of Arianism being reduced to lay communion. Then, after clearing up some misunderstandings of East and West and trying to settle the schism at Antioch, by inducing the old Nicenes, who at present had no bishop, to accept Milesius, they took in hand two new questions of doctrine. One was the divinity of the Holy Spirit. 
its reality was acknowledged except by the Aryans, but did it amount to co-essential deity? That was still an open question, but now that attention was fully directed to the subject, it appeared from scripture that the theory of eternal distinctions in the divine nature must either be extended to the Holy Spirit or abandoned. Athanasius took one course, the Anamoeans the other, while the semi-Aryans tried to make a difference between the Lord's deity and that of the Holy Spirit, and this gradually became the chief obstacle to their union with the Nicenes. The other subject of debate was the new system of Apollinarius of Laodicea, the most suggestive of all the ancient heresies. Apollinarius was the first who fairly faced the difficulty that if all men are sinners, and the Lord was not a sinner, he cannot have been truly man. Apollinarius replied that sin lies in the weakness of the human spirit, and accounted for the sinlessness of Christ by putting in its place the divine Logos, and adding the important statement that if the human spirit was created in the image of the Logos, Genesis 1.28, Christ would not be the less human, but the more so for the difference. The spirit in Christ was human spirit, although divine. Further, the Logos, which in Christ was human spirit, was eternal. Apart, then, from the Incarnation, the Logos was archetypal man as well as God, so that the Incarnation was not simply an expedient to get rid of sin, but the historic revelation of that which was latent in the Logos from eternity. The Logos and man are not alien beings, but joined in their inmost nature, and in a real sense, each is incomplete without the other. Suggestive as this is, Apollinarius reaches no true incarnation. Against him it was decided that the incarnation implied a human soul as well as a human body, a decision which struck straight enough at the Arians, but quite missed the triple division of body, soul and spirit, 1 Thessalonians verse 23, on which Apollinarius based his system. Athanasius was exiled again almost at once, Julian's anger was kindled by the news that he had baptised some heathen ladies at Alexandria, but his work remained. At Antioch, indeed, it was marred by Lucifer of Calaris, who would have nothing to do with Milesius, and consecrated Paulinus as bishop for the old Nicenes. So the schism continued, and henceforth the rising Nicene party of Pontus and Asia was divided by this personal question from the older Nicenes of Egypt and the West. But upon the whole, the lenient policy of the council was a great success. Bishop after bishop gave in his adhesion to the Nicene faith. Friendly Samarians came in like Cyril of Jerusalem, old conservatives followed, and at last, in Jovian's time, the arch-enemy Acacius himself gave in his signature. Even creeds were remodelled in all directions in a Nicene sense, as at Jerusalem and Antioch and in Cappadocia and Mesopotamia. True the other parties were not idle. The Homoean coalition was even more unstable than the Eusebian, and broke up of itself as soon as opinion was free. One party favoured the Anamoeans, another drew nearer to the Nicenes, while the Semi-Arians completed the confusion by confirming the Seleucian decisions and reissuing the Lucianic creed. But the main current set in a Nicene direction, and the Nicene faith was rapidly winning its way to victory when the process was thrown back for nearly twenty years by Julian's death in Persia, 26th June, 363. Julian's death seemed to leave the empire in the gift of four barbarian generals, but while they were debating, a few of the soldiers outside hailed a favourite named Jovian as emperor. The cry was taken up, and in a few minutes the young officer found himself the successor of Augustus. Jovian was a decided Christian, though his personal character did no credit to the gospel. But his religious policy was one of genuine toleration. If Athanasius was graciously received at Antioch, the Arians were told with scant courtesy that they could hold meetings as they pleased at Alexandria. So all parties went on consolidating themselves. The Anamoeans had been restive since the condemnation of Aetius at Constantinople, but it was not till now that they lost hope of the Homoeans and formed an organized sect. But all these movements came to an end with the sudden death of Jovian, 16th to 17th February 364. This time the generals chose, 
and they chose the Pannonian Valentinian for emperor. A month later, he assigned the east from Thrace to his brother Valens. Valentinian was a good soldier and little more, though he could honour learning and carry forward the reforming work of Constantine. His religious policy was toleration. If he refused to displace the few Arian bishops he found in possession, he left the churches free to choose Nicene successors. So the West soon recovered from the strife which Constantius had introduced. It was otherwise in the East. Valens was a weaker character, timid and inert, but not inferior to his brother in scrupulous care for the interests of his subjects. No soldier, but more or less good at finance. For a while events continued to develop naturally. The Homoean bishops held their sees, but their influence was fast declining. The Anamoeans were forming a schism on one side, the Nicenes were recovering power on the other. On both sides, the simpler doctrines were driving out the compromises. It was time for even the semi-Arians to bestir themselves. A few years before they were beyond question the majority in the East, but this was not so certain now. The Nicenes had made a great advance since the Council of Anxira, and were now less conciliatory. Lucifer had compromised them in one direction, Apollinarius in another, and even Marcellus had never been disavowed. But the chief cause of suspicion to the semi-Arians was now the advance of the Nicenes to a belief in the deity of the Holy Spirit. It was some time before Valens had a policy to declare. He was only a catechumen, perhaps cared little for the questions before his elevation, and inherited no assured position like Constantius. It was some time before he fell into the hands of the Homoean Eudoxius of Constantinople, a man of experience and learning, whose mild prudence gave him just the help he needed. In fact, a Homoean policy was really the easiest for the moment. Heathenism had failed in Julian's hands, and an Anamoean course was even more hopeless, while the Nicenes were still a minority outside Egypt. The only alternative was to favour the semi-Arians, and this too was full of difficulties. Upon the whole, the Homoeans were still the strongest party in 365. They were in possession of the churches and had astute leaders, and their doctrine had not yet lost its attraction for the quiet men who were tired of controversy. In the spring of 365, an imperial rescript commanded the municipalities to drive out from their cities the bishops who had been exiled by Constantius and restored by Julian. At Alexandria, the populace declared that the rescript did not apply to Athanasius, whom Julian had not restored, and raised such dangerous riots that the matter had to be referred back to Valens. Then came the revolt of Procopius, who seized Constantinople and very nearly displaced Valens. Athanasius was restored and could not safely be disturbed again. Then, after the Procopian revolt, came the Gothic War, which kept Valens occupied till 369, and before he could return to church affairs, he had lost his best adviser, for Eudoxius of Constantinople was ill replaced by the rash Demophilus. The Homoian party was the last hope of Arianism. The original doctrine of Arius had been decisively rejected at Nicaea, the Eusebian coalition was broken up by the Sirmian Manifesto, and if the Homoian Union also failed, its failure meant the fall of Arianism. Now the weakness of the Homoian power is shown by the growth of a new Nicene party in the most Arian province of the empire. Cappadocia was a country district, yet Julian found it incorrigibly Christian, and we hear very little of heathenism from Basil. But it was a stronghold of Arianism, and here was formed the alliance which decided the fate of Arianism. Serious men like Melitius had only been attracted to the side of the Homoeans by their professions of reverence for the person of the Lord, and began to look back to the Nicene Council, when it appeared that Eudoxius and his friends were practically Arians after all. Of the old conservatives also, there were many who felt that the semi-Arian position was unsound, and yet could find no satisfaction in the indefinite doctrine professed at court. Thus the Homoean domination was threatened with a double secession. If the two groups of malcontents could form a union with each other, and with the older Nicenes of Egypt and the West, they would be much the strongest of the parties. This was the policy of the man who was now coming to the front of the Nicene leaders. 
Basil of Caesarea, the Cappadocian Caesarea, was a disciple of the Athenian schools and a master of heathen eloquence and learning, and man of the world enough to secure the friendly interest of men of all sorts. His connections lay among the old conservatives, though he had been a decided opponent of Arianism since 360. He succeeded to the bishopric of Caesarea in 370. The crisis was near. Valence moved eastward in 371, reaching Caesarea in time for the great midwinter festival of Epiphany, 372. Many of the lesser bishops yielded, but threats and blandishments were thrown away on their metropolitan, and when Valence himself and Basil met face to face, the emperor was overawed. More than once the order was prepared for his exile, but it was never issued. Valence went forward on his journey, leaving behind a princely gift for Basil's poor house. Thenceforth he fixed his quarters at Antioch, till the disasters of the Gothic War called him back to Europe in 378. Armed with spiritual power, which in some sort extended over Galatia and Armenia, Basil was now free to labour at his plan. Homoian malcontents formed the nucleus of the League, but old conservatives came in, and Athanasius gave his patriarchal blessing to the scheme. But the difficulties were enormous. The League was full of jealousies. Athanasius might recognise the orthodoxy of Miletius, but others almost went the length of banning all who had ever been Arians. Others again were lukewarm or sunk in worldliness, while the West stood aloof. The confessors of 355 were mostly gathered to their rest, and the Church of Rome cared little for troubles that were not likely to reach herself. Nor was Basil quite the man for the work. His courage, indeed, was indomitable. He ruled Cappadocia from a sickbed, and bore down opposition by sheer force of will, and to this he joined an ascetic fervour which secured the devotion of his friends, and often the respect of his enemies. But we miss the lofty self-respect of Athanasius. The ascetic is usually too full of his own purposes to feel sympathy with others, or even to feign it like a diplomatist. Basil had worldly prudence enough to dissemble his belief in the Holy Spirit, not enough to shield his nearest friends from his imperious temper. Small wonder if the great scheme met with many difficulties. The declining years of Athanasius were spent in peace. Heathenism was still a power at Alexandria, but the Arians were nearly extinct. One of his last public acts was to receive a confession presented on behalf of Marcellus, who was still living in extreme old age at Ancyra. It was a sound confession so far as it went, and though Athanasius did not agree with Marcellus, he had never thought his errors vital, so he accepted it, refusing once again to sacrifice the old companion of his exile. It was nobly done, but it did not conciliate Basil. The school of Marcellus expired with him, and if Apollinarius was forming another, he was at any rate a resolute enemy of Arianism. Meanwhile, the churches of the East seemed in a state of universal dissolution. Disorder under Constantius became confusion worse confounded under Valence. The exiled bishops were so many centres of strife, and personal quarrels had full scope. When, for example, Basil's brother Gregory was expelled from Nyssa by a riot got up by Anthemus of Tiana, he took refuge under the eyes of Anthemus at Douara, where another riot had driven out the Arian bishop. Creeds were in the same confusion. The Homoians had no consistent principle beyond the rejection of technical terms. Some of their bishops were substantially Nicenes, while others were thoroughgoing Anomoeans. There was room for all in the happy family of Demophilus. Church history records no clearer period of decline than this. The descent from Athanasius to Basil is plain. From Basil to Cyril it is rapid. The victors of Constantinople are but the epigoni of a mighty contest. Athanasius passed away in 373, and Alexandria became the prey of Arian violence. The deliverance came suddenly, and in the confusion of the greatest disaster that had ever yet befallen Rome. When the Huns came up from the Asiatic steppes, the Goths sought refuge beneath the shelter of the Roman eagles. But the greed and peculations of Roman officials drove them to revolt, and when Valens himself, with the whole army of the East, encountered them near Hadrianople, 9th August, 378, his defeat was overwhelming. Full two-thirds of the Roman army perished in the slaughter, and the emperor himself was never heard of more. The blow was crushing. For the first time since the days of Gallienus, 
the empire could place no army in the field. The care of the whole world now rested on the western emperor, Gratian, the son of Valentinian, a youth of nineteen. Gratian was a zealous Christian, and as a western he held the Nicene faith. His first step was to proclaim religious liberty in the east, except for Anamoeans and for Tinians, a small sect supposed to have pushed the doctrine of Marcellus too far. As toleration was still the general law of the empire, though Valens might have exiled individual bishops, the gain of the rescript fell almost entirely to the Nicenes. The exiles found little difficulty in resuming the government of their flocks, or even in sending missions to the few places where the Arians were strong, like that undertaken by Gregory of Nantianzus to Constantinople. The semi-Arians were divided. Numbers of them joined the Nicenes, while the rest took an independent position. Thus the Homoian power in the provinces collapsed of itself, and almost without a struggle, before it was touched by persecution. Gratian's next step was to share his heavy burden with a colleague. The new emperor came from the far west of Corca near Segovia, and to him was entrusted the Gothic War, and with it the government of all the provinces east of Sirmium. Theodosius was therefore a western and a Nicene, with a full measure of Spanish courage and intolerance. The war was not very dangerous, for the Goths could do nothing with their victory, and Theodosius was able to deal with the church long before it ended. A dangerous illness early in 380 led to his baptism by Acholius of Thessalonica, and this was the natural signal for a more decided policy. A law dated 27th February 380 commanded all men to follow the Nicene doctrine, committed by the Apostle Peter to the Romans, and now professed by Damasus of Rome and Peter of Alexandria and threatened heretics with temporal punishment. In this he seems to abandon Constantine's test of orthodoxy by subscription to a creed, returning to Aurelian's requirement of communion with the chief bishops of Christendom. But the mention of St. Peter, and the choice both of Rome and Alexandria, are enough to show that he was still a stranger to the state of parties in the East. Theodosius made his formal entry into Constantinople 24th November 380 and at once required the bishop either to accept the Nicene faith or to leave the city. Demophilus honourably refused to give up his heresy, and adjourned his services to the suburbs. But the mob of Constantinople was Arian, and their stormy demonstrations when the Cathedral of the Twelve Apostles was given up to Gregory of Nazianzus made Theodosius waver. Not for long. A second edict, in January 381, forbade all heretical assemblies inside cities, and ordered the churches everywhere to be given up to the Nicenes. Thus was Arianism put down, as it had been set up, by the civil power. Nothing remained but to clear away the wrecks of the contest. Once more an imperial summons went forth for a council of the eastern bishops to meet at Constantinople in May 381. It was a sombre gathering. Even the conquerors can have had no more hopeful feeling than that of satisfaction to see the end of the long contest. Only 150 bishops were present, none from the west of Thessalonica. The semi-Arians, however, mustered 36, under Eleusius of Sitzikus. Militius of Antioch presided, and the Egyptians were not invited to the earlier sittings, or at least were not present. Theodosius was no longer neutral, as between the old and new Nicenes. After ratifying the choice of Gregory of Nancyansus as bishop of Constantinople, the next move was to sound the semi-Arians. They were still a strong party beyond the Bosphorus, so that their friendship was important. But Eleusius was not to be tempted. However he might oppose the Anamoeans, he could not forgive the Nicenes their doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Those of the semi-Arians who were willing to join the Nicenes had already done so, and the rest were obstinate. They withdrew from the council and gave up their churches like the Arians. Whatever jealousies might divide the conquerors, the contest with Arianism was now at an end. Pontus and Syria were still divided from Rome and Egypt on the question of Miletius, and there were germs of future trouble in the disposition of Alexandria to look to Rome for help against the upstart sea of Constantinople. But against Arianism the council was united. Its first canon is a solemn ratification of the Nicene Creed in its original form, with an anathema against all the Arianizing parties. It only remained for the emperor to complete the work of the council. An edict in the middle of July forbade Arians of all sorts to build churches even outside cities, 
and at the end of the month Theodosius issued an amended definition of orthodoxy. The true faith was henceforth to be guarded by the demand of communion no longer with Rome and Alexandria, but with Constantinople, Alexandria and the chief seas of the east, and the choice of cities is significant. A small place like Nyssa might be included for the personal eminence of its bishop, but the omission of Hadrianople, Perinthus, Ephesus and Nicomedia shows the determination to leave a clear field for the supremacy of Constantinople. So far as numbers went, the cause of Arianism was not hopeless even yet. It was fairly strong in Asia, could raise dangerous riots in Constantinople, and had on its side the western empress mother Justina. But its fate was only a question of time. Its cold logic generated no fiery enthusiasm. Its recent origin allowed no venerable traditions to grow up round it, and its imperial claims cut it off from any appeal to provincial feeling. So when the last overtures of Theodosius fell through in 383, Arianism soon ceased to be a religion in the civilized world. Such existence as it kept up for the next 300 years was due to its barbarian converts. End of section 16. Section 17 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 17. Chapter 6. The Organization of the Church by C. H. Turner. Part 1. Christian Organization was the means of expressing that which is behind and beneath all its details, namely the underlying and penetrating consciousness of the oneness of the Christian body and the Christian life. It was the process by which the separate charismata could be developed and differentiated, while at the same time the unity of the whole was safeguarded. Looked at it in this light, the history of organization in the Christian church is in its mainstream the history of two processes, partly successive, partly simultaneous, but always closely related. The process by which the individual communities became complete in themselves, sufficient for their own needs, microcosms of the church at large, and the process by which the communities thus organized as units proceeded to combine in an always more formal and more extensive federation. But these two processes were not merely successive. Just as there never had been a time when the separate communities, before they became fully organized, were devoid of outside ministration or supervision, so there never came a period when the fully organized communities lived only to themselves. Unity was preserved by informal means. Till the growing size and number of the communities and the increasing complexity of circumstances made informal means inadequate, and further, formal organization imperative. And again, though the formal self-expression of the individual community necessarily preceded the formal self-expression of the federation of communities, yet the history of organizations within the single community does not come to an abrupt end as soon as the community becomes complete in itself. All functions essential for the Christian life are henceforth there, but as numbers increase and needs and duties multiply, the superabundant vitality of the organism shows itself in the differentiation of new, though always subordinate, functions. And therefore, side by side with the well-known history of the Federation of the Christian Churches, it will be our business to trace also the obscure and less recognized, but perhaps not less important, processes which were going on, simultaneously with the larger process of the Federation, in the individual churches, and especially in those of them which were most influential as models to the rest. A. In the early days of Christianity, the first beginnings of a new community were of a very simple kind. Indeed, the local organization had at first no need to be anything but rudimentary. 
just because the community was never thought of as complete in itself, apart from its apostolic founder, or other representatives of the missionary ministry. Presbyters and deacons no doubt existed in these communities from the first. Presbyters were ordained for each church as it was founded, on St. Paul's first missionary journey. Bishops and deacons constitute together with the holy people the Church of Philippi. These purely local officials were naturally chosen from among the first converts in each district, and to them were naturally assigned the duties of providing for the permanently recurring needs of Christian life, especially the sacraments of baptism. St. Paul indicates that baptism was not normally the work of an apostle and the Eucharist, but the evidence of the earlier epistles of St. Paul is decisive as to the small relative importance which this local ministry enjoyed. The true ministry of the first generation was the ordered hierarchy, first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, of which the apostle speaks with such emphasis in his first epistle to the Corinthians. Next in due order, after the ranks of the primary ministry, came the gifts of miracles, then powers, then gifts of healing. And only after these, wrapped up in the obscure designation of help and governments, can we find room for the local service of presbyters and deacons. Even without the definite evidence of the Acts and the pastoral epistles and St. Clements of Rome, it would be already clear enough that the powers of the local ministry were narrowly limited, and that to the higher ministry, the exercise of whose gifts was not confined to any one community but was independent of place altogether, belonged not only the general right of supervision and ultimate authority over local churches, but also in particular the imparting of the gift of the Spirit, whether in what we call confirmation or what we call ordination. In effect, the Church of the First Age may almost be said to have consisted of a laity grouped in local communities and a ministry that moved about from place to place to do the work of missionaries to the heathen and of preachers and teachers to the converts. Most of St. Paul's epistles to churches are addressed to the community the holy people, the brethren, without any hint in the title of the existence of a local clergy, the apostle and the Christian congregation, are the two factors of primary account. The Didache shows us how right down to the end of the first century, in remoter districts, the communities depended on the services of wandering apostles, or of prophets and teachers, sometimes wandering, sometimes settled and how they held by comparison in very light esteem their presbyters and deacons. Even a well-established church, like that of Corinth, with half a century of history behind it, was able, however unreasonably, to refuse to recognize in its local ministry any right of tenure other than the will of the community. And when the Roman church intervened, to point out the gravity of the blow thus struck at the principle of Christian order, it was still the community of Rome which addressed the community of Corinth. And this custom of writing, in the name or to the address of the community, continued, a relic of an earlier age, well into the days of the strictest monarchical episcopacy. It was not so much the bishop's headship of the community as the multiplication of the clergy, which, as we shall see, made the real gap between the bishop and his people. Most of our documents, then, of the first century, show us the local churches neither self-sufficient nor self-contained, but dependent for all special ministries upon the visits of the superior officers of the church. On the other hand, most of our documents of the second century, in its earlier years the Ignatian letters, and as an ever-increasing bulk of evidence as the century goes on, shows us the local churches complete in themselves, with an officer at the head of each who concentrates in his hands both the powers of the local ministers and those also which had at first been reserved exclusively for the general ministry, but who is himself, as strictly limited in the extent of his jurisdiction to a single church 
as were the humbler presbyter bishops from whom he derived his name. When we have explained how the supreme powers of the general ministry were made to devolve on an individual who belonged to the local ministry, we have explained the origin of episcopacy. With that problem of explanation, we have not here to deal in detail. We have only to recognize the result and its importance. When in and with the bishop, the local church sufficed in itself for the extraordinary as well as for the ordinary functions of church government and Christian life. In those early days of episcopacy, among the diminutive groups of Christian strangers and sojourners, which were dotted over the pagan world of the second century, we must conceive of a quite special closeness of relation between a bishop and his people. Regularly, and in all cities, and it was in the provinces where city life was most developed that the church made quickest progress, a bishop is found at the head of the community of Christians, and his intimacy with his people was in those primitive days unhindered by the interposition of any hierarchy of functionaries or attendants. His flock was small enough for him to carry out to the letter the pastoral metaphor and to call his sheep by name, if the consent of the Christian people had always been, as Clement of Rome tells us, a necessary preliminary to the ordination of Christian ministers, in the case of the appointment of their bishop, the people did not consent merely. They elected. Not till the fourth century did the clergy begin to acquire first a separate and ultimately a predominant share in the process of choice. Even though the angel of the church in the apocalypse may not have been, in the mind of the seer, at all intended to refer to the bishop, yet this quasi-identification of the community with its representative exactly expresses the ideal of second-century writers. The whole number of you I welcome in God's name in the person of Onesimus. In Polybius I beheld the whole multitude of you, writes Ignatius to the Christians of Ephesius and Trallus. Be subject to the bishop and to one another, in his injunction to the Magnesians. The power of Christian worship is in the prayer of the bishop and the whole church. So too to Justin Martyr, the brethren, as we are called, and the president, are the essential figures in the portraiture of the Christian society. If it is true that in the first century the apostle founder and the community as founded by him are the two outstanding elements of Christian organization, it is no less true that in the second century the twin ideas of bishop and people attained a prominence which throws all subordinate distinctions into the background. Even as late as the middle of the third century we see Cyprian, who was quite misunderstood if he is looked on only as an innovator in the sphere of organization, maintaining and emphasizing at every turn the intimate union in normal church life of bishop and laity, while he also recognizes the duty of the laity in abnormal circumstances, to separate from the communion of the bishop who had proved himself unworthy of their choice. It is the people in the first place which has the power both of electing worthy bishops and of spurning the unworthy. Similar witness for the East is born in the same century by the Didascalia Apostolorum, where bishop and laity are addressed in turn, and their mutual relations are almost the main theme of the writer. But this personal relation of the bishop to his flock, which was the ideal of church administrators and thinkers from Ignatius to Cyprian, could only find effective realization in a relatively small community. The very success of the Christian propaganda and the consequent increase everywhere of the number of the Christian people made some further development of organization imperative, especially during the long peace between Severus and Decius, 211 to 249. Did recruits pour in? In the larger towns, at least, there could be now no question of personal acquaintance between the president of the community and all its members. No doubt it might have been possible to preserve the old intimacy at the cost of unity, and to create a bishop for each congregation. But the sense of civic unity was an asset of which Christians instinctively availed themselves in the service of religion. 
if practical convenience sometimes dictated the appointment of bishops in villages, these corpuscopi were only common in districts where, as in Cappadocia, cities were few, and where, consequently, the extent of the territory of each city was unduly large for supervision by the single bishop of the polis. Normally, even in days before there was any idea of the formal demarcation of territorial jurisdiction, the polis, or civitus, with all its dependent lands, was the natural sphere of the individual bishop's authority. And within the walls of the city, it was never so much as conceivable that the ecclesia should be divided. When the Council of Nicaea was making provision for the reinstatement in clerical rank of Novicianist clergy willing to be reconciled with the church, the arrangement was subject always to the maintenance of the principle that there should not be two bishops in the city. The very rivalries between different claimants of one episcopal throne served to bring out the same result. Witness the earliest instances of Pope and anti-Pope, of which we have documentary knowledge, those of Cornelius and Novatian in 251, and of Liberius and Felix about 357. In the latter case, Constantius, with a politician's eye to compromise, recommended the joint recognition of both claimants. But the Roman people, Theodoret, to whose history we owe the details, is careful to note that he has recorded the very language used, saluted the reading of the rescript in the circus with the mocking cry that two leaders would do very well for the factions at the games, but that there could only be one God, one Christ, one bishop. Exactly the same reason had been given a century earlier in almost the same words, by the Roman confessors, when writing to Cyprian for their abandonment of Novatian and adhesion to Cornelius. We are not unaware that there is one God, and one Christ, the Lord, whom we have confessed, one Holy Spirit, and therefore only one true bishop in the communion of the Catholic Church. Both in East and West, in the largest cities, as well as in the smallest, the society of the faithful was conceived of as an indivisible unit, and its oneness was expressed in the person of its one bishop. The parochia of Christians in any locality was not like a hive of bees, which, when numbers multiplied inconveniently, could throw off a part of the whole, to be henceforward a complete and independent organization under separate control. The necessity for new organization had to be met in some way which would preserve, at all costs, the oneness of the body and its head. It followed that the work and duties which the individual bishop could no longer perform in person must be shared with, or deputed to, subordinate officials. New offices came into being in the course especially of the third century, and the growth of this clerus or clergy, and its gradual acquisition during the fourth and fifth centuries, of the character of a hierarchy nicely ordered in steps and degrees, is a feature of ecclesiastical history of which the importance has not always been adequately realized. Of such a hierarchy, the germs that no doubt existed from the beginning, and indeed presbyters and deacons were, as we have seen, older component parts of the local communities than were the bishops themselves. In the Ignatian theory, bishop, presbyters, and deacons are the three universal elements of organization, without which nothing can be called a church. And the distinction between the two subordinate orders, in their original scope and intention, was just the distinction between the two sides of clerical office which is the bishop were in some sort combined, the spiritual and the administrative. Presbyters were the associates of the bishop in his spiritual character, deacons in his administrative functions. Our earliest documents define the work of presbyters by no language more commonly than by that which expresses the pastoral relation of a shepherd to his flock, the flock in which the Holy Ghost hath set you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, the presbyters, I exhort, shepherd the flock of God among you, not as lords of the ground, but as examples of the flock, until the great shepherd shall appear. 
But in proportion as the local organization became Episcopal, the pastoral idea, and even the name of Poimian, concentrated itself upon the bishop. To Ignatius, the distinctive function of the presbyters is rather that of a council, gathered round the bishop, as the apostles were gathered round Christ, an idea not unconnected, perhaps, with the position of the presbyters in the Christian assembly, for there is no reason to doubt that primitive tradition underlies the arrangement of the early Christian basilicas, where the bishop's chair stood in the center of the apse behind the altar, and the consensus presbytatorum extended right and left in a semicircle as represented in the Apocalypse. So, too, in the Didascalia Apostolorum, Syriac in Latin, the one definite function allotted to the presbyters is that of concilium et curiae ecclesiae. Besides pastoral duties, however, the Pauline epistles bring presbyters into definite relation also with the work of teaching. If teachers were originally one grade of the general ministry, they would naturally have settled down in the communities earlier than the itinerant apostles or prophets. Pastors and teachers are already closely connected in the epistle to the Ephesians. And the first epistle to Timothy shows us that speaking and teaching, logos and didascalia, was a function to which some at least of the presbyters might aspire. It is probable enough that the second century bishop shared this, as all other functions of the presbyterate. St. Polycarp is described by his flock as an apostolic and prophetic teacher, but as differentiation progressed, Teaching was one of the duties less easily retained in the bishop's hands, and our third-century authorities are full of references to the class known in Greek as oi presbyteroi and didascalioi, in Latin as presbyteri dectoris. If presbyters were thus the bishop's counselors and advisors where counsel was needed, his colleagues in the rite of Christian worship, his assistants and representatives in pastoral and teaching duties, the prototypes of the deaconate, are to be found in the seven of the Acts, who were appointed to disburden the apostles of the work of poor and relief and charity, to set them free for their more spiritual duties of prayer and ministering of the word. Quite similarly, in the diaconoi, or servants of the local church, the bishop found ready to hand a personal staff of clerks and secretaries. The Christian church, in one not unimportant aspect, was a gigantic friendly society, and the deacons were the relieving officers who, under the direction of the episcopos, or overseer, sought out the local members of the society in their homes, and dispensed to those who were in permanent or temporary need the contributions of their more fortunate brethren. From their district visiting, the deacons would derive an intimate knowledge of the circumstances and characters of individual Christians and of the way in which each was living up to his profession. By a very natural development, it became part of their recognized duties, as we learned from the Didascalia, to report to the bishop cases calling for the exercise of the penitential discipline of the church. Throughout all the early centuries, the closeness of their personal relation with the bishop remains. But what had been spread over the whole deaconate tends to be concentrated on an individual, when the office of the archdeacon, oculus episcopi, according to a favorite metaphor, begins to emerge. The earliest instances of the actual title are circa 370 through 380, in Optatus of Sicilian of Carthage, and in the Gesta Inter Liberium at Felicem of Felix of Rome. Originally, as it would seem, deacons were not ministers of worship at all. The earliest subordinate office in the liturgy was that of reader. We need not suppose that O Anaginashkan in the New Testament means a distinct official in the church, any more than in the synagogue. But the same phrase in Justin's Apology has more of a formal sound. And by the end of the second century, the first of the minor orders had obviously an established place in church usage. While Ignatius names only bishop, presbyters, and deacons, Tertullian, contrasting the stable orders of Catholics with the unsettled arrangements of heretics, speaks of bishop, presbyter, deacon, and reader. Alias hodie episcopus, cras alias, hodie diaconus qui cras lector, hodie presbyter qui cras laicus, 
and in remote churches or backwardly organized provinces, the same four orders were the minimum recognized long after Tertullian, as in the so-called Apostolic Church Order, 3rd century perhaps for Egypt, and in the canons of the Council of Sardica, 343 for the Balkan Peninsula. The canon is proposed by the Spaniard Hosius of Cordova. But the process of transformation by which the deaconate became more and more a spiritual office began early, and one of its results was to degrade the readership by ousting it from its proper functions. It was as attendance on the bishop that the deacons, we may well suppose, were deputed from the first to take the Eucharist, over which the bishop had offered the prayers and thanksgivings of the church to the absent sick. In Rome, when Justin wrote, soon after 150, they were already distributing the consecrated bread and wine and water in the Christian assembly. Not very much later, the reading of the gospel began to be assigned to them. Cyprian is the latest writer to connect the gospel still with the reader. By the end of the third century, it was a constant function of the deacon, and the reader had sunk proportionately in rank and dignity. But this development of the deaconate is only part of a much larger movement. In the greater churches, at least, an elaborate differentiation of functions and functionaries was in course of process during the third century. Under the pressure of circumstances and the accumulation of new duties, which the increasing size and importance of the Christian communities thrust upon the bishop, much which he had hitherto done for himself, and which long remained his in theory, came in practice to be done for him by the higher clergy. As they moved up to take his place, they in turn left duties to be provided for. As they drew more and more to the spiritual side of their work, they left the more secular duties to new officials in their place. Evidence for Carthage and Rome in the middle of the third century shows us that besides the principal orders of bishop, presbyters, and deacons, a large community would now complete its clerus by two additional pairs of officers, subdeacon and acolyte, exorcist and reader, making seven altogether. The Church of Carthage, we learn from the Cypriana correspondence, had exorcists and readers apparently at the bottom of the clergy, and it had also hypodeaconi and acolyti, who served as the bearers of letters or gifts from the bishop to his correspondence. Subdeacons and acolytes were now in fact what deacons had earlier been, the personal and secretarial staff of the bishop, while exorcists and readers were the subordinate members of the liturgical ranks. The combination of all these various officers into a single, definitely graduated hierarchy was the work of the 4th century, but it is at least adumbrated in the enumeration of the Roman clerus, addressed by Pope Cornelius, Cyprian's contemporary, to Fabius of Antioch in 251. Besides the bishop, there were at Rome 46 presbyters, 7 deacons, 7 subdeacons, 42 acolytes, of exorcists and readers, together with doorkeepers, there were fifty-two, of widows and afflicted, over fifteen hundred, and all this great multitude was necessary in the church. Promotion from one rank of the ministry to another was, of course, no new thing. In particular, the rise from the deaconate to the presbyterate, from the more secular to the more spiritual office, was always recognized as a legitimate reward for good service. They that have served well as deacons, wrote St. Paul, purchase for themselves an honorable step, though when the apostolic church order interprets the vathmos kalos as tapos poimenikos, it is a question whether the place of a presbyter or that of a bishop is meant. But it was a serious and far-reaching development when, in the fourth century, the idea grew up that the Christian clergy consisted of a hierarchy of grades, through each of which it was necessary to pass in order to reach the higher offices. The Council of Nicaea had contented itself with the reasonable prohibition, Canon two, of the ordination of neophytes as bishops or presbyters. The Council of Sardica in 343 prescribes for the episcopate a prolixum tempus, 
of Promotions through Munis of Reader, the Officium of Deacon, and the Ministerium of Presbyter. But it was in the Church of Rome that the conception of the Cursus Honorum, borrowed, we may suppose, consciously or unconsciously from the civil magistrates of the Roman state, took deepest root. Probably the oldest known case of particular clerical offices held in succession by the same individual is the record, in an inscription of Pope Damasus, of either his own or his father's career. There are variant readings, Potter and Pewer, but even the son's career must have begun early in the fourth century. Exceptor, Lector, Levite, Sacerdos, Ambrosiaster, a Roman, and younger contemporary of Damasus expresses clearly the conception of grades of order, in which the greater includes the less, so that not only are presbyters ordained out of deacons, and not vice versa, but a presbyter has in himself all the powers of the inferior ranks of the hierarchy. Mayor enim ordo intra, se et apud se habit et minorum, presbyter enim et diaconi, agit officium et exerste et lectors. The earliest of the dated disciplinary decretals that one has come down to us, the letter of Pope Syracus to Himerius of Tarragona in 385, its prescriptions are repeated with less precision in that of Zosimus to Hesychius of Salona in 418, emphasizes the stages and intervals of a normal ecclesiastical career. A child, devoted early to the clerical life, is made a reader at once, then acolyte, and subdeacon up to thirty, deacon for five years, and presbyter for ten, so that forty-five is the minimum age for a bishop. Even those who take orders in later life must spend two years among the readers or exorcists, and five as acolyte and subdeacon. But the requirements of Syracius and Zosimus are moderate when brought into comparison with the pseudo-papal documents, which came crowding into being at the beginning of the 6th century, of the apocryphal councils, fathered on Pope Sylvester, the one who gives a cursus of 52 years, the other of 55, before the episcopate. End of section 17《Section 18 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 18. Chapter 6. The Organization of the Church by C. H. Turner. Part 2. Two considerations, indeed, must be borne in mind which qualify the apparent rigor of the 4th and 5th century cursus. In the first place, we have already traced the beginning of the depreciation of the readership. In days when liturgical formulae were still unwritten, the reader's office was the only one that was mechanical. What it had necessarily implied was a modicum of education, and all who had passed through the office had at least learned to read. Thus it came about from the 4th century onwards that the readers were the boys who were receiving training and education in the schools of the church. According to the canons, for instance, of the Council of Hippo in 393, readers on attaining the age of puberty made choices between marriage and permanent readership, on the one hand, celibacy and rise through the various grades of clerical office, on the other. And the second thing to remember is that all these prescriptions of canons or decretals represented a theoretical standard rather than a practice regularly carried out. Canon law in the fourth century could still be put aside by bishop or people when the need arose, without scruple. Minor orders might be omitted. St. Hilary of Poitiers wanted to ordain Martin a deacon straight off and only made him an exorcist instead, because he reckoned that Martin's humility would not allow him to refuse so low an office. Augustine and Jerome were ordained presbyters direct. Even the salutary Nicene rules about neophytes were on emergency violated. Ambrose of Milan 
and Nectarius of Constantinople were both elected as laymen, the former indeed as a catechumen, and were rushed through the preliminary grades without appreciable delay. St. Ambrose passed from baptism to the episcopate in the course of a week. But in spite of any occasional reassertions of the older freedom, it did nevertheless remain true that the curus, and all it stood for, was gradually establishing itself as a real influence, and it stood for a body continually growing in size, in articulation, in strength, in dead weight, which drove in like a wedge between bishop and the people, and fortified itself by encroachments on both sides. Doubtless it would have been natural, in any case, that bishop and people, no longer enjoying the old affectionateness of personal intercourse, should lose their sense of community and imperceptibly drift apart. But the process was at least hastened and the gap widened by the interposition of the clerus. It was no longer the laity, but the clergy alone who were in direct touch with the bishop. Even the fundamental right of the people to elect their bishop slipped gradually from their hands into the hands of the clergy. Within the clerical class, a continual and steady upward pressure was at work. The minor orders take over the business of the deaconate. Deacons assert themselves against presbyters. Presbyters, in turn, are no longer a body of counselors to the bishop, acting in common, but, having of necessity, begun to take over all pastoral relations with the laity tend as parish priests to a centrifugal independence. The process of entrenchment within the parochial freehold was still only in its first beginnings, but already in the fourth century, when theologians and exegetes were feeling after a formal and scientific basis for what had been natural, instinctive, traditional, we find presbyters asserting the claim of an ultimate identity of order with the episcopate. Such are the summary outlines of the picture, which must now be filled in, here and there, with more detail. And the details will serve to reinforce the conclusion that the principal features of the history of church organization in the 4th and 5th centuries are not unconnected accidents, but are to a large extent just different aspects of a single process, the multiplication and development of the Christian clergy. 1. The people had originally chosen their bishop without serious possibility of interference from clergy. Voting by orders in the modern sense was hardly known. Insofar as any check existed on the unfettered choices of the laity, it lay in the hands of the neighboring bishops, from whom the bishop-elect would naturally receive consecration. Cyprian, it is clear from his whole correspondence, was made bishop by Carthage, by the laity, against the decided wishes of his colleagues in the presbyterate. After the death of Enteros of Rome in 236, we learn from the story in Eusebius that all the brethren were gathered together for the appointment of a successor to the bishopric, and this was still the practice after the middle of the 4th century. The description of the election of St. Dabros in 374 by his biographer mentions the people only, cum populus ad seditionem sugeret in petendo episcopo, quia et ariani sibi et catholici sibi episcopum, cupia bant superatis alterutis ordinari. Another biography, that of St. Martin of Tours by Sulpicius Severus, depicts a similar scene about the same date. Martin was elected, in the face of opposition from some of the assembled bishops, by the persistent vote of the people. The laity, too, at least in some churches, still selected, even the candidates for the priesthood. Posidius, the biographer of St. Augustine, relates how Valerius of Hippo put before the plebes dei the need for an additional presbyter, and how the Catholic people, knowing St. Augustine's faith and life, seized hold of him, and, ut in talibus consuotum est, presented him to the bishop for ordination. In Rome, however, the influence of the clergy was already predominant. The episcopal elections during the troubled decade that followed the exile of Liberius in 355 are described in the Gesta Inter Liberium et Felicum. The clergy, Clarus Omnis Ides Presbyteri et Archdeaconis Felix et Ipsi Damasus, 
deaconess et cuncta ecclesiae officia, first pledge their loyalty to Liberius, and then accept Felix in his place. The opposition, who clung all through to Liberius and after his death, elected Orsinus as his successor, are represented as mainly a lay party, multitudo fidelium, sancta plebs, fidelis populus, die populus. Yet even in their electoral assembly, the clergy receive principal mention, presbyteri et deaconis cum pleba sancta. And though there are some indications that the party of Ursinus had strong support in the local episcopate, it was Damasus, the candidate of the majority of the clergy, who secured recognition by the civil power. At the end of the fourth century, a definite place is accorded to the clergy in the theory of episcopal appointments. The eighth book of the Apostolic Constitutions distinguishes the three steps of election by the people, approval by the clergy, consecration by the bishops. Syracius of Rome, in his decretal letter to Himerius, puts the clergy before the people. Si eum cleri ac plebis, educum merit electio. The phrase cleri plebisque became normal in this connection and ultimately meant that it was for the clergy to elect and for the people to approve. Fundamental as these changes were, no doubt, each stage of them seemed natural enough at its time. Indirect election was an expedient unknown as yet. Real election by the laity, in view of the dimensions of the Christian population, became more and more difficult, and the pretense of it, tumultuous and unsatisfactory. The members of the clergy, on the other hand, were now considerable enough for a genuine electing body, yet not too unwieldy for control, and the people were gradually ousted from any effective participation. So far as the influence of the laity still continued to make itself felt, it was through the interference of the state. Under either alternative, Christian feeling had to content itself with a grave deflection from primitive ideals. 2. The earlier paragraphs of this chapter have already given us reason to anticipate the developments of the deaconate in the 4th century. We have seen how the intimate relations of the deacons with the bishop as his personal staff caused the business of the churches to pass more and more, as numbers multiplied, through their hands. We have seen also how from their attendance on the bishop, in church as well as outside of it, they gradually acquired what they did not originally possess, a status in Christian worship. It is just on these two lines that their aggrandizement still proceeded. In Rome, and in some of the eastern churches, witness the last deacon of the Council of neo Caesarea in Pontus, circa 315, the deacons were limited, on the supposed model of the Acts, to seven, while the presbyterate admitted of indefinite increase, and the mere disproportion in numbers exalted the individual deacon, diaconos pocitas honorabiles. Presbyteros turba contemptibilis facet, says Jerome, bitterly. But if complaint and criticism focused itself on the affairs of the Church of Rome, where everything was on a larger scale, and on a more prominent stage than elsewhere, the indications all suggest that the same thing was in lesser measure happening in other churches. The legislation of the earliest councils of the fourth century supplies eloquent testimony to the ambition of deacons in general, and Roman deacons in particular. The Spanish canons of Elvira, circa 305, show that a deacon might be in the position of Regens Pleblum, in charge, no doubt, of a village congregation. He might, exceptionally, baptize, but he might not do what, in many places, the bishops of the Council of Arles in 314 learnt that he did, namely, offer the Eucharist. By a special canon of the same council of Arles, the deacons of the Roman city are directed not to take so much upon themselves, but to defer to the presbyters, and to act only with their sanctions. Both these canons of Arles are combined and repeated in the 18th canon of Nicaea, but the reference to Rome is omitted, and the presumptions of the deaconate, 
we must suppose that existing conditions in the eastern churches are now in view take the form of administering the eucharist to presbyters receiving the eucharist before bishops and sitting down among the presbyters in church later on in the century we find the roman deacons wearing the vestment called dalmatic which elsewhere was reserved to the bishop and one of them probably the mercury who is mentioned in one of pope Demis's epigrams had asserted the absolute equality of deacons and priests. Ambrosiaster, who may be confidently identified with the Roman ex Jew Isaac, the supporter of the anti Pope Ursinus, treats in the hundred and first of his questions De Eactania Romanorum Levitarum. Jerome, in his epistle, Ad Arangelum Presbyterum, appropriates the arguments of Ambrosiaster and clothes them with his own incomparable style. The Roman deacons, they tell us, arrogate to themselves the functions of priests, in saying grace when asked out to dinner, and in getting responses made to themselves, in church, instead of to the priests. And this arrogance is made possible because of their influence with the laity and in the administration of ecclesiastical affairs at sedue stationis domestice et officialitis. But the mind of the church is clear. Si octeritus queritur orbis meer est orb. Even at Rome presbyters sit, while deacons stand. And if at Rome deacons do not carry the altar and its furniture, or pour water over the hands of the priest, as they do in every other church, that is only because at Rome there is a multitude of clerks to undertake these offices in their place. We do not know that these indignant remonstrances of Ambrosiaster and Jerome had any practical results. We do know that in the second half of the fourth and the beginning of the fifth century, three deacons, Felix, Orsinus, and Eulalius, made vain attempts upon the papal throne. The successful rivals of the two latter were priests, Damasus and Bonifaci, while by the middle of the fifth century, as illustrated in the persons of St. Leo and his successors Hilarius, the archdeacon almost naturally became pope. 3. As the deacon thus pressed hard on the heels of the presbyter, so the presbyter in turn put himself in competition with the bishop. Ambrosiaster and Jerome not only deny any parity of deacon and presbyter, but assert in opposition a fundamental parity of order between presbyter and bishop. Both were commentators on St. Paul. Exegesis was one of the most fertile forms of that astonishing intellectual efflorescence, which, bursting out at the beginning of the fourth century, in the schools of Origen and of Lucian, and in the West fifty years later, produced during several generations a literary harvest unequaled throughout the Christian centuries and the two Latin presbyters found in the pastoral epistles, just the historical and scriptural basis for the establishment of the claims of the presbyterate, that the instinct of the times called for. The apostle had distinguished clearly enough between the deacons and presbyters or bishops, but he had used, so they rightly saw, the term presbytos and episcopos for the same order of the ministry and it was an easy deduction that presbyter and bishop must be still essentially one. So Ambrosiaster, in 1 Timothy, post episcopum tamum diocanatus ordinationum sobiecit, quare, nisi quia episcopi et presbyteri una ordinatio est, utucu enum secaderos est, sed episcopos primus est, ut omnis episcopus presbyter sit, non tamen omnis presbyter episcopus hic enum episcopus est qui inter presbytos primus est and so jerome when titus explains that in the apostolic age presbyters and bishops were the same until as a safeguard against dissensions one was chosen out of the presbyters to be set over the rest consequently bishops should know si magis consuetudini quam Despositionis Dominicae Verite Presbyteris Essa Maioris, et in communa debira ecclesiam regere. The exegesis of Ambrosiaster and Jerome was undeniably sound. 
their historical conclusions were, if the picture given in the earlier pages of this chapter is correct, not so just to the facts as those of another commentator of the time, perhaps the greatest of them all, Theodori of Mopsuiestia. No doubt the testament bishop was a presbyter, but those who had authority to ordain, the officers we now call bishops, were not limited to a single church, but presided over a whole province, and were known by the title of apostles. In this way, blessed Paul set Timothy over all Asia, and Titus over Crete, and doubtless others separately over other provinces, so that those who are now called bishops, but were then called apostles, bore then the same relation to the province that they do now to the city and villages for which they are appointed. Timothy and Titus visited cities, just as bishops today visit country parishes. Utericu enum sarcados est. In these words lies perhaps the real inwardness of the movement for equating presbyters with bishops, and of its partial success. Priesthood was taking the place of order. In the first centuries, to St. Ignatius, for instance, and to St. Cyprian, the essential principle was that all things must be done within the unity of the church, and of that unity the bishop was the local center and the guardian. That alone is a true Eucharist, in the language of Ignatius, which is under the authority of the bishop or his representative. No rite or sacrament administered outside this ordered unity had any reality. Baptism, or laying on of hands, schismatically conferred, whether without the church among the sects, or without the bishop's sanction by any intruder in his sphere, were simply, were simply as though they had not been. Under the dominance of this conception, the position of the bishop was unique and unassailable. But as time went on, the single conception of order, intense and overmastering as to those early Christians it had been, was found insufficient. Other considerations must be taken into account lest one good custom should corrupt the world. Breaches were made in the theory first at one point, then at another. Christian charity rebelled against the thought of wholly rejecting what was intended, however imperfectly, to be Christian baptism. Iteration of such baptism was felt, and nowhere more clearly than at Rome, to be intolerable. As with baptism, so through much more gradually and uncertainly with holy orders, the distinction between validity and regularity was hammered out. Quod fieri non debuit factum valet was the expression of the newer point of view. Augustine, in his writings against the Donatists, laid down the principle of the revised theology, and later ages have done little more than develop and systematize his work. It is obvious that in this conception, less stress will be set on the circumstances of the sacrament, more on the sacrament itself, less on the jurisdiction of the minister to perform it, more on his inherent capacity. Less, in other words, on order, more on priesthood. We are not to suppose that earlier thought necessarily differed from later on the question, for instance, to what orders of the ministry was committed, the conduct of the characteristic action of Christian worship, or as to its sacrificial nature, or as to the priestly function of the ministrants. But earlier language did certainly differ from later as to the direction in which sacerdotal terminology was most freely employed. In the general idea of primitive times, the whole congregation took part in the priestly office. When a particular usage of lerens or sacerdos first came in, and for several generations afterwards, it meant the bishop and the bishop only. The phraseology, in this respect of St. Cyprian, is repeated by a whole chain of writers down to St. Ambrose. No doubt the hierarchical language of the Old Testament was applied to the ministry of the Church long before the 4th century, but it was either transferred in quite general terms from the one hierarchy to the other as a whole, or it was concentrated upon the bishop. Thus, in De Discalia Epistolorum, it is the bishops who inherit the Levite's right to material support. The bishops who are addressed as priests to your people and Levites who serve in the house of God the Holy Catholic Church. The bishop again, who is the Levite and the high priest, 
contrast the language of Didache. But the detailed comparison of the three orders of the Jewish ministry and the Christians was so obvious that it can only have been the traditional use of sacerdos for the bishop that retarded the parallelism. We find Levita for deacon in the epigrams of Damasus and in the De Officies of St. Ambrose. But the complete triad of Levita, Sacerdos, Samos, Sacerdos, for deacon, presbyter, and bishop, meets us first in the pages of the ex-Jew Ambrosiaster. And while Ambrose employs the Old Testament associations of the Levite to exalt the dignity and calling of the Christian deacon, Ambrosiaster contrasts the hewers of wood and drawers of water with the priests, and paraphrases the titles Sacerdos and Somos Sacerdos as Presbyter and Primus Presbyter. Somos Sacerdos is freely used of bishops by Jerome, although the title was forbidden even to metropolitans by an African canon. But in any case, the new extension of Sacerdos to the Christian Presbyter was too closely in harmony with the existing tendencies not to take root at once. It is common in both St. Jerome and St. Augustine. Pope Innocent speaks of presbyters as secondi sacerdotes, and from this time onward, bishop and priest tend to more and more to be ranked together as joint possessors of a common sacerdotium. This new emphasis on the sacerdotium of Christian presbyters is perhaps to be connected with the new position which in the fourth and following centuries they were beginning to occupy as parish priests. It was the necessity of the regular administration of the Eucharist which dictated the commencements of the parochial system. While the custom of daily Eucharists was neither universal nor perhaps earlier than the 3rd century, it arose partly out of Christian devotion, partly out of the allegorical interpretation of the daily bread, the weekly Eucharist was both primitive and universal and the needs in this respect of the Christian people could ultimately be met only by a wide extension of the independent action of the presbyterate. Though in the larger cities it can never have been possible, even at first, for the Christian people to meet together at a single Eucharist, the bishop, as Ignatius tells us, kept under his own control all arrangements for separate services, and the presbyters, like the headquarters staff of a general, were sent hither and thither as occasion demanded. It may have been, as definite localities came to be permanently set apart for Christian worship, that the custom grew up of attaching particular presbyters to particular churches. Probably it was during the long peace, 211 to 249, that ground was first acquired for churches within the walls at Rome. Cemeteries were constructed by the ecclesiastical authorities as soon as the beginning of the third century. But the earliest mention of church property in the city is when the Emperor Alexander Severus, 222-235, as we learn from Lampridius, decided a question of disputed ownership of land between the Christiani and the Papinari in favor of the former, because of the religious use which they were going to make of it. Certainly, by the time of Diocletian, Christian churches throughout the empire were of sufficient number and prominence to become, with the sacred vessels and the sacred books, a special mark for the Edict of Persecution in 303. And, just as the restoration of peace produced an outburst of calligraphic skill devoted to the Bible, of which the Vatican and Sinaitic codices are the enduring monuments, so too the ruined buildings were replaced by others more numerous, and more magnificent. Constantine erected churches over the graves of the apostles on the Vatican Hill and the Ostian Way, while inside the walls, the Lateran Basilica of the Savior and the Caesarean Basilica of the Holy Cross testified further to the policy of the emperor and the piety of his mother. When Optatus wrote, fifty years later, there were over forty Roman basilicas, all of them open to the African Catholics and closed to the Donatists. Inter quadragnita et quod excurrit basilicus locum ubi colligerent non habibent. But this number perhaps included the cemetery churches, for the parish churches, or titulae of the city, appear to have been exactly twenty five under Pope Hilary, 461 to 468, in its life of whom 
the Liber Pontificalis enumerates a service of altar vessels for use within the city, one golden bowl for the station, and twenty-five silver bowls, with twenty-five ame or cruets, and fifty chalices, for the parish churches. Scyphus Stationarius Scyphi per titulos. The station thus opposed to the parishes is the reunion, on certain days of the year, of the whole body of the Roman clergy and faithful under the Pope at some particular church. It was a corrective to the growth of parochial separatism, like the custom of sending round every Sunday, from the Pope's Mass to the Mass of every church within the walls, the fermentum, or portion of the consecrated bread. So Innocent writes in 416, in his decretal letter to the Decensus of Gubbio, Presbyteri quia die ipso propter plebum sibi quidatum nobiscum convenere non possent, et circo fermentum e nobis confectum per acolitos excipiunt, utsia nostra communioni maxi illidia non judicent separatos, quod per parochius. And in other dioceses, fieri deberi non puto, quia non longe portanda sunt sacramenta sic nos per commentaria diversa constituitus presbyteris destinamus. It was part of the same careful guard against the overdevelopment of parochial independence that though there were parish clergy at Rome in the 4th and 5th centuries, there was it yet no parish priest. When Ambrosiaster wrote it was the custom to allot two priests to each church, in Timothy 3, 12, and 13, Septem diaconos esse opportutet es aliquantos presbyteros ut bini sint per ecclesias, et unos in civitate episcopus. At a council under Pope Symmachus in 499, sixty seven priests of the city subscribed, each with his title, Gordanius Presbyter Tituli Pramati, and so on, but the Tituli are not more than thirty some of them having as many as four or five priests attached to them. Indeed, thirty is perhaps too high a figure, for some titulae may appear under more than one name, an original name for the donor or the reigning pope, and a supplementary name in honor of a saint. Of the fourth-century popes, Damasus had named a church after St. Lawrence, and Syracius after St. Clement. The basilica built under Pope Liberius became St. Mary Major under Zeistus III, 432 to 440, and the two basilicas founded under Pope Julius, 337 to 352, became in time the Holy Apostles and St. Mary across Tiber. But if the parochial system with its single rector was thus no part of the Roman organization as late as the end of the 5th century, it was in full vigor at Alexandria two centuries earlier. Epiphanius tells us that, though all the churches belonging to the Catholic body in Alexandria, he gives the names of eight, were under one archbishop, presbyters were appointed to each of them for the ecclesiastical necessities of the inhabitants in the several districts. The history of Arius takes the parochial system fifty or sixty years behind Epiphanius. It was as parish priest of the church and quarter named Bocalus that he was enabled to organize his revolt against the theology dominant at headquarters under the bishop Alexander. The failure of the presbyter and victory of the bishop may have reacted unfavorably upon the position of the Alexandrine presbyters generally. The historian Socrates expressly tells us that after the Arian trouble, presbyters were not allowed to preach there. At any rate, it is just down to the time of Alexander and his successor, Athanasius, that those writers who testify to particular privileges of the Alexandrine presbytate in the appointment of the patriarch suppose them to have survived. The most precise evidence comes from a 10th century writer, Oetichius, who relates that by ordinance of St. Mark, twelve presbyters were to assist the patriarch, and at his death to elect and lay hands upon one of themselves as his successor, Athanasius being the first to be appointed by the bishops. Severus of Antioch in the 6th century mentions that in former days the bishop was appointed by presbyters at Alexandria. Jerome, in the same letter that was cited above, 
but independent for the moment of Ambrose Aster, deduces the essential quality of priest and bishop from the consideration that Alexandrian bishop, down to Heracles and Dionysius, 232 to 265, was chosen by the presbyters from among themselves, without any special form of consecration. Earlier than any of these is the story told in connection with the hermit Paman and the apophthegms of the Egyptian monks. Paman was visited one day by heretics who began to criticize the Archbishop of Alexandria as having only Presbyterian ordination. Os oti para Presbyterian, the Caetin Cherionian. Unfortunately, the hermit declined to argue with them, gave them dinner, and promptly dismissed them. It is clear that an Alexandrian bishop of the 4th century, slandered by heretics, can be no one but a Thanasius, and therefore this, the earliest evidence from Presbyterian ordination at Alexandria, is just that which is most demonstrably false. For Athanasius was neither elected nor consecrated by presbyters. Not more than ten or twelve years after the event, the bishops of Egypt affirm categorically that the electors were the whole multitude and the whole people, and that the consecrators were the greater number of ourselves. Yet this very emphasis on the part of the supporters of Athanasius reveals one line of the Arian campaign against him, and the conjecture may be therefore hazarded that it was by Arian controversialists that the allegations of Alexandrian Presbyterian were first circulated, and their real origin lay in the desire to turn the edge of any argument that might be based upon the solidarity of the episcopate. If the Catholics called upon the bishops of the East not to champion a rebellious presbyter, their opponents would, on this view, go one better in their enthusiasm for episcopacy, and answer that Athanasius was no more than a presbyter himself. It is difficult for us, who have to reconstruct the history of the fourth century, out of Catholic material to form any just conception either of the mass of the lost Arian literature, exegetical and historical, as well as doctrinal and polemical, or of its almost exclusive vogue for the time being throughout the East, and of the influence which in a thousand indirect ways it must have exerted upon Catholic writers of the next generations. Jerome, writing amid Syrian surroundings, would eagerly accept the there current presentation of the Alexandrian tradition, though his knowledge of the later facts caused him to throw back the dates from the known to the unknown, from Athanasius and Alexander to Dionysius and Heracles. Of course there is no smoke without fire, and presumably the Alexandrian presbyterate, in the generations immediately preceding the Council of Nicaea, must have possessed some unusual powers in the appointment of their patriarch but it seems as likely that these were the powers which elsewhere belonged to the people as that they were the powers which elsewhere belonged to the bishops. The explanation here offered would no doubt have to be disallowed, if it were true, as has sometimes been alleged that Arianism all the world over stood for the rights of presbyters, while the cause of Athanasius was bound up with the aggrandizement of the episcopate. But the connection was purely adventitious, at Alexandria, or at any rate local, and the conditions did not reproduce themselves elsewhere. There is no reason at all to suppose any general alliance between presbyters and Arianism, or between the episcopate and orthodoxy. On the contrary, all the evidence goes to show that in Syria and Asia Minor, and perhaps elsewhere, the bishops were less Catholic than their flocks. At Antioch, for instance, where Arian bishops were dominant during half a century, orthodox zeal was kept alive by the exertions of Flavian and Diodorus, originally as laymen, afterwards as priests. Insofar as the doctrinal issue affected the development of organization at all, it must on the whole, both because of the general confusion of discipline and also because of the ill repute which the Turgiversations of so many bishops earned for their order, have enhanced the tendency toward the emancipation of presbyters from episcopal control. Whatever special conditions may have affected the course of development at Rome or Alexandria, it may be taken as generally true that by the end of the fourth century the Christian presbyters' right to celebrate the Eucharist 
was coming to be regarded as inherent in the sacerdotium, rather than as devolved upon him by the bishop. With this right went also the right to be served by deacons as ministry, or iperate, and ultimately the right to preach. While the eighteenth canon of Nicaea still regards the deacons as ministers of the bishop only, later in the fourth century, the eighth book of the Epistolic Constitutions speaks of Tispo Samtoteros Decoius, their service to both bishops and priests, and Ambrosiaster is aghast at the audacity of trying to put presbyters and their servants on a par. Presbyters, ministro sipsorum paris facere. The right to preach had never been formally associated with any order of the Christian ministry. Ambrosiaster was certainly interpreting the documents on his own account, rather than recording tradition, when he asserts, Omnibus inter initia concessum, est et evangeliarii et baptizari et scripturis in ecclesiasa explanari. But it is clear that in early times, even a layman like Oregon might at the bishop's request expound scripture to the congregation. Nevertheless, though the right might be thus disputed, the sermon, Omidia Tractatus, was part of the Eucharistic service and Justin Martyr no doubt describes the normal practice when he makes the president of the assembly in person expound and apply the lections just read from prophets or gospels. In the fourth century, it was treated as axiomatic that the right to preach, as part of the liturgy, could not even be deputed save to those to whom could also be deputed the right to offer the Eucharist itself. It is true that in many parts of the West the archdeacon did compose and pronounce a solemn thanksgiving once a year at the lighting of the paschal candle on Easter even. But even this extra-liturgical sermon, De Laudibus Coriae, was unknown at Rome. And Jerome, or whoever was the author of the letter addressed in 384 to a deacon of Pisenza, printed in the appendix to Valari's edition, finds in it a gross violation of church order, to Kenti Episcopo, at Presbyteris Codomodo in Plebium Cultum Redactus, a vita loquitur docetque quod piene non didicat, et festivissimo predicans tempore toto dehine anno iustitum vocus ius indictor. Even the rites of presbyters in this respect were inchoate and still strictly circumcised. In the Eastern churches, it was customary for some of them to preach in the presence of the bishop and for the bishop to preach after them. And Valerius of Hippo was consciously introducing an Eastern use into Africa. He was himself a Greek, and therefore unable to speak fluently to his Latin flock. When he commissioned his presbyter Augustine, against the custom of the African churches, to expound the gospel and preach frequently in his presence. To Jerome, familiar with the Eastern custom, it was pessime consuetudinus that, in some doubtless Western churches, presbyters kept silence in the presence of their bishop. Their right to preach attached directly to the pastoral office which they held, according to him, in common with the bishop. End of section 18. Section 19 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 19, Chapter 6, The Organization of the Church by C. H. Turner, Part 3. But because presbyters might preach in the bishop's church, where he could note and correct at once any defects in their teaching, it does not necessarily follow that they might preach in the parish churches, and there does not seem to be any clear indication in the 4th and 5th centuries that they did in fact do so. For Rome, indeed, this is hardly surprising. We have seen how jealously parochial independence was there limited, and even at the bishop's mass, if we may believe the historian Sozomen, there were no sermons either by priest or bishop. In fact, St. Leo's sermons, he became pope just about the time that Sozomen published his church history, are the first of which we hear after Justin's time in Rome but in Gaul too, and as late as the beginning of the 6th century, only the city priests, 
the priest, that is, who served in the bishop's church, had the right to preach. The second canon of the Second Council of Aisson in 529 extends the right, apparently, for the first time, to country parishes. Placunt ut non solum in civitatibus, sed etiam im omnibus, parochis verbum faciendi, deremus presbyteris potestatum. If the priest is at any time unable to preach through illness, the deacon is to read to the people homilies of the Holy Fathers. It is perhaps surprising at first sight to find that in the fourth and fifth centuries presbyters are establishing a new independence in face of the bishop, rather than bishops exerting a new and stricter authority over presbyters. The conclusion has been reached by direct evidence, but it is also the conclusion clearly indicated by the analogy of the whole upward movement which we have seen at work in respect both to the minor orders and to the deaconate. But if this movement exerted so powerful an influence on the one hand, upon minor orders and deaconate, and on the other hand upon the priesthood, we could not expect that bishops should be exempted from it. How and where it led in their case, it will be part of our business in the second half of this chapter to trace. It was outside their own borders that the bishops of the great churches were tempted to look for a wider field of activity and a more commanding position. From the very first, the bishop of each community had represented in it its relation to other Christian communities, had been, so to say, its minister for foreign affairs. The visions of Hermas were to be communicated to the cities outside by Clement, for that function belongs to him. The Kinogar Epitetropti. The complex developments of this function from the second century to the fifth must now engage our attention. B. So far, we have been dealing only with the internal development of the individual Christian community, but there is an external as well as an internal development to trace. The separate communities were always in intimate touch with one another, and the common feeling of the mass of them formed an authority which, from the beginning, the law of Christian brotherhood made supreme. If one member suffer, all the members suffer. We have no such custom, neither the churches of God. The principles are laid down in our earliest Christian documents, and the organization of the Catholic Church was an attempt to work them out in practice. No doubt the result only imperfectly embodied the idea, and in the process of translation into concrete form, the means came sometimes to appear of more value than the end. The history of the second century shows how naturally the formal process of federation grew out of what was at first the spontaneous response to the calls of membership of the great society, the natural effort to express the reality of Christian union and fellowship. The Roman community, under the leadership of St. Clement, writes a letter of expostulation when the traditions of stability and order are threatened by the dissensions between the Corinthian community and its presbyters. St. Ignatius addresses separate epistles to the churches of several cities in Asia Minor, on or near his road to Rome, exhorting them to hold fast to the traditional teaching and worldwide organization of the Christian society. The Church of Smyrna announces to the Church of Philomelium the martyrdom of its bishop Polycarp. The churches of Lyons and of Vienna sent to their brethren in Asia and Phrygia an account of the great persecution of 177, and the confessors from the same cities intervene with Pope Eleutherus in favor of sympathetic treatment of the Montanist movement. Correspondence was reinforced by personal intercourse. Polycorp journeyed to Rome to discuss the Easter difficulty with Pope Anacletus. Hegesippus, Melito, and Orbicius traveled widely among different churches. Clement of Alexandria had sat at the feet of half a dozen teachers, Never was the impulse to unity, the desire to test the doctrine of one church or of one teacher by its agreement with the doctrine of the rest, stronger than in the days when formal methods of arriving at the general sense of the scattered communities had not as yet been hammered out. The Christian statement of the age of the councils were only attempting to provide a more scientific means of attaining an end which was vividly before the minds of their predecessors in the sub-apostolic generations. 
the crucial step in the direction of organized action was taken when the bishops of neighboring communities began to meet together for mutual counsel. Such sonosoi, or concilia, were no doubt in the first instance called for specific purposes and at irregular times. Tertullian alludes to decisions of church councils unfavorable to the canonicity of the shepherd of Hermas, and makes special mention, on another occasion, of councils in Greece. Illus certus in locus concilia ex universis ecclesis, perque et eltiora, quea qui in communa tractantor, et ipsa representatio totius nominis Christiani magna veneratione celebrator. The earliest notice of separate councils held simultaneously to discuss a pressing problem of the day is also the earliest indication of the sort of area from which any one of such councils would naturally be drawn. For when, about 196, tension became acute in regard to the attitude of the bishop of proconsular Asia, who refused to come into line with the pastoral observances of other churches, councils were held, as we learn from Eusebius, of the bishops in Palestine and in Pontus and in Gaul and in Oshorni. During the course of the third century, these local or provincial councils became more and more regular and essential feature of church life and government, but there was as yet very little that was stereotyped about the system. It was Cyprian, beyond all others, who succeeded, during his brief ten years of episcopate, 248 to 258, in forging a very practical weapon for the needs of the time out of the consular movement and of Cyprian's councils, some represented, proconsular, Africa alone, some Africa and Numidia, some Africa, Numidia, and Mauritania combined. The meetings were more or less annual, but the extent of the area from which the bishops were summoned depended apparently upon the gravity of the business to be dealt with. Again, if the civil province was in ordinary cases the natural model to follow, there was no necessary dependence upon its boundary lines. But these were artificial or arbitrary. For reasons of state, the senatorial province of proconsular Africa and the imperial province of Numidia were so arranged that the more civilized districts and the seaboard belonged to the one, the more backward interior to the other but the Numidia of ecclesiastical organization was the ethnic Numidia, the country of the Numidians, not the Numidia of political geography. Perhaps it was just for this reason, because ethnic and ecclesiastical Numidia was shared between two civil provinces, that in assemblies of the Numidian bishops, the president was not, as elsewhere, the bishop of the capital or metropolis of the province, but the bishop, senior by consecration. Not the least important result of the new direction given by Constantine to the relations of church and state was the authorization and encouragement of episcopal assemblies on a larger scale than had in earlier days been possible, where difficulties, disciplinary or doctrinal, proved beyond the power of local effort to resolve, councils were planned of a more than provincial type. The Council of Arles in 314, was a general council, concilium plenarium, of the Western Church, summoned by Constantine as lord of the Western Empire to terminate the quarrel in Africa between the partisans of Sicilian and the partisans of Donatus. Judgment went in favor of Sicilian, whose party, because they alone now remained in communion with the churches outside Africa, were henceforward the Catholics while the others became a sect known after the name of their leader as the Donatists. The dispute between Alexander and Arius at Alexandria was in its beginning as purely local as that between Sicilian and Donatus, but the issue soon came to involve the comparison of the fundamental theologies of the two great rival schools of Alexandria and Antioch. From a council such as Arles, it was but a step to the conception of a general council of the whole church, where bishops from all over the world should meet for comparison of the forms which the Christian tradition had taken in their respective communities, for open ventilation of points of controversy, 
and for the removal of misunderstanding by personal intercourse. Constantine, now master of an undivided empire, organized the first ecumenical council at Nicaea in 325. The great experiment was not an immediate success. The Nicene Council rather opened than closed the history of Arianism on the larger stage, and it was not till after the lapse of half a century that wisdom was seen to be justified of its works. The very keenness of the struggle made the long-delayed and hardly won triumph more complete in the end. No council ever fastened its hold on Christian imagination in quite the same way as the Council of Nicaea. Not that there was ever any quarrel between the supporters and the opponents of the Homo Uvusion as to the rightness of the procedure, which had been called into being. The weapons with which the council and the creed were fought were rival councils and rival creeds. The verdict of the court was to be set aside by renewed trials and multiple appeals, in the hope of modifying somehow the original judgment. Of all these supplementary councils, none was strictly general, though on three occasions, at Sardica and Philippopolis in 343, at Ariminum and Seleucia in 359, at Aquileia and Constantinople in 381, Councils representing separately the Greek and the Latin episcopate were held more or less at the same time in East and West. Others, like that of Sirmium in 351, were held wherever the emperor happened to be in residence, by the bishops attached at the moment to the court. The Synodus and Amosa, as it was later called at Constantinople. Others, again, were local and provincial. The atmosphere of Rome was never, perhaps, quite congenial to councils. Yet even the Roman Church was swept into the movement, and the pronouncements of Pope Damasus, 366-384, came before the world under the guise of conciliar decisions. The experience of the fifty years that followed the Council of Tyre in 335 taught the lesson that it was possible to have too much even of a good thing. Pagan historian and Christian saint, from different starting points, arrived at the same conclusion. Amianus Marcellinus, criticizing the character and career of the Emperor Constantius, noted caustically that he threw the coaching system quite out of gear, because so many of the relays were employed in conveying bishops to and from their councils. Per Sinotus quas appellant, at the expense of the state, and Gregory, of Nazianzus, in the year 382, refused to obey the summons to a new council, because, he says, he never saw any good end to a council, nor any remedy of evils, but rather an addiction of more evil as its result. There are always contentions and strivings for dominion beyond what words can describe. Perhaps it was partly by a natural reaction against councils in those districts, especially where they had followed most quickly upon one another, that the tendency to aggrandize the important sees at the expense of other bishops, and at the expense, therefore, of the conciliar movement, since in a council all bishops had an equal vote, seems about this time to take a sudden leap forward. Valens the Arian and Theodosius the Catholic alike made communion with some leading bishop the test of orthodoxy for other bishops. A first edict of Theodosius on his way from the West to take up the Eastern Empire in 380 expresses Western conceptions by naming in this connection only Damasus of Rome and Peter of Alexandria. A later edict from Constantinople in 381 places Nectarius of Constantinople before Timothy of Alexandria and adds half a dozen bishops in Asia Minor and a couple in the Danube lands as centers of communion for their respective districts. Here, then, we must pause for a moment to take into account the second main element in the history of the Federation of the Christian Churches. Every federation has to face this primary problem, the reconciliation of the equal rights of all participating bodies with the proportional rights of each according to their greater or less importance. The difficulty which modern constitutions have tried to solve by the expedient of a dual organization, 
the one part of it giving to all constituent units an equal representation, the other part of it a proportionate representation according to population, or whatever other criterion of value may be selected, was a difficulty which lay also before the early church. The unit of the Christian Federation was the community, whose growth and development is described in the first half of this chapter, and that description has shown us that the necessary and only conceivable representative of the individual community was its bishop. But some communities were small and insignificant and unknown in history. Others were larger in numbers, or more potent in influence, or more venerable in traditions. Were the bishops of these diverse communities all to enjoy equal weight? Such a question was no doubt not consciously put up until the scientific and reflective period of Christian thought began, nor before the complex process of federation was approaching completeness, that is to say, not before the end of the fourth century. But insofar as it was put, it could receive only but one answer. In the theory of Christian writers from St. Irenaeus to St. Cyprian onwards, all bishops were equal, for they were all appointed to the same order and invested with the same powers, whether the sphere in which they exercised them were great or small. And this theory was given in sharpest expression in Jerome's assertion, in the same 146th letter, that the bishop of Gubbio had the same dignity as the bishop of Rome, seeing that both were equally successors of the apostles. Ubicuncui fuerit episcopus, Sive Romae, Sive Yugibi, Sive Constantinopoli, Sive Regi, Sive Alexandri, Sive Tanis, Usidem Meriti, Usidem et Sacerdoti, Omnis Apostolorum Sixosaurus Sunt. But in fact, and side by side, with the fullest recognition of this theoretical equality, the bishops of the greater or more important churches were recognized as the rules of the Federation were gradually crystallized, to hold positions of privilege, so that the ministry of the Church came to consist not only of a hierarchy within each local community, at the head of which stood the bishop, but of a further hierarchy among the bishops themselves, at the head of which, in some sense, stood the Bishop of Rome. The first steps towards such a hierarchy were on the one hand the traditional influence and privileges which had grown up unnoticed round the greater seas, and on the other hand, the positions acquired by metropolitans in the working out of the provincial systems. The canons of the same councils, which first provided for regular meetings of the bishops, eparchia or province, reveal also the rapid aggrandizement of the metropolitus, or bishop of the metropolis. Who presided over them. If at Nicaea, the commonwealth of bishops, tolkoyu to episcopo, is the authority according to one canon, by another, the ratification of the proceedings belongs to the metropolitan. The canons of Antioch, sixteen years later, lay it down that the completeness of a synod consists in the presence of the metropolitan, and while he is not to act without the rest, they in turn must recognize that the care of the province is committed to him and must be content to take no step of any sort outside their own diocese apart from him. Traditional sanction is already claimed for these prerogatives of the metropolitan. They are, according to the ancient and still governing canon of the fathers. Things were not so far advanced in this direction, it is true, in the West. At any point in the first five centuries, the Latin Church lagged far behind the pitch of development attained by its Greek contemporaries. Christianity had had a century's start in the East, and at the conversion of Constantine, it is probable that if the proportion of Christians in the whole population was a half, or nearly a half, among Greek-speaking peoples, it was not more than a fifth, in many parts not more than a tenth in the West. The Latin canons of Sardica in 343 show how little was as yet known of metropolitans, although many of the enactments deal with questions of jurisdiction and judicature. The bishop of the metropolis is mentioned only once, and then in general terms. Copiscopum nostrum qui 
in maxima civitate id est metropoli consistent. The name metropolitan is as far into these canons as to the earliest versions of the Nicene canons, where we meet with just the same paraphrases. Qui in metropole sit constitutus, qui in ampliori civitate provinciae videtur esse constitutus id est in metropoli. With this backwardness of development among the Latins went also a much smaller degree of subservience to the state, and it resulted from these two causes combined that their church organization in the fourth and fifth centuries reflected the civil polity much less closely than was the case in the east. The province of the Nicene, or Antiochene canons, is the civil province. Its metropolitan is the bishop of the civil metropolis, and it is assumed that every civil province formed also a separate ecclesiastical unit. It followed logically that the division of a civil province involved division of the ecclesiastical province as well. When the Arian Emperor Valens, about 372, divided Cappadocia into Prima and Secunda, it was with the particular object of annoying the Metropolitan of Caesarea, St. Basil, and of diminishing the extent of his jurisdiction by raising Antimus of Tiana to Metropolitan rank. And though Basil resisted, Antimus succeeded in the end in establishing his claim. Before the end of the fourth century, not only every province, but every group of provinces formed an ecclesiastical as well as a civil unit. The provinces of the Roman Empire had by subdivision become so numerous that Diocletian had grouped them into some dozen dioeses, with an exarch at the head of each. And the Council of Constantinople in 381 forbids the bishops of one diocese, or exarchate, to interfere with the affairs of the churches beyond their borders. So wholly modeled upon civil lines was the ecclesiastical organization throughout the East that in the middle of the 5th century, the canons of Chalcedon assume an absolute correspondence of one with the other. Every place which by imperial edict might be raised to the rank of a city gained ipso facto the right to a bishop, canon 17. Every division for ecclesiastical purposes of a province, which remained for civil purposes undivided, was null and void. Even if backed up by an imperial edict, the real metropolis being alone entitled to a metropolitan, Canon 12, civil and public lines must be followed in the arrangement of ecclesiastical boundaries. Toi politicos cae dimiosios tipos cae toi ecclesiastico e taxis ocolateto. This conception summed itself up in the claim put forward on behalf of the See of Constantinople at the councils of 381 and 451. The bishops of these councils, deferring perhaps not unwillingly to the pressure of the local authorities, civil and ecclesiastical, gave to the bishop of Constantinople the next place after the bishop of Rome on the ground that Constantinople was New Rome and that the fathers had assigned precedence to the throne of Old Rome because it was the imperial city. Nothing was better calculated than such a claim to bring out the latent divergencies of East and West. Both in church and state, the rift between the Latin and the Hellenic element had begun to widen perceptibly during the course of the fourth century. Diocletian's drastic reorganization of the imperial government gave the first official recognition to the bipartite nature of the Roman realm, and after the death of Julian in 363, the two halves of the Roman Empire, though they lived under the same laws, obeyed with rare and brief exceptions separate masters. Parallel tendencies in the ecclesiastical world were working to the surface about the same time. The Latinization of the Western churches was complete before Constantine. No longer clothed in the medium of a common language, the ideas and interests of Latin-speaking and Greek-speaking communities grew unconsciously apart. The rival ambitions of Rome and Constantinople expressed this antinomy in its acutest form. The right of the civil government to be in its own sphere the accredited representative of divine power on earth, the duty of the Christian society to preserve at all costs its separateness and independence as the salt of mankind, the city set upon the hill, 
these were fundamental principles which could both appeal to the sanction of the christian scriptures to hold the balance evenly between them has been through the long centuries since christianity began to play a leading part upon the political stage the worthy task of philosophers and statesmen that one scale should outweigh the other was perhaps inevitable in the first attempts and it was at least instructive for future generations that the experiment of an overstrained allegiance to each of the two theories should have been given full trial in one part or another of christendom to byzantine churchmen the vision of the christian state and the christian emperor proved so dazzling that they transferred to them something of the religious awe with which their ancestors had venerated the genius of roman augustus the memory of constantine was honored as of an east apostolos a thirteenth apostle the resentment of the native monosophite churches of syria and egypt against such of their fellow countrymen as remained in communion with constantinople concentrated itself in the scornful epithet of melkite or kingsman the latins were more moved by the sentiment of the roman name and less by its incarnation in the emperor as romans and roman citizens they felt the majesty of the roman republica to attach to place even more than to person if rome was no longer the abode of emperors it was in their eyes not rome but emperors who lost thereby the event which stirred men in the west to the depths of their being was not the conversion of constantine but the fall of rome when alaric led his goths to storm the city in 410 there seemed to be need for a new theory of life and for revision of first principles the great occasion was greatly met st augustine wrote his twenty-two books de civitat dei to answer the obvious objection that rome inviolate under her ancestral gods perished only when she turned to christ true it was that the city of the world had fallen but it had fallen in the divine providence when the times were ripe for a new and higher order of things to take its place the reign of the city of god had been ushered in end of section 19section 20 of cambridge medieval history volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org cambridge medieval history volume 1 section 20 chapter 6 the organization of the church by c h turner part 4 it was a natural corollary of the principles of western churchmen that the divine society could not possibly be bound to imitate the organization of the earthly society which it was to supplant pope innocent in direct opposition to the practice of the east wrote to alexander of antioch in 415 that the civil division of a province ought not carry ecclesiastical division with it the world might change not so the church and therefore it was not fitting ad mobilitatem necessitatem mundanarum die exclesium commutare pope leo refused his assent to the so-called twenty-eighth canon of the chalcedon not merely as an innovation but because its deduction of the ecclesiastical primacy of rome from her civil position was quite inconsistent with the doctrine cherished by the popes upon the subject since at least the days of damasus here then we have a bifurcation of eastern and western ideas leading to a clear-cut issue which both sides appealed to the truth of facts which of them represented the genuine christian tradition certainly the case of provincial organizations favored the eastern view for it was taken over bodily from the state but then it was relatively modern a far higher antiquity attached to the privileged position of the greater seas and it was upon the origins and history of their privileges that the answer really turned of course there never had been a time when some churches had not stood out above the rest and the bishops of those churches above other bishops the council of nicaea side by side with the canons that prescribed the normal organization by provinces and metropolitans recognized at the same time certain exceptional prerogatives as guaranteed by ancient custom ta archaea ethi in egypt especially alexandria eclipsed its neighbor cities to a degree unparalleled elsewhere in the east and while it might not have been easy to sanction the authority 
Exantia, of the Alexandrine bishop over the whole of Egypt, Libya, and Pentapolis, if it had been quite unique in the extent, the Nicene fathers could shelter themselves under the plea that the same thing is customary at Rome. A gloss in an early Latin version of the canons interprets the Roman parallel to consist in the care of the suburbicarian churches, that is to say, the churches of the ten provinces of the Vicariate of Rome, central and southern Italy, with the islands of Sicily and Sardinia. Over these wider districts, the Roman and Alexandrine popes, respectively, exercised direct jurisdiction, to the exclusion in either case of the ordinary powers of the metropolitans. The further prescription of the Nicene canon that, in the case of Antioch and in the other provinces, the churches were to keep their privileges, ta presbia, was understood by Pope Innocent to cover similar direct jurisdiction of Alexander of Antioch over Cyprus, and a version of the canons transcribed at Rome from the copies of the same Pope defines the sphere of Antioch as the whole of Coeli Syria. What was it then? that had given these three churches of Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch the special position of the antiquity of which the Nicene Council witnesses. Roman theologians from Damasus onwards would have answered unhesitatingly that the motive was deference to the Prince of the Apostles, who had founded the churches of Rome and Antioch himself, and the Church of Alexandria through his disciple Mark. But this answer is open to two fatal retorts. It does not explain why Alexandria, the see of the disciple, should rank above Antioch, the see of the master. And it does not explain why our earliest authorities, both Roman and non-Roman, so persistently couple the name of St. Paul with the name of St. Peter, as joint patron of the Roman Church. Cyprian is the first writer to talk of the chair of Peter only. Therefore we are driven back upon the secular prominence of the three cities as the obvious explanation of their ecclesiastical dignity. Yet, if the appeal to history of the two councils which elevated Constantinople to the second place was thus not without a large measure of justification, their bold expression of Byzantine theory does not really, any better than the contemporary Roman view, cover the whole of the facts. If Franken influence in the ecclesiastical sphere depended more on anything else, on rank and influence in the civil sphere, it did not depend on it entirely. The personality and memory of great churchmen went for something. Carthage was no doubt the civil capital of the diocese of Africa, and Milan of the diocese of Italy, but it would be rash to assert that the inheritance which St. Cyprian left to Carthage and St. Ambrose to Milan was quite worthless or ephemeral. And if this was true of the great bishops of the third and fourth centuries, it was still more true of the apostles whom the whole church united in venerating. Legends of apostolic foundation were often baseless enough, but their frequency testified to the value set upon the thing claimed. Throughout the course of the long struggle with Gnosticism, the teaching of the apostles was the unvarying standard of Christian appeal, and evidence of that teaching was found not only in the written creed and scriptures, but in the unwritten tradition of the churches and episcopal successions founded by apostles. Percura ecclesiastis apostolicus, cries Tertullian confidently to his adversary. Habemus ad numerari eos qui ab apostolus instituti sunt episcopi, in ecclesias et successionis eorum usc ad nos, is Irenaeus's rendering of the same argument and both the Gallican and the African writer go on to select among apostolic churches the Church of Rome, Istiquam Felix Ecclesiasa, Maxime et Antiquissimi et Omnibus, Cognite Ecclesiae Traditionem et Fidem, as for themselves, the obvious witness of this teaching. From the second century onwards, a catena of testimony makes and acknowledges the claim of the Roman Church to be through its connection with St. Peter and St. Paul, in a special sense, the depository and guardian of an apostolic tradition, a type and model of other churches. The pontificate of Damasus, 366-384, to 384, 
has been more than once mentioned in the preceding pages as the period of the first definite self-expression of the papacy. The continuous history of Latin Christian literature does not commence till after the middle of the fourth century. The dogmatic and exegetical writings of Hilary and Gaul, circa 355, and Barius Victorinus in Rome, circa 360, are the first factors in a henceforward unbroken series. On the beginnings of this new literary development followed quickly the movement, of which we have already noticed, symptoms in other directions for interpreting existing conditions and constructing out of them a coherent and scientific scheme. These conditions had grown up gradually, naturally, and almost at haphazard. It now seemed time to try to put them on to a firm theological basis, and in the process, much that had been fluid, immature, tentative, was crystallized into a hard and fast system. It fell to the able and masterful Damasus in the last years of a long life and a troubled pontificate to attempt what his predecessors had not yet attempted, and to formulate in brief and incisive terms the doctrine of Rome upon creed and Bible and Pope. A council of 378 or 379, after reciting the Nicene symbol, laid down the sober lines of Catholic theology as against the various forms of one-sided speculation, Enomian and Macedonian, Pontinian and Apollinarian to which the confusions of the half-century since Nicaea had given birth, and the East could do no better than accept the tome of Damasus, as seventy years later it accepted the tome of Leo. Another council, in 382, published the first official canon of Scripture in the West. The influence of Jerome, at that time papal secretary, was traceable in it, and the first official definition of papal claims. Roman primacy ceteris ecclesias prelata primatum obtinuit, is grounded with obvious reference to the vote of the Council of 381 in favor of Constantinople, on no synodal decisions, but directly on the promise of Christ to Peter, recorded in the Gospel. Respect for Roman tradition imposes next a mention of the fellowship of the Most Blessed Paul, but the dominant motif reappears in the concluding paragraph. And the three C's whose prerogative was recognized at Nicaea are transformed into a Petrine hierarchy with its primus sedis at Rome, its secundus sedis at Alexandria, and its tertius sedis at Antioch. St. Augustine's theory of the Civitus Dei was, in germ, that of the medieval papacy, without the name of Rome. In Rome itself, it was easy to supply the insertion and to conceive of a dominion still wielded from the ancient seat of government as worldwide and almost as authoritative as that of the empire. The inheritance of the imperial traditions of Rome, left begging by the withdrawal of the secular monarch, fell, as it were, into the lap of the Christian bishop. In this connection, it is a significant coincidence that the first description, which history has preserved to us, of the outward habit of life of a Roman pontiff, belongs to the same period, probably to the same pope, as the formulation of the claim to spiritual lordship. Ammianus was a pagan, but not a bigoted one. He professes, and we need not doubt that he felt, a genuine respect for simple provincial bishops, whose plain living and modest exterior commended them to the deity and his true worshippers. But the atmosphere of the capital the ostentatio rerum urbanarum, was fatal to unworldliness in religion. After relating that in the year 366, 137 corpses were counted at the end of the day in the Liberian Basilica on the occasion of the fight between the opposing factions of Damasus and Ursinus, the historian grimly adds that the prize was one which candidates might naturally count it worth any effort to obtain seeing that an ample revenue showered on the Roman bishop by the piety of Roman ladies enabled him to dress like a gentleman, to ride in his own carriage, and to give dinner parties not less well appointed than the Caesars. Some forty or fifty years after Damasus, 
the Roman author of the original form of the so-called Isidorian collection of canons, incorporating in his preface the substance of the Damascene definition on the subject of the three Petrine seas, adds to Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch mention also of the honor paid, for the sake of James the brother of the Lord and of John the Apostle and Evangelist, to the bishops of Jerusalem and Ephesus. Mere veneration of the pillars of the apostolic church is not enough to account for this modification of the original triad. The reasons must be sought in the circumstances of the day. If Ephesus was said to have a more honorable place in Synod than other metropolitans, it may be merely that Ephesus, the most distinguished church of those over which Constantinople from this time of St. John Chrysostom asserted jurisdiction, was a convenient stalking horse for the movement of resistance to Constantinopolitan claims. But it is also possible that the phrase was penned after the Ecumenical Council of Ephesus in 431, where Memnon of Ephesus was seated next after the bishops of Alexandria and Jerusalem. If the bishop of Jerusalem is accounted honorable by all for the reverence due to so hallowed a spot, and, nevertheless, the first throne, Sedes Prima, was never by the ancient definition of the fathers reckoned to Jerusalem, lest it should be thought that the throne of our Lord Jesus Christ was on earth and not in heaven. We cannot help suspecting that, at the back of the writer's mind, hovers an uneasy consciousness that the apostolic traditions of Rome, which were so readily brought into play against Constantinople, might find an inconvenient rival in Jerusalem. Not that at Jerusalem, apart from certain emphasis on the position of James, the Lord's brother, there was never any conscious competition with Rome, but it was true that at about the time that this canonical collection was published, the See of Jerusalem was just pushing a campaign of aggrandizement, carried on for over a century, to a triumphant conclusion. End of section 20. Section 21 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. Section 21. Chapter 6. The Organization of the Church by C. H. Turner. Part 4. The claims of Jerusalem were comparatively modest at the start, and it did not occur to Damasus, for instance, that they need be taken into serious consideration. Two initial difficulties hampered their early course. Although Jerusalem was the mother church of Christendom, and the home and center of the first apostolic preaching, Ilia Capotina, the Gentile city found by Hadrian, had no real continuity with the Jewish city on the ruins of which it rose. The Church of Jerusalem had been a church of Jewish Christians. The Church of Aelia was a church of Gentile Christians, and for a couple of generations, too obscure to have any history. A probably spurious list of bishops is all the record that survives of it before the 3rd century. Then came the taste for pilgrimages. In A.D. 333, a pilgrim made the journey all the way from Bordeaux, and the growing cult of the holy places. Jerusalem was the scene of the most sacred of Christian memories, and locally, at any rate, Aelia was Jerusalem. From the time of Constantine onwards, the identification was complete. The second difficulty was of a less archaic kind and took longer to circumvent. Alien Jerusalem did not even dominate its own district, but was quite outshone by its near neighbor at Caesarea. Politically, Caesarea was capital of the province. Ecclesiastically, it was the home of the teaching and the library of origin and the Origenian tradition was kept alive by Pamphilus the Confessor and by Eusebius, bishop of the church at the time of the Nicene Council. It was hardly likely that the council would do anything derogatory to the friend of Constantine, the most learned ecclesiastic of the age. And, in fact, all the satisfaction that the bishop of Jerusalem obtained at Nicaea was the apparent right to rank as the first of the suffragans of the province like Autun in the province of Lyons, or London 
in the province of Canterbury. Local patriotism felt the sop thus thrown to it to be quite unsatisfying, and for a hundred years the sordid strife for the first place, peri proteo, as Theodoret calls it, went on between the bishop of Jerusalem and the bishop of Caesarea. In the confusion of the doctrinal struggle, it was easy enough for an orthodox bishop to refuse allegiance to an Arianizing metropolitan, and Caesarea being in close relation with Antioch, it was natural for the bishops of Jerusalem to turn to their neighbors at Alexandria. Nor, we may suppose, was Alexandria disinclined to favor encroachment upon the territory of its Antiochian rival. Western churchmen, with their profound belief in the finality of every decision of Nicaea, looked coldly on the moment, and it is one of the counts in Jerome's catalogue of grievances against John of Jerusalem. But at the first council of Ephesus, with Cyril of Alexandria in the chair and John of Antioch absent, Juvenal of Jerusalem secured the second place, though he still failed to abrogate the metropolitical rights of Caesarea. At the Lotricinium of Ephesius in 449, again, under Alexandrine presidency, he managed to sit even above Domnus of Antioch. The business of the Council of Chalcedon was to reverse the proceedings of the Lactraconium, and it might have been anticipated that with the eclipse of Alexandrine influence, the fortunes of Jerusalem would also suffer. But a timely tergiversation on the doctrinal issue saved something for Juvenal and his see the council decreed a partition of patriarchal rights over the east, between the churches of Antioch and Jerusalem. Very similar were the proceedings which established the autocephalous character of the island church of Cyprus. The Cypriots, too, began by renouncing the communion of the Arian bishops of Antioch. They, too, espoused the cause of Cyril against John at the council of Ephesus, and were rewarded accordingly and just as the Empress Helena's discovery of the cross served the claims of the Church of Jerusalem, so the discovery of the coffin containing the body of Barnabas the Cypriot, with the autograph of St. Matthew's Gospel, was held to demonstrate finally the right of the Cypriots to ecclesiastical isolation. With this evidence before us, it is hard to deny that the history of the generations which first experienced the fatal gift of Constantine, supplied only too good ground for St. Gregory's complaint of contentions and strivings for dominion among Christian bishops. But though these contentions disturbed the work of councils, councils did not create them, and Gregory was hardly fair if he laid on councils the responsibility for them. Rather, in this direction, lay the remedy and counterpoise seeing that councils represented the parliamentary and democratic side of church government, stood, that is to say, in idea at least, for free and open discussion, as against the untrammeled decrees of authority, and for the equality of churches, as against the preponderance of metropolitan or patriarch or pope. No more grand eloquent utterance of these principles could indeed possibly be found than the words with which the Council of Ephesus concludes its examination of the Cypriot claim. Let none of the most reverend bishops annex a province which has not been from the first under the jurisdiction of himself and his predecessors. And so the canons of the fathers shall not be overstepped, nor pride of worldly power creep in under the guise of priesthood, nor we lose little by little without knowing it that freedom with our Lord Jesus Christ, the liberator of all men, purchased for us with his blood. And councils really were, at any rate, in two main departments of their activity. The organ, through which the mind of the federated Christian communities did arrive at some definite and lasting self-expression, namely, in the creed and in the canon law. In both directions, it is true, east and west moved only a certain part of the way together. In both, too, while the impulse was given by councils, the influence of the greatest churches added something to the completeness of the work. In the case of the creed, what became a universal usage in the liturgy was at first only a usage of Antioch and Constantinople. In the case of the canon law, the collective decisions of councils were supplemented by the individual judgments of popes or doctors 
before the corpus of either western or eastern law was complete nevertheless it remains the fact that it was from and out of the conciliar movement that church law as such came into being at all that the canons of certain fourth and fifth century councils are the only part of this law common to both east and west and that again the only common formulation of christian doctrine was also the joint work of councils which for that very reason enjoy the name of ecumenical nicaea constantinople and chalcedon one the origins of the christian creed or symbolum are lost in the obscurity which hangs over the sub-apostolic age we know it first in a completed form as used in the roman church about the middle of the second century from rome it spread through the west taking the shape ultimately of our apostles creed and one view of its history would make this roman creed the source of all eastern creeds as well but a summary statement of christian belief for the use of catechumens must have been wanted from very early times and it is possible that what saint paul handed over at the first to his corinthian converts 1 corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 was nothing else than a primitive form of the creed anyhow from whatever source it was derived a common nucleus was expanded or modified to meet the needs of different churches and different generations so that a family likeness existed between all early creeds but i tend to but identity between them of none at the council of nicaea the creed was for the first time given an official and authoritative form and it was at the same time put to a novel use the baptismal creed of the church of palestinian caesarea itself a much more technically theological document than any corresponding creed in the west was propounded by eusebius out of this creed the council constructed its own confessions of faith no longer for baptismal and general use but as the form of sound words by acceptance of which the bishops of the churches throughout the world were to exclude the arian conception of christianity the example of the creed of nicaea on the orthodox side was followed in the next generation by numerous conciliar formularies expressing one shade or another of opposing belief when the nicene cause finally triumphed the Nicene Creed was received all the world over as the expression of the Catholic faith, and the Council of Ephesus condemned as derogatory to it the composition of any new formula, however orthodox. The Council of Ephesus represented the Alexandrine position. At Constantinople, however, a new creed was already in use, which was like enough to the Nicene Creed to pass as an expanded form of it, and was determined in the end to annex both its name and fame this creed of constantinople had been developed out of some older creed probably that of jerusalem by the help of the test phrases of the nicenum and of further phrases aimed at the opposite heresies of the semi sabellian marcellus and the semi arian macedonius it may be supposed that this creed had been laid before the fathers of the council of 381 for at the council of chalcedon where of course constantinopolitan influences were dominant it was recited as the creed of the one hundred and fifty fathers of constantinople on practically equal terms with the creed of three eighteen fathers of nicaea in another fifty years the two creeds were beginning to be hopelessly confused at least in the sphere of constantinople and the constantinopolitanum was introduced into the liturgy as the actual creed of nicaea in the course of the sixth century it became not only the liturgical but also the baptismal creed throughout the east in the west it never superseded the older baptismal creeds except apparently for a time under byzantine influence in rome but as a liturgical creed it was adopted in spain on the occasion of the conversion of king ricard and his arian visigoths in 589 and spread thence in the course of time through gaul and germany to rome two canon law even more clearly than the creed owed its development to the work of councils 
the conception of a church law, ius ecclesiasticum, ius canonicum, was not matured till the fourth century, and then largely as a result of the new position of the church in relation to the state and in conscious or unconscious imitation of the civil law. Down to the close of the era of persecutions, the discipline of the church was administered under consensual jurisdiction without any written code other than the scriptures, in general subordination to the unwritten canon, or regula, the rule of truth, the ecclesiastical tradition. Primitive books like the Didascalia Apostolorum and the Apostolic Church Order give us a naive picture of the unfettered action of the bishop, as judge, with his presbyters as assessors. But as time went on, the question to be dealt with grew more and more complex. It became no longer possible to keep the world at arm's length, and the relations of Christians with the heathen society round them required an increasingly delicate adjustment. The simplicity of the rigorous discipline by which in the second century all sins of idolatry, murder, fraud, and unchastity were visited with lifelong exclusion from communion, yielded at one point after another to the demands of Christian charity and to the need of distinctions between case and case. The problem became pressing when the persecution of Decius suddenly broke up the long peace, and multitudes of professing Christians were tempted or driven to a monetary apostasy. The Novantianist minority seceded, rather than hold out, to these unwilling idolaters, the hope of any readmission to the sacraments. The church was forced to face the situation, and it was obviously undesirable that individual bishops should educate upon similar circumstances in wholly different ways. It was here that St. Cyprian struck out his successful line. His first councils were called to deal with the disorganization which the persecution left behind it, and the bishops, at least of Africa, were induced to agree upon a common policy worked out on a uniform scale of treatment. There is, however, nothing to show that at Cyprian's councils any canons were committed to writing to serve as permanent standard of church discipline. That crucial step was only taken fifty years later, as the persecution initiated by Diocletian relaxed, and the bishops of various localities could meet to take common counsel for the repair of moral and material damage. During the decade 305 to 315, the bishops of Spain met at Alvira, the bishops of Asia Minor at Anchira, and at Neocasaria, the western bishops generally at Arles. And the codes of these four councils are the earliest material preserved in later canon law. The decision of such councils had, however, no currency in the first instance outside their own localities, and even the Council of Ars was a concilium plenarium only of the West. But the feeling was already gaining strength, and it was quite in accordance with the ecclesiastical policy of Constantine that uniformity was desirable even in many matters where it was not essential, and an ecumenical council offered unique opportunities of arriving at a common understanding. So, we find the Council of Nicaea issuing, side by side with its doctrinal definition, a series of disciplinary regulations among which are incorporated, often in greatly modifying form, some canons of the Eastern Council of Ankira and some canons of the Western Council of Arles. These Nicene canons are the earliest code that can be called canon law of the whole church. And at least in the West, they enjoyed something like the same finality in the realm of discipline that the Nicene Creed enjoyed in the realm of doctrine. Other canon than the Nicene canon the Roman Church receives not. The Nicene canons alone is the Catholic Church bound to recognize and to follow, writes Innocent of Rome, in the cause of St. Chrysostom. Leo does not exclude quite so rigorously the possibility of additions to the Church's code, but the Nicene Fathers still exercise an authority unhampered by time or place. Mensuris usc infinim, Mundi legis ecclesiasticorum caninum condiderunt, et pudnoset in toto orbe terrarum. The principle was simplicity itself, but it came to be worked out with a naive disregard of facts. On the one hand, the genuine Nicene Code was not accepted quite entire, 
and where western tradition and nicene rules were inconsistent it was not always the tradition that went under the canon against kneeling at eastertide is in all early versions that we can connect with rome entirely absent the canon against the validity of the Paulianist baptism was misinterpreted to mean that the Paulianists did not employ the baptismal formula. On the other hand, many early codes that had no sort of real connection with the Nicene councils sheltered themselves under its name and shared its authority. The canons of Ancyra, Neocisaria, and Gangra, possibly also those of Antioch, were all included as Nicene in the early Gallican collection the canons of Sardica, probably because of the occurrence in them of the names of Hosius of Cordova, are in most of the oldest collections, joined without break to the canons of Nicaea, and a rather acrimonious controversy was carried on between Rome and Carthage in the years 418 and 419 because Pope Zosimus cited the Sardican canons as Nicene, and the Africans neither found these canons in their own copies nor could learn anything about them in the East. The original form of the collection, known as Isidore's, was apparently translated from the Greek under Roman auspices at about this time. The canons of Nicaea are those Quas Sancta Romana Recipit Ecclesia, the codes of the six Greek councils Ancyra, Neocaesaria, Gangra, Antioch, Laodicea, and Constantinople follow, and then the Sardican canons under the heading Concilium Nicaeum Twenty. Episcoporum, K in Greco non habentor, said in Latino inventor ita. A Gallican editor of this version, later in the fifth century, combines the newer material with the older tradition in the shape of a canon proposed by Hosius, giving the sanction of the Nicene or Sardican Council to the three codes of Ancyra, Neocaesaria, and Gangra. We must not suppose that all this juggling with the name Nicene was in the strict sense fraudulent. We need not doubt the good faith of St. Ambrose when he quoted a canon against Digimus clergy as Nicene, though it is really neo Caesare, or of St. Augustine when he concludes that the followers of Paul of Samosata did not observe the rule of baptism because the Nicene canons ordered them to be baptized, or for that matter, of popes Zosimus and Boniface, because they made the most of the Sardican prescriptions about appeals to Rome, which their manuscripts treated as Nicene. The fact was that the twenty canons of Nicaea were not sufficient to form a system of law. The new wine must burst the old bottle, and by hook or by crook the code of authoritative rules must be enlarged, if it was to be a serviceable guide for the uniform exercise of church discipline. The spurious canon which the Gallican Isidore fathers on Hoseus puts, just this point, Conia multa pretermissa sunt que ad rohor ecclesiasticum pertinent, que iam priori synodo constituta sunt. Let these other acts, too, receive sanction. In the fourth century, the councils had committed their canons to writing. In the fifth century, came the impulse to collect and codify the extant material into a corpus of canon law. The first steps were taken, as might be expected, in the East, somewhere about the year 400, and in the sphere of Constantinople Antioch, the canons of half a dozen councils held in that part of the world during the preceding century were brought together into a single collection and numbered continuously throughout. The editio princeps, so to say, of this Greek code contained the canons of Nicaea, 20, Ancyra, 25, Neocaesaria, 14, Gangra, 20, Antioch, 25, and Laodicea, 59. It was rendered into Latin by the Isidorian collector, and it was used by the officials of the Church of Constantinople at the Council of Chalcedon, for in the fourth session canons 4 and 5 of Antioch, were read as Canon 83 and Canon 84, and in the 11th session, Canons 16 and 17 of Antioch as Canon 95 and 96. The Canons of Constantinople were the first appendix to the Code. They are translated in the Isidorian collection, and they are cited in the Acts of Chalcedon, but in neither case under the continuous numeration. When Diocenius Exegus early in the 6th century made a quasi-official book of canon law for the Roman Church, 
he found the cannons of Constantinople numbered with the rest, bringing up the total to 165 chapters. His two other Greek authorities, the canons of the Apostles and the canons of Chalcedon, were numbered independently. The earliest Syriac version adds to the original nucleus only those of Constantinople and Chalcedon, with a double system of numeration. The one separate for each council, the other continuous throughout the whole series. And in the Digest of Canon Law, published about the middle of the 6th century by John Scholasticus of Antioch, afterwards intruded as Patriarch of Constantinople, the great synods of the fathers after the apostles are ten in number, that is, not counting the apostolic canons, the councils proper are brought up to ten by the inclusions of Sardica, Constantinople, Ephesus, and Chalcedon. And besides these, many canonical rules were laid down by Basil the Great. Two features in the work of John the Lawyer illustrate the transition from earlier to later canon law. In the first place, the list of authorities is no longer confined strictly to councils, to whose decrees alone canonical validity, as yet, attached in the 4th and 5th centuries. A new element is introduced with the canons of St. Basil, and by the time we arrive at the end of the 7th century, when the constituent parts of Eastern canon law were fully settled in the Quinnus Sextine Council in Trullo, the enumeration of Greek councils is followed by the enumeration of the individual doctors of the Greek church and an equal authority is attributed to the rules or canons of both. In the second place, John represents a new movement for the arrangement of the material of church law, not on the older historical and chronological method by which all the canons of each council were kept together, but on a system of subject matter headings, so that in every chapter all the appropriate rules, however different in date or inconsistent in character, would be set down in juxtaposition. Three of John's contemporaries were doing the same sort of thing for Latin church law that he had done for the Greek. The deacon Ferrandus of Carthage, in his Breviatio Canonum, Chrysonius also in African, in his Concordia Canonum, and Martin, the bishop of Braga in northwestern Spain, in his Capitula. But the day of the Greek medieval systematizers was not yet. These tentative effects after an orderly system seem to have met, at most, with local success, and the business of canonists was still directed in the main to the enlargement of their codes, rather than to the coordination of the diverse elements existing side by side in them. Early Greek church law was simple and homogeneous enough, for it consisted of nothing but Greek councils. Even the first beginnings of the corpus of Latin church law were more complex because not one element but three went into its composition. We have seen that its nucleus consisted in the universal acceptance of the canons of Nicaea, and in the grafting in the canons of other early councils onto the Nicene stock. Thus, whereas Greek canon law admitted no purely Latin element, and in that way had no sort of claim to universality, Latin canon law not only admitted, but centered round Greek material. Of course, as soon as the idea of a corpus of ecclesiastical law took shape in the West, a Latin element was bound to add itself to the Greek, and this Latin element took two forms. The natural supplement to Greek councils were Latin councils, and every local collector would add to his Greek code the councils of his own part of the world, Gallic, Spanish, African, as the case might be. But just about the same time, with the commencement of the continuous series of councils, whose canons were taken up into our extant Latin codes, commences a parallel series of papal decretals. The African councils begin with the Council of Carthage in 390 and the Council of Hippo in 393. The decretals with a letter of Pope Syracius to Hymerius of Taranga in 385. Such decretal letters were issued to churches in most parts of the European West, Illyria included, but not to North Italy which looked to Milan, and not to Africa, which depended on Carthage. As their immediate destination was local, not one of them is found in the early Western codes so universally as the Greek councils. 
On the other hand, their circulation was larger than that of any local Western council, and some or others of them are found in almost every collection. It would even appear that a group of some eight decretals of Syracius and Innocent, Zosimus and Celestine, had been put together and published as a sort of authoritative handbook before the papacy of Leo, 441 to 461. Outside Rome, there were thus three elements normally present in a Western code the Greek, the local, and the papal. In a Roman collection, the decretals were themselves the local element. Thus, Dionysius Exegesis' edition consists of two parts, the first containing the Greek councils, and by exception the Carthaginian Council of 419, the second containing papal letters from Syracius down to Galatius and Anastasius II. But even the Code of Dionysius, though superior to all others in accuracy and convenience, was made only for Roman use, and for more than two centuries had only a limited vogue elsewhere. Each district in the West had its separate church law, as much as its separate liturgy, or its separate political organization. And it was not till the union of Gaul and Italy under one head in the person of Charles the Great that the collection of Dionysius, as sent to Charles by Pope Hadrian in 774, was given official position throughout the Franklin dominions. End of section 21. Section 22 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 22, Chapter 7, Expansion of the Teutons to A.D. 378, by Martin Bain. The race which played the leading part in history after the breakup of the Roman Empire was the race known as the Teutons. Their early history is shrouded in obscurity, an obscurity which only begins to be lightened about the end of the second century of our era. Such information as we have we owe to Greeks and Romans, and what they give us is almost exclusively contemporary history and the few fragmentary statements referring to earlier conditions, invaluable as they are to us, do not go far behind their own time. Archaeology alone enables us to penetrate further back. Without its aid, it would be vain to think of attempting to answer the question of the origin and original distribution of the Germanic race. The earliest home of the Teutons was in the countries surrounding the western extremity of the Baltic Sea, comprising what is now the south of Sweden, Jutland with Schleswig-Holstein, the German Baltic coast to about the Oder, and the islands with which the sea is studded as far as Gotland. This, not Asia, is the region which, with a certain extension south, as far, say, as the great mountain chain of central Germany, may be described as the cradle of the Indo-Germanic race. According to all appearance, this was the center from which it impelled its successive waves of population towards the west, south, and southeast to take possession, in the end, of all Europe and even of a part of Asia. A portion of the Indo-Germanic race, however, remained behind in the north to emerge after the lapse of 2,000 years into the light of history as a new people of wonderful homogeneity and remarkable uniformity of physical type, the people which we know as the Teutons. The expansion of the Indo-Germanic race and its division into various nations and groups of nations had, in the main, been completed during the Neolithic period, so that in the Bronze Age, roughly for the northern races, BC 1500 to 500, the territories which we have indicated above belonged exclusively to the Teutons, who formed a distinct race with its own special characteristics and language. The distinctive feature of the civilization of these prehistoric Teutons is the working of bronze. It is well known that in the north, a region where the Bronze Age was of long duration, a remarkable degree of skill was attained in this art. The northern Teutonic Bronze Age forms, therefore, in every respect a striking phenomenon in the general history of human progress. On the other hand, 
The advance in culture, which followed the introduction of the use of iron, was not, at first, shared by the northern peoples. It was only about BC 500, that is to say, quite 500 years later than in Greece and Italy, in the south of France and the upper part of the Danube Basin, that the use of iron was introduced among the Teutons. The period of civilization, usually known as the Hallstatt period, of which the latter portion, from about BC 600 onwards, was not less brilliant than the later Bronze Age, remained practically unknown to the Teutons. The nearest neighbors of the Teutons in this earliest period were, to the south, the Celts, to the east, the Baltic peoples, Letts, Lithuanians, Prussians, and the Slavs, and the extreme north, the Finns. How far the Teutonic territories extended northward, it is difficult to say. The southern extremity of Scandinavia, that is to say, the present Sweden up to about the lakes, certainly always belonged to them. This is put beyond doubt by archaeological discoveries. The Teutons, therefore, have as good a claim to be considered the original inhabitants of Scandinavia as their northern neighbors, the great Finnish people. It is certain that even in the earliest times they were expanding in a northerly direction, and that they settled in the Swedish Lake District, as far north as the Dal Elf, in the southern part of Norway, long before we have any historical information about these countries. Whether they found them unoccupied, or whether they drove the Finns steadily backward, cannot be certainly decided, although the latter is the more probable. The Sitones, whom Tacitus mentions along with the Suiones as the nations dwelling furthest to the north, were certainly Finns. On the east, the Teutonic territory, which, as we saw, did not originally extend beyond the Oder, touched on that of the Baltic peoples, who were later known collectively by a name which is doubtless of Teutonic derivation, as Aists, Aestii in Tacitus, Germania 45. To the south and east of these lay the numerous Slavonic tribes, called Venedi or Veneti by ancient writers. The land between the Oder and the Vistula was therefore, in the earliest times, inhabited in the north by peoples of the leto lithuanian linguistic group, and southward by Slavs. On this side, also, the Teutons in quite early times forced their way beyond the boundaries of their original territory. In the 6th century BC, as can be determined with considerable certainty from archaeological discoveries, the settlement of these territories by the Teutons was, to a large extent, accomplished, the Baltic peoples being forced to retire eastward, beyond the Vistula, and the Slavs toward the southeast. It is likely that the conquerors came from the north, from Scandinavia, that they sought a new home on the south coast of the Baltic and towards the east and southeast. To this points also the fact, otherwise hard to explain, that the tribes which in historic times are settled in these districts, Goths, Gepidae, Rugiae, Lamoviae, Burgundiae, Carinae, Verinae, and Vandals, form a separate group, substantially distinguished in customs and speech from the Western Teutons, but showing numerous points of affinity, especially in language and legal usage, to the Northern Teutons, when, further, a series of Eastern Teutonic names of peoples appear again in Scandinavia, those, for instance, of the Goths, Gothigoth, Gautar, Gotland, Grutungi, Greotungi, Rugians, Rugi, Riger, Rogaland, Burgundiones, Burgundar, Homer, and when we find in Jordanus the legend of the Gothic migration, asserting that this people came from Scandinavia, Scansa Insula, as the Officina Gentium of Certe Velit Vagina Nationum, the evidence in favor of a gradual settlement of eastern Germany by immigrants from the north seems irresistible. By the year BC 400, at latest, the Teutons must have reached the northern base of the Sudetes. It was only a step further to the settlement of the Upper Vistula, and if the Bastarnae, the first Germanic tribe which comes into the light of history, had their seat here about BC 300, the settlement of the whole basin of the Upper Vistula, right up to the Carpathians, must have been carried out by the Teutons in the course of the 4th century BC. It was with Celts that the Teutons came in contact towards the sources of the Oder in the mountains which formed the boundary of Bohemia. Now there is no race which the Teutons owe so much as to the Celts. The whole development of their civilization was most strongly influenced by the latter, 
so much so that in the centuries next before the Christian era, the whole Teutonic race shared a common civilization with the Celts, to whom they stood in a relation of intellectual dependence. In every aspect of public and private life, Celtic influence was reflected. How came it then that a people whose civilization shows such marked characteristics as that of the Teutons of the later Bronze Age could lose these with such surprising rapidity, perhaps in the course of a single century? The earliest habitat of the Teutons extended, as we have seen, on the south as far as the Elbe. This river also marks the northern boundary of the Celts. All Germany west of the Elbe, from the North Sea to the Alps, was in the possession of the Celts at the time when the Teutons occupied the western shores of the Baltic Basin. The vigorous power of expansion, which this race displayed in the last thousand years of the prehistoric age, has left its traces throughout Europe and even in Asia, and that is what gives it such importance in the history of the world. The whole of Western Europe, France with Belgium and Holland, the British Isles, and the greater part of the Pyrenean Peninsula, in the south the region of the Alps and the plains of the Po, has been, at one time or another, subject to their rule. Eastward, migratory swarms of Celts pushed their way down the Danube to the Black Sea and even into Asia Minor. The starting point of this movement was probably in what is now northwestern Germany and the Netherlands, and this region is therefore to be regarded as the original home of the Celtic race. Place names and river names, the study of which is a most valuable means of elucidating prehistoric conditions, enable us to prove the existence in many districts of this original Celtic population. They are scattered over the whole of western Germany and as far as Brabant and Flanders, but occur with a special frequency between the Rhine and the Weser. In the north, the Warpbach, northeast of Bremen, marks the limits of their distribution. In the east, the course of the Lina, down to Rosope. In the south, they extend as far as the main, where the Aschaff, anciently Ascaffa, at Aschaffenburg, forms the last outpost of their territory. They are not found on the strip of coast along the North Sea, occupied later by the Chausi and Frisians, nor on the western side of the Elbe. From this, we may safely conclude that these districts were abandoned by their original Celtic population earlier, indeed considerably earlier, than those to the west of the Weser, and also that the expansion of the Teutons westwards proceeded along two distinct lines, though doubtless almost contemporaneously, one westward along the North Sea, and one in a more southerly direction, up the Elbe, along both its banks. With this view, the results of prehistoric archaeology are in complete agreement. We have determined the area of distribution of the Northern Bronze Age, which we saw to be specifically Teutonic, as consisting, in the earlier period, up to circa BC 1000, of Scandinavia and the Danish islands, and also Schleswig-Holstein, Mecklenburg, and West Pomerania, and therefore bounded on the southwest by the Elbe. But in the later Bronze Age, circa BC 1000 to 600, this territory is enlarged in all directions. On the south and west especially, to judge from the evidence of excavations, it extends from the point at which the Verta flows into the Oder, in the southwesterly direction, through the Spreewald and Flaming districts, to the Elbe, then further west to the Hartz, and from there northwards, along the Ocaire and Allaire, to about the estuary of the Weser, and finally along the coastline as far as Holland. In Thuringia, the Celtic peoples maintained their hold somewhat longer. The northern part of it, above the Unstrut, may have received a Teutonic population in the course of the 5th century BC, the southern in the course of the 4th. On the other hand, the whole region westward from the Weser and the Thuringian forest as far as the Rhine was still in the possession of the Celts about the year BC 300, and was only conquered by the Teutons in the course of the following century. It may be taken as the assured result of all the linguistic and archaeological data that only about the year BC 200 the whole of northwestern Germany was held by the Teutons, who had now reached the frontier lines formed by the Rhine and the Main. About the close of the 5th century BC, a new civilization appears in the Celtic domain, a civilization which, from the fine taste and technical perfection of its productions, deserves in more than one respect to rank with that of the classical nations. This is the so-called Latin Civilization, 
which takes its name from a place on the north side of the Lake of Neuchâtel, where especially numerous and varied remains of it have come to light. Where its center is to be located, we do not know. Somewhere, we may conjecture, in the south of France or in Switzerland. Starting from this point, it spread through all the parts of Europe, which were not under the sway of the Greek and Roman civilization. Following the course of the Rhone, of the Rhine, and of the Danube, it rapidly conquered all the countries in which Gallic tongues were spoken, and maintained its supremacy until the Greco-Roman civilization deposed it from its primacy. It was with this highly developed civilization, so far superior, especially in its highly advanced knowledge of the working of iron, to the northern, which still only made use of bronze, that the Teutons came in contact with their advance towards the southwest. It is quite intelligible that the Teutons, in the course of their two hundred years of struggle with the Celts for the possession of northwestern Germany, should have eagerly adopted the higher civilization of the Celts. Vague reminiscences of the former supremacy of the Celtic race survived into historic times. Ac fuit antea tempus cum germanos gali virtute superarent, ultra bella inferent, propter hominum multitudinem, agrique inopiam trans renum colonias materent, writes Caesar a piece of information which he must have derived from Gaulish sources. Here belongs also the Gallic tradition reported by Timaginus, according to which a part of the nation was said ab insulis extimis, confluxisse et tractibus transrenianis, curbitate bellorum et adduxione fervidi maris sedibus suis expulsos. Caesar himself mentions a Celtic tribe, the Menapii, on the right bank of the lower Rhine. It is impossible to avoid the conclusion that the Celtic Tariscans of northern Hungary were originally settled in south-central Germany between the Erzgeberg and the Hartz, but later, about BC 400, were forced out of this district by the pressure of the advancing Germans and retired in two sections toward the south and the southeast. About the year BC 200, the Teuton occupation of northwest Germany was, as we have seen, completed having reached the Rhine on the west and the Main on the south. But the great forward movement toward the southwest was not to be stayed by these rivers. Vast waves of population kept pressing downward from the north and giving fresh impetus to the movement. The whole Germanic world must, at that time, have been in constant ferment and unrest. Nations were born and perished. Everywhere there was pressure and counter-pressure. Any people that had not the strength to maintain itself against its neighbors or to strike out a new path for itself, was swept away. The tension thus set up first found relief on the Rhenish frontier. About the middle of the 2nd century BC, Teutonic hordes swept across the river and occupied the whole country westward of the Lower Rhine as far as the Ardennes and the Eiffel. These hordes were the ancestors of the later tribes and clans which meet us here in the first dawn of history, the Eburones, Condrusi, Cairoisi, Pimeni, Segni, Nervii, Grudii, and also of the Texuandri, Sunuki, Vitusii, Carasses, who appear later, as well as of the Tungri, who after the annihilation of the Eburones by Caesar, succeeded to their territory and position of influence. The Treveri, on the other hand, who had their seat further to the south, beyond the Eiffel, were doubtless Celts. The Teutonic invasion of Gaul, must have taken place mainly in the second half of the second century BC, but it was still in progress in Caesar's time. It may suffice briefly to recall in this connection the successful campaign of Ariovistus, the incursion immediately before Caesar entered upon his province of 24,000 Harudi into the country of the Sequani, the invasion of the Suebi under Nasua and Simbarius in the year 58, and of the Usipides and Tencteri at the beginning of the year BC 55, that there were even later immigrations of Teutonic hosts into northeastern Gaul may be conjectured from the absence of any mention by Caesar of several of the tribes which were settled here in the time by the empire, and this conjecture is raised almost to a certainty by the known existence of the Tungri. It was only later, in the time of the migrations of the Cimbri, and doubtless in connection therewith, that the frontier formed by the main was crossed. It was, to the best of our information, a portion of the Suebi, previously settled on the northern bank of this river, who were the first to push across it, and after driving out the Helvetii, established themselves firmly to the south of the river, and were here known under the name of Marcomani, 
men of the marches. The name first meets us in Caesar, in the enumeration of the peoples led by Ariovistus. Their country, the Marca, extended south to the Danube. That the Tolingi, mentioned by Caesar as Venetini of the Helveti, were of Germanic origin is put beyond doubt by their name, which is good German and forms a pendant to that of the Syringi. But it will doubtless be near the truth to see in them not the whole nation of the Marcomanni, but only a tribe or local division of it, and doubtless its advance guard towards the south. In any case, it is evident from Caesar's account that numbering as they did around 36,000, of whom about 8,000 were warriors, they formed a united whole with a definite territory and were not merely a migratory body of Marcomanni gathered there, ad hoc. A remnant of the old Marcomanni of South Germany, who in the year BC 9 migrated to Bohemia, is doubtless to be found in the Suebi Necritis, whom we meet with in the time of the empire on the lower Neckar. Further to the north, on the southern bank of the Main, near Mittenberg, we find the name of the Tautoni in an inscription which came to light in the year 1878. Hereupon certain scholars have arrived at the conviction that this locality was the original home of the Teutonis, whom we hear of in association with the Cimbri, and so that they were not of Germanic but of Celtic origin, being of Helvetic race and identified with the Helvetic local clan of the Teugen of Strabo. This hypothesis must be absolutely rejected. There must have been some connection between those Teutoni and the Teutoni of history, but to conclude without more ado that the Teutoni were Helvetic, South German Celts, is to do direct violence to the whole body of ancient tradition, which consistently represents the Teutoni as a people whose original home was in the north. The simplest solution of the difficulty is that the Mittenberg Teutoni were a fragment which split off from the Teutonic peoples during their migration southward and settled in this district, just as in northeastern Gaul a portion of the Cimbri and Teutones maintained itself as the tribe of the Aduatuki. The whole process of the expulsion of the Celts from South Germany must have been accomplished between BC 100 and 70, for Caesar knows of no Gauls on the right bank of the Upper Rhine, and the Helvetii had been living for a considerable time to the south of the headwaters of the river which, as Caesar tells us, divides Helvetic from German territory. The first collision between the Teutons and the Greco-Roman world took place far to the east of Gaul. It resulted from a great migration of the eastern Teutonic tribes in the neighborhood of the Vistula, which had carried some of them as far as the shore of the Black Sea. The chief of these tribes was that of the Bestarni. Settled, it would seem, before their exodus near the headwaters of the Vistula, they appear as early as the beginning of the 2nd century BC, near the estuary of the Danube. The whole region north of the Pruth, from the Black Sea to the northern slope of the Carpathians, was in their possession and remained so during all the time that they are known to history. Another Germanic tribe, doubtless dependent upon them, meets us in the same district, namely the Shiri from the Lower Vistula. The well-known and much-discussed Sefuma of the town of Albia in honor of Protogenes mentions them as allied with the Galatai, and there has been much debate as to what nation is to be understood by these Galatai. And they have sometimes been conjectured to be Illyrian Celts, Skordiski, sometimes Thracian, sometimes the also Celtic Britolages, or the Teutonic Bastarni, or even the Goths. The majority of scholars has, however, decided that these Galatians are the Bastarni, whose presence in the neighborhood of Albia in the year BC 182 is attested by Polybius. There is, indeed, much in favor of this hypothesis and nothing against it. The inscription, then, which is proved by the character of the writing to be one of the oldest found in this locality, would have been written about the time of the arrival of the Bastarni at the estuary of the Danube, that is to say, about BC 200 to 180, and would therefore be the earliest documentary evidence for the entrance of the Germanic tribes on the field of general history. As early as the year BC 182, we find the Bastarni in negotiations with Philip of Macedon. Philip's plan was to get rid of the Dardanians, and after settling his allies on the territory, thus vacated, to use it as a base for an expedition against Italy. After long negotiations, the Bastarni in 179 abandoned their lately won territory, crossed the Danube, and advanced into Thrace. At this point, King Philip died, and after an unsuccessful battle with the Thracians, the Bastarni began a retreat to the settlement which they had abandoned 
but a detachment of some 30,000 men under Clondicus pressed on into Dardania. With the aid of the Thracians and Scordiscans, and with the connivance of Philip's successor, Perseus, he pressed the Dardanians hard for a time, but at last, in the winter of 175, he also decided to retire. In Rome, the intrigues of the Macedonian kings had been watched with growing mistrust and displeasure, which found expression in the dispatch of a commission to investigate the situation in Macedonia, and especially on the Dardanian border. This, therefore, is the first occasion on which the Roman state had to concern itself with Teutonic affairs. At that time, it is true, the racial difference between Celts and Teutons was not yet recognized, and the Bastarni were therefore supposed to be Gauls. Before very long, 168, we find the Bastarni again in relations with the king of Macedon. 20,000 men, again under the command of Clonticus, were to join him in his struggle with the Romans in Paeonia. But Perseus was blinded by avarice and failed to keep his promises. Clondicus, therefore, who had already reached the country of the mighty, promptly turned to the right about and marched home through Thrace. From this point, they disappear from history for a time, only to reappear in the Mithridatic Wars as allies of that king, and they consequently appear also in the list of the nations over whom Pompey triumphed in the year 61. End of section 22 Section 23 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 23. Chapter 7. The Expansion of the Teutons by Martin Bang. Part 2. In the east, on the frontiers of Europe and Asia, the Germanic race attracted little notice. But in the west, about the close of the second century BC, it shook the edifice of the Roman state to its foundations and spread the terror of its name over the whole of western Europe. It was the Cimbri, along with their allies the Teutones and the Ambrones, who for half a score of years kept the world in suspense. All three peoples were doubtless of Germanic stock. We may take it as established that the original home of the Cimbri was on the Jutish peninsula, that of the Teutones somewhere between the Ems and the Weser, and that of the Ambrones in the same neighborhood, also along the North Sea coast. The cause of their migration was the constant encroachment of the sea upon their coasts, the occasion being an inundation which devastated their territory great stretches of it being engulfed by the sea. This is the account given by ancient writers, and we have no reason to doubt its truth. The exodus of all three peoples took place about the same time, and obviously in such a way that from the first they went forward in close touch with one another. First they turned southwards, probably following the line of the Elbe, crossed the Erzebirge, and pressed on into Bohemia, the land of the Boii. Driven back by the latter, they seem to have made their way along the valley of the March, southwards to the Danube, and then through Pannonia into the country of the Scordisci. Here, too, they encountered, in the year 114, such a vigorous opposition that they preferred to turn westwards. That brought them into contact with the Taurisci, who had just, B.C. 115, formed a close alliance with the Romans. In the Carnic Alps was stationed a Roman army under the command of the consul Captain Papirius Carbo, which immediately advanced into Noricum. Carbo's attempt by means of a treacherous attack to annihilate the Teutons ended in a severe defeat. The way into Italy now lay open to the victors, but so great was the awe in which they still held the Roman name that they promptly turned away towards the north. Their route led them to the territory of the Helveti, which then extended from the Lake of Constance as far as the Main. The Helveti do not seem to have offered any resistance. Indeed, a considerable section of the Helveti, the Tigurini and the Toigeni, attached themselves to the Teutonic migrants. The Germanic hosts then crossed the Rhine and pressed on southwards, plundering as they went. In B.C. 109, 
they halted in the valley of the Rhone, on the frontier of the Roman province of Transalpine Gaul, for the protection of which a strong army under the consul M. Junius Silanus had taken the field. The Romans attacked, but were defeated for the second time. Again, the Germans shrank from the invading Roman territory and preferred to plunder and ravage the Gallic districts, which they completely laid waste. Finally, in the year 105, they appeared once more on the frontier of the province, this time resolved to attack the Romans. Of the three armies which opposed them, that of the legate Marcus Aurelius Scorus was the first defeated in the territory of the Allobroges. On the 6th of October followed the bloody Battle of Arausio, in which the other two armies, under the consul captain Malleus Maximus and the proconsul Q. Servilius Capio, in all some 60,000 troops, were completely annihilated. But instead of marching into Italy, the barbarians once again let the favorable moment slip and thus lost the fruits of their victory. They divided their forces. The Cimbri marched away westwards, first into the country of the Volcae, and then on over the Pyrenees into Spain, where they carried on a desultory and indecisive struggle with the Celtiberi. The Teutons and Helvetti turned northwards to continue the work of plundering Gaul. In 103, the Cimbrian hosts made their way back to Gaul and reunited, in the territory of the South Belgic Veliocasses, with their comrades who had remained behind. Now, at last, they prepared a march upon Italy. In the spring of 102, the main mass of the united hordes began to move southwards. Only one section, of about 6,000 men, the nucleus of the later tribe, of the Adwatuchi, remained behind in Belgica to guard the spoils. Doubtless with a view to the difficulties of the passage of the Alps, especially in the matter of supply, the invading host was before long divided into three columns. The plan was that the Teutones and the Ambrones should make their way into the plain of the Po from the western side, crossing the Maritime Alps, while the Cimbri and the Tigurini should make a wide flanking movement and enter from the north, the former by way of the Tridentine, the latter by way of the Noric Alps. But the attempt was planned on too vast a scale, and was wrecked by the military skill of Marius. The Ambrones and Teutones were annihilated in the double battle near Aquae Sextiae, summer 102, while the fate of the Cimbri overtook them in the following year. They had already reached the soil of Italy, into which they had forced their way after a victorious encounter with Quintius Lutatius Catullus on the Adige, when, 30th of July, 101, on the plains of Vercelle, the so-called Campi Raudii, they were utterly routed by the united forces of Marius and Catullus. The Tigurini, who were to form the third invading force, received the news of the defeat of the Cimbri when they were still on the Noric Alps, and immediately turned round and retired to their own country. Thus, the great invasion of the northern barbarians was defeated, and western Europe could once more breathe freely. We saw above that about B.C. 100, doubtless in connection with the appearance of the Cimbri and Teutones in South Germany, the line of the main was crossed by the Germanic peoples, and the settlement of the territory between that and the Danube began. Less than a generation later, there was another attempt to extend the Germanic sphere of influence westward over Gaul. About the year B.C. 71, on the invitation of the powerful tribe of the Sequani, Ariovistus, chief of the Suebi, crossed the Rhine with 15,000 warriors to serve as mercenaries to the Sequani against their neighbors, the Aedui. But after the victory was won, the strangers did not return to their own land, but remained on the western side of the Rhine and established themselves in the territory of their employers, taking possession of about a third of it, presumably at its northern extremity. Strengthened by large accessions from the homeland, this Germanic settlement on Gaulish territory, it consisted of the Vangiones, Nemetes, and Triboci, and finally extended over the whole of the left side of the Rhine Valley, eastward of the Vosges, 
soon became a menace to all the surrounding tribes. A united attempt, in which the Edui took a leading part to expel the intruders by force of arms, ended after months of indecisive fighting in a crushing defeat of the Gauls at Admade Taburgia, apparently in the year B.C. 61. Gaul lay defenseless at the feet of the victors, and they did not fail to make the most of their success. The Edui and all their adherents were forced to give hostages and to pay a yearly tribute. None dared to oppose the conquerors, who already regarded the whole of Gaul as their prey. They pursued their work deliberately and systematically, constantly bringing in new swarms of their compatriots, chiefly Suebi and Marcomanni, and assigning them lands in the territories which they had subjugated. Settlers even came in from Jutland, and Ducie and Harudis, 24,000 strong, and on their arrival the Sequani were forced to give up another third of their territory to the newcomers. Thus, the power of Ariovistus became very formidable. The establishment of a great Germanic empire over the whole of Gaul seemed not far distant. At other points also, the Teutons were preparing to cross the Rhine. It seemed as if the example set by Ariovistus would lead to a general invasion of Gaul, flood the whole country with Germans, and overwhelm the Gaulish race. The movement began on the Upper Rhine, on the Helvetic border. The Helveti had been obliged, as we have already seen, to retire further and further before the pressure of the Germans, until finally all the country north of the Lake of Constance was lost to them, and the Rhine became their northern frontier. Even here they were not allowed to rest. A short time after the appearance of Ariovistus, the Teutons had again endeavored to enlarge their border toward the south, and there ensued a long struggle upon the Rhine frontier. It was only by their utmost efforts that the Helveti were able to beat off the attacks of their opponents. Weary of the constant struggle, they at last resolved, B.C. 61, to leave their territory. This, as we have seen, they did three years later, when some smaller tribes, among them the Germanic Tulingi, threw in their lot with them. The Jura region, the entrance to southern Gaul, thus lay open to the Teutons. In the same year there appeared on the Middle Rhine, probably in the Taunus region, a powerful Suebian army. A hundred Gaus, under the leadership of two brothers named Nesua, possibly Masua, and Simbirius, and threatened to invade from this point the territory of the Treveri on the opposite bank. Finally, there was a great restlessness also on the Lower Rhine, among the tribes inhabiting the right bank, especially among the Usipites and the Tencteri, in consequence especially of the repeated aggressions of the warlike Suebi. This was the condition of affairs when Caesar, B.C. 58, took up his command in Gaul. He was well aware of the danger to the Roman occupation which lay in these wholesale immigrations of Germanic hordes into Gaulish territory, and it was consequently his first care to take prompt measures to meet the Teutonic peril. It is well known how he performed this task, how he removed the haunting dread of a general eruption of the Germanic people into Celtic territory, and at the same time established security and order upon the Rhine frontier. The restoration of the conquered Helvetii to their abandoned territory in order that they might continue to serve, but now in the Roman interest, as a buffer state, secured Gaul, especially the Valley of Rhone, against incursions from the direction of the Upper Rhine. His victory over Ariovistus destroyed the latter's vast levies, and with them his ascendancy, but not, and herein we see again the far-sighted policy of the conqueror, the work of colonization begun by the Germanic ruler. The tribes of the Vangiones, Nemeti, Centriboci, which he had settled in Gaul, were allowed to remain where they were, and like the Helveti, were placed under the Roman suzerainty while retaining their racial independence. Ut arserent, non ut custodirentur. 
But while Caesar allowed these settlements to remain, he repressed with all the greater energy all further efforts of expansion on the part of the dwellers of the Upper Rhine. True, the Swabian bands which in 58 had mustered on the right bank of the river had retired on receiving news of the defeat of Ariovistus, so that there was no fighting with them. But the attempt of Eusipetes and Tancteri, the following year, to find a new home for themselves in Gaul led to a battle, in which a large portion of them perished, and the rest were flung back across the Rhine. Augustus assumed the offensive against the Teutons. Even though the extension of the Roman dominion as far as the Elbe affected by the brilliant military successes of the two stepsons of the emperor was of short duration, the year 89 witnessed the loss of the territory won by the expenditure of so much blood, of which it had been proposed to make a new province of Germania Magna. Yet the Rhine frontier was secured for a considerable time to come by a belt of fortresses garrisoned by an enemy of nearly 80,000 men. This frontier was not seriously threatened for 200 years thereafter. Throughout that period, except for a few insignificant raids, Gaul's eastern neighbor remained quiescent. It was only in the third century that unrest shewed itself again, thereafter steadily increasing as time went on, and the cause of this was the appearance of two powerful confederacies which thenceforward dominated the history of the Rhineland, the Alamans and the Franks. While the expansion of the Teutons toward the west was thus barred by the Romans, it proceeded the more vigorously in a southward and southeastward direction. It is true that but little certain information has come down to us. The movements of population implied by the appearance of Marcomanni in Bohemia, the Quadi in Moravia, of the Neristi between the Bomerwald and the Danube, of the Buri, Lacringi, Victavali in the north of the Hungarian lowlands, are all more or less shrouded in obscurity and it is but rarely possible to find a clue to their relations. About B.C. 60, the Boii had been forced by the advance of the Germanic races from the north to abandon their ancestral possessions. A portion of them found a dwelling place in Pannonia. Another portion, on its way from Noricum, joined the Helvetic migration. The north of the country, thus left unoccupied, was immediately taken up by the Hermanduric, Semnonic, and Vandalic bands, offshoots of the three great tribes which flanked Bohemia on the north. From them were doubtless sprung the peoples who at a later time are met with here at the southern base of the Sudetes, the Sudini, Bativi, and Corconti. They were followed by the Marcomanni, who doubtless in consequence of the military successes of Drusus in Germany, made their way, under the leadership of their chief Marbod, to the further side of the Bomerwald and occupied the main portion of the former country of the Boii. The powerful kingdom which this Germanic prince established by bringing in further masses of settlers and by subjugating the surrounding tribes, even the powerful Semnones, the Langobards, the Goths, and the Lugi, Vandals, are said to have acknowledged his suzerainty, had no rival in northern Europe and with its trained army of 70,000 footmen and 4,000 horse, soon became a menace to the Roman Empire. The importance which was attached to it, and to the commanding personality of its ruler by the Romans themselves, is evident from the extraordinary military preparations which Tiberius set on foot. 86. As is well known, the intervention of the Roman arms was not in the end called for, but what even they might not have been able to accomplish was effected by inner dissension. In the struggle for the supremacy of Germany against Arminius at the head of the Cheruski, and of all the other peoples who flocked to the standard of the Liberator Germani, Marbod was defeated, and the fate of his kingdom was thereby decided. First the Semnones and Langobards ranged themselves on the side of his adversaries, then one tribe after another, so that he found his dominions in the end reduced to their original extent, the country of the Marcomanni. With the ruin of his empire, his own fate overtook him. 
treachery in his own camp forced him to seek the protection of the Romans. The fall of its founder did not, however, affect the stability of the Bohemian king of the Suebi. Although the Marcomanni were never afterwards able to regain their ascendancy, they held their own far into the decline of the ancient world, in the country which they had occupied under Marbod's leadership. Indeed, after a time their power was so far revived that in alliance with the Quadi, they were able to dominate the Upper Danube frontier for fully a century. The earliest mention of the Quadi occurs in the geographer Strabo. He names them among the Suebian tribes who settled within the Hercynian forest, the mountains which form the frontiers of Bohemia. The country which they inhabited is nearly the present Moravia. Its eastern frontier was formed by the March, the ancient Maris. That they were of Suebian origin is clear from the express testimony of Strabo, as well as on linguistic grounds. The only point which remains doubtful is whether even before their coming into Moravia they had formed a political unit, or whether they were a migratory band sent out by one of the great Suebian peoples, perhaps the Semnones, which only developed into a united and independent national community after settling in Moravia. The former, however, is more probable. Like their western neighbors, the Marcomanni, the Quadi were the successors of a Celtic people. As the Boii had been settled in Bohemia, so in Moravia, from a remote period and down to Caesar's day, had been settled the Volcae Tectosages. Seeing that, about B.C. 60, the advance of the Teutons from the north over the Erzgebirge and Sudetes caused the Boii to leave their territory, it is probable that at the same time, or a little later, the peoples further to the east became involved in a struggle with the invaders. But whereas the Boii, by their prompt retirement, escaped the danger, the Tectosages, it would appear, were utterly destroyed. We find the Quade soon after in possession of their territory, and since we get no hint of the fate of the Moravian Tectosages, the Romans cannot yet have been in possession of the neighboring country of Noricum. Their destruction must therefore have fallen before B.C. 15, when Noricum passed under the dominion of Rome. If this hypothesis is correct, the eruption of the Quadi into Moravia took place shortly after the Boii had left Bohemia, in any case, a considerable time before the occupation of that country by the Marcomanni. To the west of the Marcomanni, between the Bomerwald and the Danube as far up as the river Nab, were settled the Neristi. It is equally uncertain whence they came, and when they appeared in this region. It is possible, though that is the most that can be said, that like their eastern neighbors they belong to the Suebian Confederacy. Tacitus certainly counts them as members of it, and that they are to be numbered among the peoples which, according to Strabo, Marbod had settled in the region of the Hercynia Silva. Guarding the flanks, as it were, of the southern territories of the Teutons lay two settlements planted by the Romans. In the west, the Hermunduri between the Upper Main and the Danube, and in the east, the Vanianic kingdom of the Suebi. The former came into being B.C. 6-2, the Roman general L. Domitius Ahinabarbus, having assigned to a band of Hermunduri the eastern part of the territory left free by the migration of the Marcomanni into Bohemia, the latter was created by settlement of bands of Suebian warriors belonging to the following of the fallen Suebian leaders, Marbod and Kesvalda. The Maris is, of course, the march. The Cusis, as this Suebian settlement cannot have been very extensive, was probably the Vag, though it may have been the Gran, which lies further to the east. The Bemoi of Ptolemy are probably identical with these Suebians of northern Hungary, who come into notice several times in the course of the first century. As they disappear later, they were probably absorbed by the Quadi. Further towards the northeast, in the Hungarian Erzgebirge, and beyond in the upper regions of the Vistula, we find in the first century of our era the Buri and Sidones. The former, who are mentioned as early as Strabo, were probably of Bastarnian, 
and the latter of Lugian origin. Further still, abutting on the eastern flank of the Sidonis, were the Burgiones, Ambrones, and Fergundiones, doubtless also Bastarnian. If we now review the ethnographic situation in ancient Germany about the close of the first century AD, we find on its western frontier, in the eastern basis of the Lower Rhine, the Chamavi, the Bructeri, the Usipii, the Tencteri, the Chatuarii, and Tubantes. Further in the interior, on both sides of the Weser, the great tribes of the Chatti and the Cherusci. Further to the north, the Angrivarii, and on the North Sea coast, the Chauci and the Frisians. In the heart of the country, three powerful Swabian populations have their seat. On the western bank of the Middle Elbe, extending as far south as the Rhetian frontier, the Hermanduri. North of them, on the western bank of the Lower Elbe, the Langobards. And beyond that river, in the basin of the Havel and the Spree, the Semnones, who were held to be the primitive stock of the Suebi. The eastern part of the country was mainly occupied by the Lugii. The tribes, too, which appeared later, in the wars of the Marcomanni, the Victivali, Astingi, and Lacringi, were doubtless also Vandalic. Northward, in the region of the Vartha and Nets, dwelt the Burgundiones or Burgundi. Further north still, on the Pomeranian Baltic coast, the Rugii and Limovi, next to whom on the western side came, with some of the smaller tribes, the Saxons. North of these again, on the Jutish peninsula, lay the Anglii and the Varini. Turning back to the Vistula again, we find on its eastern bank the Goths, who apparently, by the beginning of our era, had spread from the shores of its estuary to its upper waters. In the south, the portion of the Hermanduri which had its seat between the Main and the Danube formed the first link in a long chain, consisting of Neristi, Marcomanni, Quadi, Buri, and finally, beyond the Confinium Germanorum, the numerous branches of the Bastarnae. It was, therefore, a vast territory which the Germanic races claimed for their own, and yet, as was soon to appear, it was too narrow for the energies of these young and vigorous nations. On their north foamed the sea. To the east yawned the desert steppes of southern Russia. Thus, any further expansion could only take a westward or southward direction. But on one side, as on the other, lay the unbroken line of the Roman frontier. Any attempt at expansion in either of these directions must inevitably lead to an immediate collision with the Roman Empire. The storm which lowered upon the Bohemian mountains was soon to burst. Mighty forces were doubtless at work in the interior of Germany, which shortly after the accession of Marcus Aurelius stirred up the whole mass of nations from the Bomerwald to the Carpathians, and let loose a tempest such as the Roman Empire had never before encountered on its frontiers. In the summer of 167, hosts of barbarians mustered along the line of the Danube, ready to make an inroad into Roman territory. The Praetorian prefect, Furius Victorinus, was defeated and slain with most of his troops, and the invading flood poured forward over the unprotected provinces. Not until the two emperors reached the seat of the war, spring, 168, was the plundering and ravaging stopped. The barbarians then withdrew to the further side of the Danube and declared their readiness to enter into negotiations. There, in the winter of 168 to 69, the plague broke out, with fearful violence in the Roman camp, and at once the complexion of events changed for the worse. In the spring, in the absence of the emperors, who on the outbreak of the epidemic had returned to the capital, the army, weakened and disorganized by disease, suffered another severe defeat, and the Praetorian prefect Macrinius Vindex met his death. Following up their victory, the Teutons assumed the offensive all along the line. A surging mass of people, Hermanduri, Neristi, Marcomanni, Quadi, Lacringi, Buri, Victivali, Astingi, and other tribes, Germanic and Eazigic, swept over the provinces of Raetia, Noricum, Pannonia, 
indeed. Some detached bands even pushed their way into North Italy, laid siege to Aquileia, and destroyed Opitergium further to the west. But the danger passed as quickly as it had arisen. Effective measures were instantly taken. The flood of invasion was stemmed, and as it receded, the Romans, led by the emperor in person, took the aggressive. All the Teutons and Aziyigis, who remained on the south bank, were forced back across the river. So successful were the Romans that by the year 171, the Quadi sued for peace. In the following year, the Roman army crossed the Danube and laid waste to the country of the Marcomanni. Thus, the two most dangerous adversaries had been subdued, and the war seemed over. But by the year 174, the empire again found himself obliged to return to Germany. Scarcely had he entered the country of the Quadi, when the army was placed in a highly dangerous position by an enveloping movement of the enemy and by want of water. Suddenly a torrent of rain descended, and the legionaries saw in the miracle a proof of the favor of the gods and were inspired to fight with splendid valor and gained a complete victory. This broke the resistance of the Quadi, and the Marcomanni were also forced to make peace. In 176, the emperor returned to Rome, and there celebrated, along with his son Commodus, a well-deserved triumph. In 177, Marcus rejoined his army with the purpose of completing the work of conquest. Two new provinces, Marcomania and Sarmatia, were to be added to his empire and were to round off his northern boundary. The war began, apparently before the end of 177, with an attack upon the Quadi, after which the Marcomanni were to be dealt with. In the course of the Three Years' War, both peoples were so thoroughly exhausted that when the emperor suddenly died, 17th of March 180, their military strength was already broken. One of the first acts of Commodus, an unworthy successor to his father, was to make peace which surrendered to the all but beaten enemy every advantage that had been wrested from them. The struggle for the lands to the north of the Danube was at an end. Meanwhile, the Romans were confronted, about the close of the century, with a new and dangerous enemy to the west, in the angle between the main and the frontiers of Upper Germany and Raetia, by the Alamans. As their name indicates, the Alamans were not a single tribe but a union of tribes, a confederacy. We hear somewhat later the names of several of the component tribes, the Juthungi, the Brisigavi, the Businobantes, and the Lentienses. Whence did they come? No doubt the nucleus of this confederacy was formed by the southern divisions of the Hermanduri. To these there may have attached themselves various fragments of people which had split off before and after the Marcomannic War, just as later, toward the middle of the 3rd century, the Semnones, in the course of a migration southward, probably joined this confederacy and were absorbed by it. Before long, as early as 213, the new nation came into contact with the Romans. So far as can be made out from the confused account which is given us of their first appearance, they had invaded Raetia, upon which, whereupon the emperor Caracalla took the field against them, flung them back across the frontier, and advanced into their territory, carrying all before him. Before twenty years had passed, the Teutons, presumably the Alamans again, renewed the attack upon the Roman frontier defenses. So threatening was the situation that the emperor Severus Alexander felt obliged to break off his campaign against the Persians and take over in person the direction of the operations on the Rhine. Negotiations had already begun before his assassination, March 235, but his successor, the rough and soldierly Maximin, brought new life into the campaign. Advancing by forced marches into the country of the Alamans, he drove the barbarians before him without serious resistance, laid waste to their fields and dwellings far and wide, and finally defeated them in the interior of their territory.
Section 24 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hope for Swan. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 24. By Martin Bang. So threatening was the situation that the Emperor Severus Alexander felt himself obliged to break off his campaign against the Persians and take over in person the direction of the operations on the Rhine. Negotiations had already begun before his assassination, March 235, but his successor, the rough and soldierly Maximin, brought new life into the campaign advancing by forced marshes into the country of the ailments he drove the barbarians before him without serious resistance laid waste their fields and dwellings far and wide and finally defeated them far in the interior of their territory the result of this campaign the last war of offence on a large scale which the romans waged on the rhine was the restoration of security to the frontier for a period of twenty years under gallienus probably about the year two hundred and fifty eight the storm broke with irresistible force the armies of the ailments broke through the great chain of frontier fortifications between the main and the danube and after overpowering the scattered roman garrisons poured like a flood across the whole of the agri de comates and established themselves permanently in the conquered territory at the same time Raetia became a prey to them nay more a strong force even crossed the alps and penetrated as far as ravenna the invaders were it is true defeated by gallienus near milan and forced to retreat but the country at the northern base of the alps was lost and its loss threw open to the germanic hordes the gates of italy in addition to the ailments of the upper rhine there now appeared on the lower course of that river another dangerous enemy namely the franks the frontier had scarcely ever been seriously threatened at this point since the days of augustus but now under gallienus the situation was altered here also there had quietly grown up a confederacy which under the name of franchi the free presumably comprised the tribes formerly met within these regions the chamavi sugambri and other smaller clans their name first heard in the time of gallienus was soon to become even more terrible in the ears of the romans than that of the ailments the first attack of the new league of peoples upon the rhine frontier occurred in two hundred and fifty three the districts on the gaulish bank of the rhine soon fell into the hands of the enemy with great difficulty gallienus succeeded in forcing them back across the rhine but others followed them and there ensued a series of desperate struggles which lasted till two hundred and fifty eight on the whole the romans had the best of it even though their army was not large enough to prevent isolated bands of franks from establishing themselves upon the left bank of the rhine in two hundred and fifty eight gallienus was called away to the lower danube which urgently demanded his presence the confusion which was created in the rhine district by the assassination in the following year of the emperor's son valerian who had been left behind as imperial resident at cologne by the ambitious general cassianus posthumus gave the franks a welcome opportunity to make a new inroad into gaul their bands ranged almost unresisted through the whole country from the rhine to the pyrenees devastating as they went then they pushed on as the cimbri had done before them across the mountains into spain and made havoc of that country for several years reducing to subjection even great cities like taraco while like the vandals after them they also made a foray into africa as at the time of the cimbrian war the terror of the germans spread through all the countries of western europe only after a considerable time posthumus a capable soldier and a well-intentioned administrator 
was able to force the germanic hordes out of gaul and restore peace and security but the rhine became the frontier of the empire and remained so as long as the empire lasted from this time onward begins a period of incessant fighting with teutons of the rhine country with the ailments in the south and the franks in the north the weakness and exhaustion of the empire caused by inner dissensions becomes manifest if posthumus succeeded in keeping the roman possessions of on the gaulish bank of the rhine essentially intact his immediate successors were less successful the country was uh, left defenceless and large portions of it were plundered and drained of their resources probus indeed whose short reign two hundred seventy six to two hundred eighty two is a ray of light in these gloomy times succeeded in clearing them out of gaul and even ventured to assume the offensive on the upper rhine in a brilliant campaign forcing the ailments back to the further side of the neckar but such successes were but temporary only in the time of diocletian does a durable improvement on the rhine frontier set in an improvement which was maintained for the next two or three generations during this period a third set of invaders in addition to the franks and ailments appeared towards the close of the century in the saxons the terror of the british and gaulish hosts in the main however gaul was suffered to enjoy peace and with peace returned prosperity meanwhile on the shores of the Euxin, there emerges a people with whose name the world was to ring for centuries the goths their original home had been it would appear in scandinavia and after their migration to the german baltic coast they had at first established themselves about the estuary of the vistula then in course of time they had moved further southward along the right bank of that river so that at the beginning of our era they appear as far south as the neighbourhood of the bohemian kingdom of the marcomanni how long they remained in this region we do not know but it is not unlikely that their eastward migration falls about the time of the great macromanic war we are equally ignorant of the time occupied by this migration and the details of its progress the only thing certain is that it reached its close no later than circa two hundred and thirty to two hundred and forty the territory where the goths at last took up their abode embraced the whole of the northern coast of the black sea in the east it was separated by the dawn from that of the alani in the west it bordered on the tract of county norward of the danube delta and the dacian frontier which had been settled four hundred years earlier by their bastarni and the skiri here the goths tri divided into two sections soon after their immigration that dwelling more to the west being known as the Tervingi, the, the inhabitants of the forest region while the eastern division was known as the gritangi the inhabitants of the steppes for the former the name visigoths vescotti came into use at latest circa three hundred and fifty for the later the name ostrogoths the signations however in which the meaning of is not absolutely certain although the western goths and the eastern goths was an interpretation already known to jordanes the boundary between them was formed by the dniester before long there appear alongside of them other germanic peoples the Gepide, taifali borani urgundi and heruli the two first of these had some original link of connection with them the Gepide indeed appear in the gothic legend of their migrations as an actual part of the gothic nation whether they migrated to the black sea region at the same time as the goths or followed them later must remain an open question towards the end of the reign of severus alexander two hundred and twenty two to two hundred and thirty five the first indications of the appearance on the northern shores of the black sea of a new and powerful barbarian race of a most warlike temper had already become manifest when the greek towns of albia and tyrus fell victim to the sudden descent of an unknown enemy from the north a little later under gordian the third two hundred and thirty eight to two hundred and forty four its name is found in the spring of two hundred and thirty eight gothic war bands marched southwards 
crossed the Danube with the connivance of the Dacian Carpi and broke into the province of Lower Moesia, where they captured and plundered the town of Istrus. The procurator of the province, Tullius Menophilus, 238-241, being unable to repel the invasion by force of arms, induced the Goths to retire by the promise of a yearly subsidy. But by 248 they had renewed their attacks on the Roman frontier, in alliance with the Taifali, Astingi, and Bastanae. Under the leadership of Argeis and Gunteric, their bands again broke into Lower Moesia, assailed without success the fortified town of Martianopol, and plundered the unfortunate province again. But these first exploits of the Goths were completely thrown into the shade by the great invasion of Roman territory made at the beginning of 250, by the half-legendary King Kniva at the head of a powerful army. While the Carpi flung themselves upon Dacia, the Gothic attack was directed as before upon Moesia. Thence a strong detachment pressed onward over the undefended passes of the Balkans into Thrace, laid siege to Philippopolis, and even dispatched a plundering party into Macedonia. One division of the Gothic army, after vainly assaulting Nove and Nicopolis, was defeated in the neighborhood of the latter town by the emperor Decius in person, but this success was immediately counterbalanced by a reverse the Goths, while retiring southwards by way of Bero, Augusta Traiana, the present Eschi Sagra, on the southern slope of the Balkans, defeated the Roman troops who were pursuing them. After this battle, the victorious Goths effected a junction with their countrymen who were investing Philippopolis, and that city fell into their hands. The Romans, however, were now making extensive preparations in view of which the barbarians began their retreat. Decius, eager to wipe out the failure at Bero, sought to bar their path, and in the hope of inflicting a crushing defeat upon them, engaged them near Abritus, about thirty miles southeast of Durostorum, Celestria, in June 251. The day, which began well for the Romans, ended in a fearful disaster. A great part of their army was destroyed, and the emperor himself and one of his sons were among the slain. The country from which the barbarians had just retired now lay once more defenseless before them. They were finally bought off by the promise of a yearly subsidy. The Gothic War of 250-251 to 251 had revealed in its full extent the danger which had lain hidden behind the mountains of Dacia. Later events did little to remove the terrible impression which the invasion of Kniva had left behind. On the contrary, the history of the eastern half of the empire in the reigns of Valerian and Gallienus, Claudius, Aurelian and Probus is filled with incessant struggles against the Goths and their allies, for even Asia Minor was not exempt from their ravages. Besides, the bands which swept down by the Balkans and back again, there were now others which came by the sea from the Crimea and Lake Makotis to ravage this constantly widening area of the coasts of Asia Minor, and which even penetrated to the inland districts. Especially prominent in these piratical raids were the Borani and Heruli, two peoples who here appear in history for the first time, side by side with the Goths. The first of these expeditions, made by the Burani in 256 against the town of Pityus on the eastern shore of the Black Sea, ended in failure, but by the following year these same Burani succeeded in capturing and sacking Pityus and Trapezus. Even more destructive was the expedition which, spring 258, was undertaken by the West Goths, starting by sea and land from the port of Tyrus. The whole western coast of Bithynia, with the cities of Chalcedon, Nicomedia, Nicaca, Apamea, and Prusa, was ravaged. The year 263, 264, and 265 also witnessed the vasting of the coastlands of Asia Minor by similar expeditions of the Pontic Teutons. Ilium, Ephesus with its renowned temple of Artemis, and Chalcedon were this time the victims of the barbarians.
but all these exploits were far surpassed in importance by the great plundering expedition of the heruli in the year two hundred and sixty seven from lake mautis a fleet said to have been five hundred strong sailed along the western shore of the euxine then through the bosphorus where they made a successful coup de main against byzantium through the propontis where Sisychus was captured and the hellespont and onward past lemnos and scyros across the aegean to greece here on the classic soil of attica argolis and laconia the wild hosts of these barbarians made fearful havoc and it was long enough before the bewildered provincial government ventured to oppose them the defenders in whose ranks the historian dexippus of athens played a leading part gradually gained confidence and when they had succeeded in destroying the ship the invaders were obliged to retreat by the land route beaten by the roman troops their host rolled northwards through boeotia epirus macedonia towards their home which they succeeded in reaching also hard pressed by the pursuers and at the very last compelled by the emperor gallienus to fight a battle in which they incurred heavy losses at the river nestus on the boundary between macedonia and thrace we have seen above how the danube has been constantly threatened since the appearance of the goths on the black sea how invasion after invasion had descended on dacia and moesia soon after the accession of gallienus probably two hundred and fifty six to two hundred and fifty seven dacia with the exception of the narrow strip between the Themis and the danube which continued to be held down to the time of aurelian together with a portion of lower moesia which lay to the north of the danube the present great Valachia, became the prey of the barbarians some of the west goths settled in great valachia and the taifali in the banat the northern districts especially transylvania were occupied by the victovoli and gepide who at this time make their appearance among the, the enemies of rome the consequence of the loss of dacia and transdanube and moesia was that the two was that the teutons now be, became on the lower danube as well as elsewhere the immediate neighbours of the empire that their territory being divided from it only by the river only once in this whole period of inward decay did the imperial powers sudden succeed in winning a decisive victory it was the achievement of the emperor claudius whom his grateful contemporaries and successors have rightly adorned with the honourable title of gothicus in the spring of two hundred and sixty nine the teutons made yet another attack upon the empire surpassing all former ones in violence east goths and west goths whom tradition here first distinguishes bastone poeucini gepide and heruli united their forces and advanced with a mighty army and fleet estimated in the sources of at three hundred thousand fighting men and two thousand ships against the Danubian frontier once more the province of lower moesia bore the brunt of their attack the land army of the teutons in which lay their main strength first made an unsuccessful attempt to take tomi and marcianople then swept like a flood over the interior of the country wasting and plundering as they went meanwhile the fleet which was manned chiefly by heruli sailed past Byzant schysicus into the aegean and appeared before thessalonica part of it remained there and blockaded the city the remainder were made a great plundering expedition which bears eloquent testimony to the seamanship and daring of these teutons along the coasts of macedonia greece and asia minor extending even as far as crete and cyprus this was the situation when the, the emperor claudius reached the scene of war at his approach the besiegers of the hard-pressed thessalonica had hastily drawn up northwards and effected a junction with their kinsmen in upper moesia the hostile forces met near nasus in the desperate struggle which ensued the teutons suffered a crushing defeat what remained of their army was in part cut to pieces in the pursuit in part driven into the inhospitable recesses of the balkans where the survivors surrendered they were partly enrolled in the roman army partly in pursuance of a policy initiated by the emperor marcus settled as colony in the devastated frontier districts 
thus the danger was averted from the empire and the desire of its restless neighbours beyond the danube to make expeditions on the great scale was damped for nearly a hundred years no doubt the inroads and piratical voyages of smaller gothic war bands continued war bands continued indeed in the next fourteen years two hundred and seventy to two hundred and eighty four there was fighting with bands in this kind under quintilus aurelian tacitus and probus but all these incursions were easily repelled by the imperial government which gained strength under aurelian and probus just at this time too there broke out a severe internal struggle between the teutons of the euxine and those of the danube the first aid called in by the goths against the tervingi was that of the basterni but the outcome of the struggle was that the basterni was were defeated and compelled to abandon the territory which they had held so tenaciously for more than five hundred years the expelled basterni said to have numbered a hundred thousand men were taken under his protection by the emperor probus and settled in thrace after that the tervingi supported by the taifali made war on the allied gepide and vandals while the east goths fought with their eastern neighbours the argandi who under their feet were taken under the protection of the alani we can see that the whole of the eastern germanic world was in a state of wild uproar on the middle danube there had been no fighting worth mention since the macromanic war we hear indeed of an incursion of the marcomanni in the reign of valerian but broadly speaking the name of this once a warlike nation may be said to disappear from history their old comrades the quadi often appear in association with the isiges from the time of gallienus which when they made a descent upon pannonia there was further fighting with them in 283, as is proved by a coin of Numerian. However, they are in this period thrown into the shade by the other more dangerous assailants of the empire. Indeed, with the appearance of the Goths, the main struggle between the Roman and Germanic powers had shifted from the middle to the lower Danube. Shortly after the death of Probus, October 282, the ailments on the upper rhine and the franks and saxons on the lower rhine had begun their forays again the eastern districts of gaul were again overrun while the coasts of the channel were harried by saxon pirates the burgundians had also had left their home between the oder and the vistula and forced their way through the heart of germany to the main when the government had been taken over by diocletian his colleague and after april two hundred and eighty six co-emperor maximian entered gaul in the beginning of that year it was his first care so soon as he had suppressed this insurrection of the bagaude to put a stop to the piracy of the saxons and franks he first cleared the left bank of the rhine drove the heruli and chivons two baltic tribes who had invaded gaul right out of the country and basing himself on mainz conducted a successful defensive campaign against ailments and burgundians the defence of the coasts was entrusted to a capable officer corosius the menapian with a strong command and extensive authority but when corosius set up for emperor in britain towards the end of two hundred and eighty six the teutons found a fresh opportunity the usurper even made common cause with the enemies of the empire and openly helped them maximian indeed repeatedly two hundred and eighty seven and two hundred and ninety one gained successes against them but the first decided improvement on the right frontier was due to a new development of imperial organization by which gaul and britain became a distinct administrative department with a governor of their own in the person of the general flavius constantius march two hundred and ninety three who was at the same time appointed caesar the Franks were decisively defeated within their own borders, summer 293. Britain was reconquered for the empire, spring 296. Carosius himself had fallen a victim to a conspiracy in 293, and finally by two great victories of the ailments on the Upper Rhine, peace was at length restored, 298 to 299, and the Rhine was made secure, especially as regards the upper part of its course, by the building of forts and the restoration of the defensive works which had been destroyed by the enemy had fallen into decay. 
Following the examples of Maximian, Constantius settled large numbers of prisoners of war, Franks, Frisians, and Shamavi, as Leyte and Colony, in the wasted and depopulated districts of northeast Gaul. Here, they were to cultivate the fields that had been lying fallow, to supply the labor that was sorely needed, and to aid in the defense of the frontier. The country rapidly recovered, trade and commerce began to flourish again, and the ancient prosperity returned. It was in this hopeful condition that the western provinces came into the hands of Constantine when, 25th July 306, he was called by the will of the army to take up the reins of government. During a reign of 31 years, he thoroughly fulfilled the promise of his youth. From the first day of his rule, he devoted all his efforts to the securing and well-being of the provinces. The Franks, who were again on the move, were energetically repressed. In the process, two of the chiefs were taken prisoners and given to the beasts similarly four years later a combined attack of the Bructeri, shamavi cherusi lancians ailments and Tubantes was repulsed with heavy loss these were the only occasions during constantine's long reign on which the germanic peoples of the rhine district made any expeditions on a large scale as regards the actual defence of the frontier the number of troops was increased the flotilla on the rhine was reorganised and raised to a considerable strength and the belt of fortresses along the frontier was improved in this connection took place the reoccupation and refortification of de Vitia, Deutsch, the old bridgehead of Cologne, which once more gave the Romans a firm foothold on the right bank of the Rhine on what had now become Frankish soil. The coast defense of Gaul and Britain likewise underwent further improvements. The establishment of a special military command in the later country, mentioned in the Notitia Draguni Tatum under the title Comes Litros Saxonici per Britannia most probably goes back to constantine when the emperor towards the end of three hundred and sixteen left gaul for the last time the land was in the enjoyment of complete peace and this happy state of affairs continued so long as the internal peace of the empire was preserved the enemy on the further side of the rhine was thoroughly overawed and ventured on nothing more than small violations of the frontier Nevertheless, the peace did not endure. When Magnentius, a Frank by race, set himself up as emperor, 350, the security of the Rhine was immediately in peril, since the eastern emperor Constantius himself incited the Teutons to attack the usurper and so to invade the empire. All that had been accomplished by Constantine was rapidly lost in the disastrous years of civil war between 351 and 353. The left bank of the Rhine was again overrun by the Teutons. The fortified positions, denuded of their garrisons, were almost all captured and destroyed, and the open country far into the interior of the province was plundered till there was nothing left to plunder although constantius after the suppression of the pestifera tyrannis himself made two campaigns against the ailments in the first spring three hundred and fifty four against the kings gondomad and vadomad in the second summer three hundred and fifty five against the lentiences he effected practically nothing it was only when the young caesar julian took up the command in gaul that the situation began to improve the whole year 356 was taken up in fighting against the ailments who were driven back on all sides. A great number of towns, including Cologne, which had been captured by the Franks, were won back again. A serious defeat incurred in 357 by the Magister Peditum Barbaccio was retrieved by the brilliant victory of the Caesar over the united forces of Knodomar, serapio vestralp and other kings in all thirty five thousand men under seven kings regis and then sub kings regales at argenturatum strasburg two further campaigns against the ailments in three hundred and fifty nine and three hundred and sixty one were equally successful on the lower rhine also julian defeated the franks the chassi and the chamavi 358 to 360 the tracts between the scheldt and the moss 
were cleared of the enemy seven towns among them the old fortresses of vingium antunacum bona novatium and vetera all on the rhine were retaken and again put in a state of defence thus the young caesar seemed in the way of bringing about a complete pacification of the rhine country when he was compelled to leave gaul by the outbreak of conflict with consentius three hundred and sixty one once again the country was left defenceless before the barbarians who did not fail to profit by the situation it was indeed high time when after the death of jovian february three hundred and sixty four the new emperor valentinian entered the threatened province in the late autumn of three hundred and sixty five and took up his headquarters at paris so much had the situation altered for the worse since the departure of julian that the ailments could venture in january three hundred and sixty six to cross the frozen rhine and penetrate to the neighbourhood of chalon sur marne here indeed they were defeated by the general jovinus who had hastened from paris to intercept them and were compelled to beat a retreat but the danger was not done with the guerrilla warfare continued on the frontier with its forays and surprises several years of vigorous actions were needed before any change was apparent following the old and well-tried maxim that the attack in the best defence is the best defence valentinian in three hundred and sixty eight himself crossed the rhine at the head of a considerable army reinforced by contingents of illyrian and italian troops advancing into the country of the ailments he came upon the enemy at solicinium souls on the upper neckar and defeated them in a bloody battle two smaller expeditions beyond the rhine followed in the year three hundred and seventy one and three hundred and seventy four the result of this successful assumption of the aggressive by the romans was broadly speaking the recovery of the rhine frontier which remained for the present exempt from serious attack end of section twenty four recording by hope for swan Section twenty five of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume One, Section twenty five, Part Four during this time of military activity the defences along the whole line of the rhine were strengthened the existing castles and watch-towers were improved and many new ones were built indeed a vigorous development of this old and well-tried system of frontier defence is the special merit of valentinian taken generally his reign marks a revival of the strength of the empire inward as well as outward and the results of his work upon the rhine could be felt for a generation after his death thus his son and successor gratian three seventy five to three eighty three found for the most part his ways made plain and a more peaceful situation obtaining on his arrival in gaul than that which had confronted his father ten years earlier nevertheless he too had to draw the sword against the alamans who mainly the tribe of the lentienses in the spring of three seventy eight crossed the rhine with a considerable force a battle took place near argentaria horberg near colmar in which the romans gained a complete victory destroying the greater part of the enemy thus here on the rhine frontier the year three seventy eight brought the romans once more a complete success the same year which in the east witnessed the breakdown of the roman military power and the disastrous fall of the emperor valens in contrast to the rhine countries the danubian provinces had since the death of the emperor probus enjoyed comparative peace the power of the most dangerous neighbour of the empire the goths had been crippled for a long time as we have seen by claudius and aurelian and more especially by the dissensions and struggles between the different tribes these goths in particular had since the close of the third century been fully occupied with their own affairs and completely disappeared for nearly a century in the fourth century it is always the western division the Terevingi, of whom we hear as is indeed natural seeing that their conquest of transdanubian moesia under gallienus had made them the immediate neighbours of the empire 
no events of any great importance on the danubian frontier are recorded down to the time of constantine true an inscription of diocletian and his colleagues of a date shortly before three o one celebrates a victory over hostile tribes on the lower danube which doubtless means the goths but these battles can hardly have been of any considerable importance on the other hand constantine frequently had trouble with the goths after some inroads in three fourteen the frontier defences were strengthened by the building of the fortress tropium triani adema lysi the removal of troops from the frontier during preparations of licinius for another civil war gave the signal at the beginning of three twenty three for a new incursion of the goths thanks to the rapid advance of constantine which brought him into his colleagues territory the invaders were intercepted before they had done any great damage and after severe losses including the death of their leader rasamad were forced back across the danube after the end of the civil war constantine strove with unwearying zeal to improve the defences of the frontier the line was protected by castles and although the number of the frontier troops to whom was especially assigned the duty of garrisoning them the militus limitani i or riparuensis was considerably reduced there was no diminution but on the contrary a distinct increase of military security gained by the creation at the same time of a mobile field force so strong did the roman empire feel itself at this period that towards the close of the reign of constantine it even ventured to interfere in events on the further side of the danube where the goths and Teofali were encroaching on the sarmatians who occupied the tract between the tice and the danube in response to an appeal of the sarmatians for help the emperor's eldest son constantine crossed the river at the head of an army and in conjunction with the sarmatians thoroughly routed the teutons twenty april three thirty two doubtless in consequence of this defeat which clearly brought home to them the military superiority of the empire the warlike ardour of the tervingi and teofali was extinguished for a long time their impulse to expand the driving force of all their undertakings was exhausted for the present the barbarians began to busy themselves with agriculture and cattle raising as regards their relation to the empire former conditions were reversed by the treaty of peace concluded after their defeat they nominally surrendered their independence and recognized the suzerainty of the roman government being pledged as fiderati in return for yearly subsidies anoni fiderati ki to share in the defence of the frontier and in case of war to serve as auxiliary troops the peace continued for more than thirty years from time to time there may have been slight disturbances of the peace of this indeed there is inscriptional evidence from the period of the joint rule of the three sons of constantine three thirty seven to three forty but on the whole both sides strictly observed their compact during this long period of peace the west goths underwent a revolution primarily religious but one which in its consequences affected the whole mental social and political life of the people the introduction of christianity as early as the second half of the third century christian teaching had obtained an entrance among them through cappadocian prisoners taken in the sea expeditions against asia minor there is no reason to doubt this fact and it is equally certain that a century later there were among the goths representatives of the most various schools of belief catholics arians and since about three fifty audeans accordingly the beginnings of christianity among the goths of the danube reached far back and its diffusion among them took place under the most various and independent influences of a conversion of the nation there can be no question at least as far down as the middle of the fourth century their conversion only begins with the appearance of ulfila born of christian parents about the year three ten to eleven in the country of the goths he grew up as a goth among the goths although greek blood flowed in his veins one or other of his parents came of a christian family from the neighbourhood of parnassus and cappadocia which had been carried into captivity 
by the goths in the time of gallienus two sixty four first employed as a reader he was at the age of about thirty that is to say about the year three forty one consecrated as bishop of the christian community in the land of the goths by eusebius of nicomedia the famous leader of the arian party at that time bishop of constantinople equally efficient as missionary and as organizer ulfila gathered and united the scattered confessors of the christian faith and by his enthusiastic preaching of the gospel he won for it many new adherents for seven years he worked with great success among his fellow countrymen and then he was suddenly obliged around three forty eight to interrupt his work a godless and impious prince probably anthonaric inflicted cruel persecution on the christians who dwelt within his dominion by which the newly organized church was scattered and its bishop compelled to leave his home ulfila gathered together his adherents or as many of them as had escaped the persecution and fled with them across the danube into roman territory where the emperor constantius gave him shelter here he lived and worked in the neighborhood of necopolis as the priestly and also as the political head of the goths who had accompanied him in his flight until three eighty or three eighty one in very truth the apostle of the goths and not least so in virtue of his great work of translating the bible by which he transmitted to his people the knowledge of the holy scriptures for all time and although his missionary activity in his native land had early been brought to a close yet the conversion of the whole gothic race to arian christianity was nothing else than the harvest of that seed which he had sown in those first years of his work among them soon after the death of constantius three sixty one the friendly relations between the west goths and the empire began to change scarcely had valentinian and valens ascended the throne when there was an open rupture first towards the end of three sixty four predatory bands of goths devastated thrace at the same time there was an incursion of the quadi and sarmatians into pannonia then in the spring of three sixty five the whole gothic nation prepared for a great expedition against the roman territory once more the danger was averted valens although he was on the march for syria and had already reached bithynia at once took vigorous measures to cope with it two years later however came the long-expected collision valens himself advanced to the attack he found a pretext in the ambiguous attitude of the goths in recent years especially in their having aided the usurper procopius with a contingent of three thousand men winter of three sixty five to six in the summer of three sixty seven the roman army crossed the danube yet no events of decisive importance took place either in this or the two following years for the war lasted till three sixty nine the gauls who had chosen as their leader anthanaric skilfully avoided a pitched battle and they withdrew into the fastnesses of the transylvanian highlands in the end both sides were weary of the war and negotiations were set on foot which resulted in a treaty of peace whereby the alliance with the tervingi was formally annulled and the danube was established as the boundary between the two powers immediately after the war which had restored the status quo of the beginning of the century and therewith the complete liberty of the goths the romans set to work on a thorough restoration of the frontier defences numerous burgi barrier forts were erected along the line of the danube as we learn in part from the evidence of inscriptions yet at first the frontier remained undisturbed internal dissensions and strife chiefly due to a general persecution of the christians stirred up by anthanaric about the year three seventy withdrew his attention from external affairs the gothic prince showed the utmost ferocity against all christians without distinction of high or low arian catholic or audean with the avowed intention of extirpating christianity as dangerous to the state and deleterious to the strength and vigor of the nation probably in connection with this there arose around three seventy a violent conflict between the two most influential chiefs anthanaric and fritigern which finally led to an open schism between two portions of the race fritigern was worsted retired with his whole following into roman territory and placed himself under the protection of the emperor who readily accorded him all possible succor and support this step had an important result for the cause of the persecuted christians inasmuch as fritigern with all his followers went over to christianity and adopted the arian creed 
this conversion of fritigern to christianity and moreover to arian christianity powerfully influenced the further development of events since on the one hand it prepared the way for the wider extension and final victory of christianity among the goths and on the other hand it became a serious danger to the political existence of the nation when arianism had been suppressed among the romans for it had acquired a virtually national significance for the goths the sojourn of fritigern in roman territory was not of long duration confident in the support of the roman government he returned with his followers to his own country and succeeded in maintaining his position against athanaric there seems indeed to have been a reconciliation between the rivals alongside of them though doubtless inferior to them in power and influence a whole series of important chiefs are mentioned by name in this period among them alvio munderic Arewulf, and fravitta at the same time however athanaric continued to exercise a certain primacy although his position was not in any sense constitutionally defined among the romans he always bears the title of eudex not rex these goths of whom we have so long lost sight had in the meantime extended their dominions far and wide a mighty empire extending from the don to the Dniester, from the black sea to the marshes of the pripet and the headwaters of the dnieper and the volga had emerged from their continual wars of conquest against their neighbours germanic such as the heroli slavonic and finnish the main portion of these conquests is doubtless to be ascribed to king m who had ruled over the grutungi since the middle of the century in contrast with the west goths who as we have seen down to the end of their residence on the danube were ruled according to ancient germanic custom by princippus or local chiefs the east goths had early developed a monarchy embracing the whole nation it is doubtless to the inner strength which belongs to a firm and undivided exercise of authority that we are to attribute the rapid rise of the young ostrogothic state under its kings from ostrogotha to ermanaric a monarch under whose vigorous rule it enjoyed its period of greatest prosperity and also met its fall such was the state of affairs when a nation of untamed savages horrible in aspect and terrible from their countless numbers and ferocious courage broke forth from the interior of asia and threatened the whole of the west with destruction these were the huns they were doubtless of mongolian race and were probably natives of the great expanse of steppes which lies to the north and east of the caspian sea soon after three seventy they penetrated into europe and threw themselves with irresistible fury upon the peoples which came in their way the alani who had to bear the first brunt of their attack were soon overpowered and compelled to join their conquerors and the same fate befell the smaller peoples whose settlements lay further north on the right bank of the volga the fate of the ostrogothic empire was now imminent for a considerable time they succeeded in holding the enemy at the sword's point but finally their strength broke down before the weight of the asiatic hordes ermanaric himself died by his own hand rather than live to see the downfall of his kingdom his successor vithamur after several bloody defeats met his death on the field of battle all resistance ceased and the whole people surrendered itself to the huns the invading flood rolled westward to encounter the tervingi three seventy five at the first tidings of the events in the neighbouring country athanaric called his people to arms and marched with a part of his forces to meet the huns the gothic leader took his stand on the bank of the Niester, but finding himself compelled to abandon this position by a crafty turning movement of the enemy athanaric gave up thenceforward all thought of resistance in the field and betook himself to the impenetrable ravines of the transylvanian highlands but only some of the goths followed him thither the mass of the people weary of hardship and privation separated themselves and resolved to abandon their country under the leadership of their local chiefs alvio and fritigern they mustered their forces in the spring of three seventy six on the north bank of the danube and besought permission to enter the roman empire in the hope of finding a dwelling-place in the rich plains of thrace the emperor valens graciously received their request and gave orders to the commanders on the frontier to take measures for the shelter and provisioning of this huge mass of people the gulfs passed the river in boats and rafts and hollowed tree trunks they made their way across and covered all the country round like the rain of ashes from an eruption of etna at first all went well the newcomers maintained an exemplary attitude 
not so the roman officials the chief of whom was the thracian comus lupicinus they used the precarious position of the barbarians to their own profit taking advantage of them in every possible way it was not long before their shameless injustice aroused the deep resentment of the teutons among whom famine had already set in things soon came to open rupture in the immediate neighbourhood of marcianople a bloody battle was fought between the infuriated teutons and the soldiers of lupicinus the romans were almost annihilated their leader took refuge behind the strong walls of the town which was immediately invested by the main body the tervingian forces other divisions scattered over the plains plundering as they went all attempts of the barbarians failed to take the town by storm so fritigern made his peace with stone walls a strong force remained before the place as an army of observation while the main body turned as detachments of it had done before to the plundering of the adjoining districts of moesia once more the country suffered fearfully and to complete its misery other bands of plunderers now joined the goths Diophali, alani and even huns were drawn across the danube by the hope of plundering and ravaging these fertile provinces this was in the summer of three seventy seven troops were hurried up from all sides for the defence of the threatened provinces even gratian sent aid from the west meanwhile the goths had overrun all moesia not only had the bloody battle fought at a place called Silesis, late summer three seventy seven been indecisive and cost the romans heavy losses but a strong detachment of roman troops under the tribune bar zamiris a teuton by race had been cut to pieces at debaltus a success which the dukes frigeridus likewise of teutonic birth gained over the tiophali and a company of the grutungi under their chief arnobius was not much to balance this and did not alter the fact that thrace which after the battle of Cilices had been overrun by the teutons remained a prey to them finally thirty may three seventy eight valens arrived at constantinople as soon as fritigern who lay in the neighbourhood of hadrianople heard of the emperor's arrival he gave the order for the widely scattered gothic forces to unite from this point onward events followed in quick succession at first the fortune of war seemed to smile upon the romans making hadrianople his base sebastianus the commander of reinforcements sent by gratian succeeded in inflicting a reverse upon the goths fritigern thereupon retired to the neighbourhood of cabile and there concentrated his forces thereupon valens on his part advanced to hadrianople resolved to venture upon a decisive stroke he had set his heart upon meeting his nephew gratian who was hastening up from the west with the news of a great victory and so nine august three seventy eight battle was joined near hadrianople it resulted in a terrible defeat of the romans in which the emperor himself was slain more than two-thirds of his army the flower of the military forces of the east was left upon the field of battle it was in truth a second canny the empire rocked to its foundations sheer panic fell upon all that bore the name of rome the power and glory of the empire seemed stamped into the dust by the barbarian hordes the struggle between rome and the teutons which we have followed through five centuries was drawing to a close the battle of hadrianople introduces the last act of the great drama the most pregnant with consequences which the history of the world has ever seen End of section twenty five Section 26 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. Section 26. Chapter 8, Part 1. Chapter 8 the dynasty of valentinian and theodosius the great part one the imperial throne was once more vacant sixteenth to the seventeenth of february three hundred and sixty four but the army had learned the danger of a tumultuous election and after the troops had advanced by an eight days march to nicaea both the civil and military authorities weighed with anxious deliberation the rival claims of possible candidates aquitius tribune of the first regiment of the scutari men knew to be harsh and uncultured 
Januarius, a relative of Jovian, in supreme command in Illyricum, was too far distant, and at length one and all agreed to offer the diadem to Valentinian. The new emperor had not marched from Ancyra with the army, but had received orders to follow in due course with his regiment, the second scholar of Scutari. Thus, while messengers hastened his journey, the Roman world was for ten days without a master. Valentinian was a native of Pannonia. His father, Gratian, a peasant rope-seller of Sibylle, had early distinguished himself by his strength and bravery. Risen from the ranks, he had become successively protector, tribune, and general of the Roman forces in Africa. Accused of peculation, he remained for a time under a cloud, only to be given later the command of the legions of Britain. After his retirement, hospitality shown to Magnentius led to the confiscation of Gratian's property by Constantius. But the services of the father made advancement easy for Valentinian. In Gaul, however, when acting under Julian's orders, he was dismissed from the army by Barbatio, but on Julian's ascension he re-enlisted. Valentinian's military capacity outweighed, even in the eyes of an apostate emperor, his pronounced Christianity, and an important command was given him in the Persian War. Later he had been sent on a mission to the West, bearing the news of Jovian's election, and from this journey he had but recently returned. The life story of Gratian and Valentinian is one of the most striking examples of the splendid career which lay open to talent in the Roman army. The father, a peasant unknown and without influence, by his ability rises to supreme command over Britain, while his son becomes emperor of Rome. It is hardly surprising that barbarians were ready to enter a service which offered to the capable soldier such prospects of promotion. It may also be noticed in passing that in the Council of Nicaea, only military officers were considered as successors of Jovian. We do not hear of any civil administrator as a possible candidate for the vacant throne. From the very day of his ascension, the character of Valentinian was declared. When the crowd bade him name at once to co Augustus, he replied that but an hour before they had possessed the right to command, but that right now belonged to the emperor of their own creation. From the first, the stern glance and majestic bearing of Valentinian bowed men to his will. Through Nicomedia, he advanced to Constantinople, and here in the suburb of the Hebdomon, on the 28th of March, 364, he created his brother, Valens, co-emperor. He looked for loyal subjection and personal dependence, and he was not disappointed. With the rank of Augustus, Valens was content, in effect, to play the part of a Caesar. At Nisus, the military forces of the empire were divided, and many Pannonians were raised to high office. The new rulers were, however, careful to retain in their posts men who had been chosen both by Julian and Jovian. They wished to injure no susceptibilities by open partianship but even though Valentinian remained true to his constant principle of religious toleration and refused to favour the nominees either of a Christian or a pagan emperor, yet men traced a secret distrust and covert jealousy of those who had been Julian's intimates. Sallust, the all-powerful prefect, was removed and accusations were brought against the philosopher Maximus. When both emperors were attacked with fever, a commission of high imperial officials was appointed to examine whether the disease might not be due to secret arts. No shred of evidence of any unholy design was discovered, but the common rumour ran that the only object of the inquiry was to bring into disrepute the memory and the friends of Julian. Those who had been loyal to the old dynasty began to seek a leader. At Sirmium, the brothers parted, Valentinian for Milan, Valens for Constantinople. They each entered on their first consulship 
in the following year, 365. And as soon as the winter was past, Valens travelled with all speed for Syria. It would seem that already the terms of the Thirty Years' Peace were giving rise to fresh difficulties. Too many questions remained open between Rome and Persia. But as yet it was not foreign invasion, but domestic rebellion which was to endanger the life and throne of Valens. When Procopius had laid the corpse of Julian to rest in Tarsus, he himself discreetly vanished from the sight of kings and courtiers. It was a perilous distinction to have enjoyed the peculiar favour of the dead emperor. Before long, however, he grew weary of his fugitive existence. Life as a hunted exile in the Crimea was too dearly bought. In desperation he sailed secretly for the capital, where he found shelter in the friendly house of a senator, Strategius, while a eunuch, Eugenius by name, recently dismissed from the imperial service, put unlimited funds at his disposal. As he wandered unrecognised through the streets, on every hand he heard men muttering of the cruelty and avarice of Petronius, the father-in-law of Valens. The emperor himself was no longer in Constantinople, and popular discontent seemed only to need its champion. The regiments of the Divitenses and the Tungritani Juniors, on their march from Bithynia for the defence of Thrace, were at the moment in the city. For two days Procopius negotiated with their officers. His gold and promises won their allegiance, and in their quarters, at the Anastasian Baths, the soldiers met under cover of night and swore to support the usurpation, leaving the ink pot and stool of the notary. So ran the scornful phrase of the court rhetorician, this stage figure of an emperor, hesitating to the last, assumed the purple and with stammering tongue harangued his followers. Any sensation was grateful to the populace, and they were content to accept without enthusiasm their new ruler. Those who had nothing to lose were ready enough to share the spoils, but the upper classes generally held aloof or fled to the court of Valens. None of them met Procopius as he entered the deserted Senate house. He relied for support upon men's devotion to the family of Constantine, as reinforcements bound for Thrace reached the capital. He came before them with Faustina, the widow of Constantius, by his side, while he himself bore her little daughter in his arms. He pleaded his own kinship to Julian, and the troops were won. Gamorius and Agillo, who had served Constantius well, were recalled from retirement and put at the head of the army, while to Julian's friend, Phronemius, was given the charge of the capital. Valentinian had advanced Pannonians, Procopius chose Gauls, for the Gallic provinces had most reason to remember Julian's services to the empire. Nebridius recently created Praetorian Prefect through the influence of Petronius, who held a prisoner and forced to write dispatches recalling Julius, who was in command in Thrace. The stratagem succeeded, and the province was won without a blow. The embassy to Illyricum, however, bearing the newly minted coinage of Procopius, was defeated by the vigilance of Aquitius. Every approach, whether through Dacia, Macedonia, or the pass of Succai, being effectually barred. The news of the revolt reached Valens as he was leaving Bithynia for Antioch, and he was only recalled from abject despair by the counsels of his friends. Procopius, with the Divitenses and a hastily collected force, had advanced to Nicaea. But before the approach of the Jovi and Victors, he retreated to Migdus on the Sangarius. Once more the soldiers yielded when he appealed to their loyalty to the house of Constantine. The troops of Valens deserting, the degenerate Pannonian, the drinker of miserable barley beer, went over to the usurper. One success followed another. Nicomedia was surprised by the tribune 
Rumitalka, who forthwith marched to the north. Valens, who was besieging Charleston, was taken unawares and forced to fly for his life to Ansira. Thus, Bithynia was won for Procopius. His fleet under Marcellus attacked Cyzicus, and when once the chain across the harbour's mouth was broken, the garrison surrendered. With the fall of Cyzicus, Valens had lost the mastery of the Hellespont, while he could expect no help from his brother, since Valentinian had determined that the safety of the whole Roman Empire demanded his presence on the western frontier. Thus, during the early months of 366, while Procopius endeavoured to raise funds for the future conduct of the war, Valens could only await the arrival of Lupicinus. The emperor's final victory was indeed mainly due to an ill-considered act of his rival. Arbicio, the retired general of Constantius, had supported the usurper, but had declined an invitation to his court, pleading the infirmities of old age and ill health. Procopius replied by an order that the general's house should be pillaged, thereby turning a friend into a bitter foe. Arbicio, on the appeal of Valens, joined the camp of Lupicinus. His arrival at once inspired the emperor with fresh hope and courage, and gave the signal for wholesale defections from the usurper's forces. In an engagement at Thyatira, Gamorius procured his own capture and carried with him many of his men. After the march of Valens into Phrygia, Agillo in his turn deserted when the armies met at Nacalia. The soldiers refused to continue the struggle. 26 of May, 366. Procopius was betrayed to the emperor by two of his own officers and was immediately put to death. Imperial suspicion and persecution had once again goaded a loyal subject to treason and to ruin. His severed head was borne beneath the walls of Philippopolis and the city surrendered to Aquitius. The ghastly trophy was even carried to Valentinian through the provinces of Gaul, lest loyalty to the memory of Julian should awake treason in the west. Valens could now avenge his terror and sash his avarice. The suppression of the rebellion was followed by a train of executions, burnings, proscriptions and banishments, which caused men to curse the victory of the lawful emperor. The plea of kinship with the family of Constantine had induced some thousands of the Gothic tribesmen on the Danube to cross the Roman frontier in support of Procopius. Valens refused to recognise their defence, and depriving them of their weapons, settled them in the cities along the north boundaries of the empire. When discontent declared itself, in fear of a general attack, he acted on his brother's advice, and marched in person to the Danube, and for the three succeeding years, 367 to 369, the Gothic campaign absorbed his attention. With Marseille as his base of operations, he crossed the river in 367 and 369. In the latter years he conquered Athanarish, and during the autumn concluded an advantageous peace. The emperor and the Gothic judex met on a ship in midstream for Athanarish professed himself bound by a fearful oath never to set foot upon Roman soil. During these years, Valens, pursuing in the east his brother's policy, strengthened the whole of the Danube frontier line with forts and garrisons. Valentinian may indeed be styled the frontier emperor. His title to fame is his restoration of the defences of Rome in the west against the surging barbarian hordes. He was a hard-worked soldier prince, and the one purpose which inspires his reign is his fixed determination never to yield an inch of Roman territory. He had always before his eyes the terrible warning of his predecessor. In the year 364, when the emperor was still at Milan, ambassadors from the Alemanni came to greet him on his ascension, and to receive the tribute which Roman pride disguised under the fairer name of gifts. 
Valentinian would not squander state funds in bounty to barbarians. The presents were small, while Ursatius, the magister officiorum, who took his cue from his master, treated the messengers with scant courtesy. They returned indignant to their homes, and in the early days of the new year, A.D. 365, the Alamanni burst plundering and ravaging across the frontier. Charietto, the count commanding in both Germanys, and the aged general Servianus, stationed at Cabellona, Chalons-sur-Seon, both fell before the barbarian onset. Gaul demanded Valentinian's presence. The emperor started for Paris in the month of October, and while on the march, news reached him of the revolt of Procopius. The report gave no details. He did not know whether Valens were alive or dead. But with that strong sense of imperial duty, which dignifies the characters of the 4th century emperors, he subordinated utterly the personal interest to the common weal. Procopius is but my brother's enemy and my own, he repeated to himself, and the Alamanni are the foes of the Roman world. Arrived at Paris, it was from that city that he dispatched Dagalyphus against the Alamanni. Autumn was fast giving place to winter. The tribesmen had scattered, and the new general was dilatory and inactive. He was recalled to become consul with the emperor's son Gratian, January 366, and Jovinus, as magister equitum, took his place at the head of the Roman troops. Three successive victories virtually concluded the campaign. At Scarpona, Sharpain, one band of barbarians was surprised and defeated, while another was massacred on the Moselle. In negligent security, the Alamanni on the riverbank were drinking, washing, and dyeing their hair red, when from the fringe of the forest, the Roman legionaries poured down upon them. Jovinus then undertook a further march, and pitched his camp at chalon sur -Marne. Here there was a desperate engagement with a third force of the enemy. The withdrawal during the Battle of the Tribune, Bolshebordes, seriously endangered the army's safety. But at length the day was won. The Alamanni lost 6,000 killed and 4,000 wounded. Of the Romans, 200 were wounded and 1,200 killed. In the pursuit, Ascari in the Roman service captured the barbarian king and in the heat of the moment he was struck dead. After a few lesser encounters, resistance was for the time at an end. It was probably his interest in this campaign, which had led Valentinian to spend the early months of 366 at Reims. He now returned to Paris, and from the latter city advanced, end of June 366, to meet his successful general whom he nominated for consulship in the succeeding year. At the same time, the head of Procopius reached him from the east, but in the high tide of success, he was struck down with a serious illness, winter 366-7. to seven. The court was already considering possible candidates for the purple when Valentinian recovered, but realising the dangers for the west, which might arise from a disputed succession. At Amiens on the 24th of August, 367, he procured from the troops the recognition of the seven-year-old Gratian and co-Augustus. It may well have been the necessity for defending the northern coast against raids of Franks and Saxons, which had summoned Valentinian to Amiens, and now on his way from that town to Trier, Tidings reached him of a serious revolt in Britain. Full of foul days, the Roman general, together with Nectaridas, the commander of the coastline, Count of the Saxon shore, had both met their deaths. In the autumn of 367, Severus, Count of the Imperial Guards, was dispatched to the island only to be recalled. Jovinus, appointed in his place, sent Provertides in advance to raise levies while in view of the constant reports of fresh disasters, the Count Theodosius, the father of Theodosius the Great, 
was ordered to sail for Britain at the head of Gaelic reinforcements. From Boulogne he landed at Rutapai, Richborough, spring 368, and was followed by the Batava, Heraline, Jovi and Victors. Scenes of hopeless confusion met him on his arrival. Dicalidonus and Virturionus, the two divisions of the Picts, Atacotai and Scotti, Irish, all ranged pillaging over the countryside, while Frank and Saxon marauders swept down in forays on the coast. Theodosius marched towards London, and it would seem made this city his headquarters. Defeating the scattered troops of spoil-laden barbarians, he restored the greater part of the booty to the harassed provincials, while deserters were recalled to the standard by promises of pardon. From London, where he spent the winter, Theodosius prayed the emperor to appoint men of wide experience to govern the island, Civilis as pro-prefect, and Dulcitius as general. In this year, too, he probably cooperated with imperial troops on the continent in the suppression of Frank and Saxon pirates in the Low Countries and about the mouths of the Rhine and Wall. Valentinian himself advanced as far north as Cologne in the autumn of 368. In the year 369, Theodosius everywhere surprised the barbarians and swept the country clear of their robber bands. Town fortifications were restored, forts rebuilt and frontiers regarrisoned, while the Ariani, a treacherous border militia, were removed. Territory in the north was recovered, and a new fifth province of Valencia, or Valentinia, created. The revolt of Valentinus, who had been exiled to Britain on a criminal charge, was easily crushed by Theodosius, who repressed with a strong hand the treason trials which usually followed the defeat of an unsuccessful usurper. When he sailed for Gaul, probably in the spring of 370, he left the provincials leaping for very joy. On his return to the court, he was appointed to succeed Jovinus as Magister Equitum before end of May 370. While his lieutenant had been restoring order in Britain, Valentinian had been actively engaged in Gaul. The winter of 367 to 8, the emperor spent at Reims, preparing for his vengeance upon the disturbers of the peace in the west. But the new year opened with a disaster, for while the Christian inhabitants of Mainz were keeping festival, Epiphany, 368, the Aylman prince Rando surprised and sacked the town. The Romans, however, gained a treacherous advantage by the murder of King Withacab, and in the summer of the same year, the emperor, together with his son, invaded the territory between Neckar and Rhine. Our authorities give us no certain information as to his route. Perhaps he advanced by the Rhine road, and then turned off by Ettlingen and Forzheim. Solicinium, near Rottenburg, on the left bank of the Neckar, was the scene of the decisive struggle. The barbarians occupied a strong position, on a precipitous hill. The Romans experienced great difficulty in dislodging them, but were at length successful, and the enemy fled over the Neckar by low Padunum towards the Danube. The advantage thus gained was secured by the building of a strong fort, apparently at Altrip, and for its erection it seems possible that the ruins of low Padunum were employed. The emperor spent the winter in Trier, and with the new year, 369, based his great work of frontier defence extending from the province of Raetia to the ocean. Valentinian even sought to plant his fortresses in the enemy's territory. This was regarded by the Alamanni as a breach of treaty rights, and the Romans suffered a serious reverse at the Mons Piri, Heidelberg. The emperor accordingly entered into negotiations with the Burgundians, who were to attack the Alamanni with the support of the Roman troops, 
the Burgundians, long at feud with their neighbours, over the possession of some salt springs on their borders, gladly accepted the emperor's overtures, and appeared in immense force on the Rhine. The confederates seemed more terrible than the foe. Valentinian was absent, superintending the building of his new forts, and feared either to accept or refuse the assistance of such dangerous allies. He sought to gain time by inaction, and the Burgundians, infuriated at his betrayal, were forced to withdraw, since the Alemanni threatened to oppose their homeward march. Meanwhile, Theodosius, newly arrived in Gaul from Britain, swept upon the distracted Alemanni from Raetia, and after a successful campaign, was able to settle his captives as farmers in the valley of the Po. Macrian, king of the Alamanni, had been the heart and soul of his people's resistance to Rome, with the intention, therefore, of capturing this dangerous enemy by a sudden surprise. In September 371, Valentinian, accompanied by Theodosius, left Mainz for Aqua Matiacae, but with the troops the opportunities for pillage outweighed the emperor's strictest orders. The smoke of burning homesteads betrayed the Roman approach. The army advanced some fifty miles, but the purpose of the expedition was defeated, and the emperor returned disappointed to Trier. Meanwhile in the east, time only served to show the futility of Jovian's peace with Persia. Rome had sacrificed much, but had settled nothing. Sapor claimed that under the treaty he could do as he would with Armenia, which still remained the apple of discord as before, and that Rome had relinquished any right to interfere. But it was precisely this claim that Rome could never in the last resort allow. Armenia under Persian rule was far too great a menace. The chronology of the events which followed the treaty must remain to some extent a matter of conjecture. But from the first, Sapor seems to have enforced his conception of his rights, seeking in turn by bribes and forays to reduce Armenia to Persian vassalage. Valens, as early as 365, was on his way to the Persian frontier when he was recalled by the revolt of Procopius. At the close of the year 368, or at the beginning of 369, Sir Paul got possession of King Arsaces, whom he put to death some years later. In 369, it would appear, Persia interfered in the affairs of Hiberia. Suramaces, ruling under Roman protection, was expelled, and Aspacures, a Persian nominee, was made king. In Armenia, the fortress of Artagirk, Artagaressa, where the Queen for ransom had taken refuge, was besieged, 369, while her son Pap, acting on his mother's counsel, fled to the protection of Valens. In his flight, he was assisted by Silices and Artabans, Armenian renegades, who now proved disloyal to their Persian master. The exile was well received and accorded at home at Neo-Caesarea, when Musjay, the Armenian general, prayed that the emperor would take effective action and stay the ravages of Persia. Valens hesitated. He felt that his hands were tied by the terms of the peace of Jovian. Terentius, the Roman dux, accompanied Pap on his return to Armenia but without the support of the legions, the prince was powerless. Artajerk fell in the 14th month of the siege, winter 370. For Anson was hurried away to her death, and Pap was forced to flee into the mountains, which lay between Lazica and the Roman frontier. Here he remained in hiding for five months. Persian pillage and massacre proceeded unchecked until Sapor could leave his generals in command of the army, while two Armenian nobles were enthrusted with the civil government of the country and with the introduction of the Magian religion. At length Valens took action, and the Count Arinthius, acting in concert with Terentius and Adeus, 
was sent to Armenia to place Pap upon the throne and to prevent the commission of further outrage by Persia. In May 371, the emperor himself left Constantinople, slowly journeying towards Syria. Sapor's next move was an attempt to win Pap by promises of alliance, counselling him to be no longer the puppet of his ministers. The ruse was successful, and the king put to death both Silices and Artabanes. Meanwhile, a Persian embassy complained that the protection of Armenia by Rome was a breach of her obligations under the treaty. In April 372, Valens reached Antioch. His answer to Persia was further interference in Iberia. While Musche invaded Persian territory, Terentius, with twelve legions, restored Saramaces as ruler over the country, bordering on Lazica and Armenia. Support on his side making great preparations for a campaign in the following spring, raising levies from the surrounding tribes and hiring mercenaries. In 373, Trajan and Vadimar marched to the east with a formidable army, having strict orders not to break the peace, but to act on the defensive. The emperor himself moved to Herapolis in order to superintend the operations from that city. At Vagabanta, Bagavan, the Romans were forced to engage and in the result were victorious. A truce was concluded at the end of the summer, and while Sapor retired to Tessiphon, Valens took up his residence in Antioch. End of section 26section 27 of cambridge medieval history volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by michelle eaton cambridge medieval history volume 1 section 27 chapter 8 part 2 by norman h baines here in the following year, 374, so far as we can judge from the vague chronology of our authorities, a widespread conspiracy was discovered, in which Maximus, Julian's master, Eutropius, the historian, and many other leading philosophers and heathens were implicated. Anxious to discover who was to succeed Valens, some daring spirits had suspended a ring over a consecrated table upon which was placed a round metal dish. About the rim of the dish was engraved the alphabet. The ring had spelt out the letters, Theo, when with one voice all present exclaimed that Theodorus was clearly destined for empire. Born in Gaul of an old and honourable family, he had enjoyed a liberal education and already held the second place among the imperial notaries distinguished for his humanity and moderation in every post alike his merits outshone his office absent from antioch at the time he was at once recalled and the enthusiasm of his friends seemed to have shaken his loyalty the life of valens had previously been threatened by would-be assassins and when the conspirator's secret was betrayed the emperor's vengeance knew no bounds he swept the whole of the Roman East for victims, and as at the fall of Procopius, so now his avarice ruled unchecked. If the accused's life was spared, proscription in bitter mockery posed as clemency, and the banishment of the innocent as an act of royal grace. For years the trials continued. We all crept about as though in Cimmerian darkness, writes an eyewitness. The story of Damocles hung suspended over our heads. Of Western affairs during those years, when the long-drawn game of plot and counterplot was being played between Valens and Sapor, we know but little. Valentinian remained in Gaul, autumn 371 to spring 373, doubtless busied with his schemes for the maintenance of security upon the frontiers. 
but detailed information we have none where valentinian governed in person we hear of no rebellions the constitutions even show that a limited relief was granted from taxation and that measures were taken to check oppression but elsewhere on every hand the emperor's good intentions were betrayed by his agents in britain a disorganized army and a harassed population could offer no effective resistance to the invader gross misgovernment in the pannonian provinces made it doubtful whether the excesses of imperial offices or the forays of the barbarian enemy were more to be dreaded while the story of the woes of africa only serves to show how terrible was the cost which the empire paid for its unscrupulous bureaucracy under jovian three hundred and sixty three to four the Ostoriana had suddenly invaded the province of Tripolis, intending to avenge the death of one of their tribesmen, who had been burned alive for plotting against the Roman power. They laid waste to the rich countryside around Leptis, and when the city appealed for help to the commander-in-chief, Count Romanus, he refused to take any action unless supplied with a vast store of provisions and 4,000 camels. The demand could not be met, and after forty days the general departed, while the despairing provincials at the regular annual assembly of their city council elected an embassy to carry statues of victory to Valentinian and to greet him upon his accession. At Milan, 364 to 5, the ambassadors gave, as it would seem, a full report of the sufferings of Leptis, but Remigius the magister officiorum a relative and confederate of romanus was forewarned and contradicted their assertions while he was successful in securing the appointment of romanus upon the commission of inquiry which was ordered by the emperor the military command was given for a time to the governor Rauritius, but was shortly after once more put into the hands of romanus it was not long before news of a fresh invasion of Tripolis by the barbarians reached Valentinian in Gaul. A.D. 365. The African army had not yet received the customary donative upon the emperor's accession. Palladius was accordingly entrusted with gold to distribute amongst the troops and was instructed to hold a complete and searching inquiry into the affairs of the province. Meanwhile, for the third time, the desert clansmen had spread rapine and outrage through Roman territory, and for eight days had laid formal siege to the city of Leptis itself. A second embassy consisting of Jovinus and Pancratius was sent to the emperor, who was found at Trier, winter 367. On the arrival of Palladius in Africa, Romanus induced the officers to relinquish their share of the donative and to restore it to the imperial commissioner as a mark of their personal respect. The inquiry then proceeded. Much evidence was taken and the complaints against Romanus proved up to the hilt. The report for the emperor was already prepared when the count threatened, if it were not withdrawn, to disclose the personal profit of Palladius in the matter of the donative. The commissioner yielded and went over to the side of Romanus. On his return to the court, he found nothing to criticise in the administration of the province. Pancratius had died at Trier, but Jovinus was sent back to Africa with Palladius, the latter being directed to hold a further examination as to the truth of the allegations made by the second embassy. Men who, on the showing of the emperor's representative, had given false witness on the inquiry, were to have their tongues cut from their mouths. By threats, trickery and bribes, Romanus once more achieved his end. The citizens of Leptis denied that they had ever given any authority to Jovinus to act on their behalf, while he, endeavouring to save his life, was forced to confess himself a liar. It was to no purpose. Together with Ruritius, the governor and others, he was put to death by order of the emperor, 369. 
Not even this sacrifice of innocent lives gave peace to Africa. Firmus, a Moorish prince, on the death of his father Nebule, had slain his brother. That brother, however, had enjoyed the favour of Romanus, and the machinations of the Roman general drove Firmus into rebellion. He assumed the purple, while persecuted Donatus and exasperated soldiers and provincials gladly rallied round him. Theodosius, fresh from his successes in Britain and Gaul, was dispatched to Africa by Valentinian as commander-in-chief, charged with the task of reasserting imperial authority. On examining his predecessor's papers, a chance reference caused the discovery of the plots of the last eight years, but it was not till the reign of Gratian that the subsequent inquiries were concluded. Palladius and Remigius both committed suicide, but the arch-offender Romanus was protected by the influence of Merobordes. The whole story needs no comment. Before men's eyes, the powerlessness of the emperor and the might of organised corruption stood luridly revealed. For at least two years, Theodosius fought and struggled against odds in Africa. At length, discipline was restored amongst the troops. The Moors were defeated with great loss and the usurper driven to take his own life. The Roman commander entered Sitifis in triumph, 374. Hardly, however, was his master Valentinian removed by death when Theodosius fell a victim to the intrigues of his enemies at Carthage, AD 375-6. to Baptised at the last hour and thus cleansed of all sin, he walked calmly to the block. We do not know the ostensible charge upon which he was beheaded, nor do our authorities name his accuser. But the evidence points to Merobordes, the all-powerful minister of Gratian. Theodosius had suspended Romanus and disclosed his schemes, and Romanus was the friend and protégé of Merobordes. While it is clear that Gratian held in his own hands the entire West, including Africa, for as yet, 376, the youthful Valentinian II was not permitted to exercise any independent authority. Possibly Merobordes may have been assisted in the attainment of his ends by timely representations from the East, for the general's name began with the same letters which had only recently. 374, proved fatal to Theodorus. In 373, Valentinian had left Gaul for Milan, but returned in the following year, May 374, and after a raid upon the Alamanni, while at the fortress of Robert near Basel, he learned in late autumn that the Quadi and the Sarmatai had burst across the frontier. The emperor, with his passion for fortress building, had given orders for a garrison station to be erected on the left bank of the Danube, within the territory of the Quadi, while at the same time the youthful Marcellianus, through the influence of his father Maximin, repeat, through the influence of his father Maximinus, the ill-famed prefect of Illyricum, had succeeded the able general Aquitius as Magister Armorum. Gabinius, king of the Quadi, came to the Roman camp to pray that this violation of his rights might cease. The newly appointed general treacherously murders his guest, and at the news the barbarians flew to arms, poured across the Danube upon the unsuspecting farmers, and all but captured the daughter of Constantius, who was on her journey to meet Gratian, her future husband. Sarmatai and Quadi devastated Mosia and Pannonia. The Praetorian prefect Probus was stupefied into inactivity and the Roman legionaries that feud between themselves were rooted in confusion. The only successful resistance was offered by the younger Theodosius, the future emperor, who compelled one of the invading Sarmatian hosts to sue for peace. Valentinian desired to march eastward forthwith, but was dissuaded by those who urged the hardships of a winter campaign 
and the danger of leaving Gaul while the leader of the Alemanni was still unsubdued. Both Romans and barbarians were, however, alike weary of the ceaseless struggle, and during the winter, Valentinian and Macrian concluded an enduring peace. In the late spring of 375, the emperor left Gaul. From June to August, he was at Carnuntum, endeavouring to restore order within the devastated province, and thence marched to Ansincum, crossed the Danube, and wasted the territory of the invading tribesmen. Autumn surprised him while still in the field. He retired to Siberia and took up his winter quarters at Bregesio. The Quadi, conscious of the hopelessness of further resistance, sent an embassy excusing their action and pleading that the Romans were in truth the aggressors. The emperor, passionately enraged at this freedom of speech, was seized in the paroxysm of his anger with an apoplectic fit and carried dying from the audience hall, 17th of November, 375. Highly complexioned with a strong and muscular body, cast in a noble and majestic mould, his steel-blue eyes scanning men and things with a gaze of sinister intensity, the emperor stands before us as an imposing and stately figure. Yet his stern and forbidding nature awakes but little sympathy, and it is easy to do less than justice to the character and work of Valentinian. With a strong hand, Diocletian had endeavoured by his administrative system and by the enforcement of hereditary duties to weld together the Roman Empire, which had been shattered by the successive catastrophes of the third century. To Valentinian it seemed as though the same iron constraint could alone check the process of dissolution. If it were possible, he would make life for the provincials worth the living, for then resistance to the invader would be the more resolute. He would protect them with forts and garrisons upon their frontiers, would lighten, if he dare, the weight of taxation, would accord them liberty of conscience and freedom for their varied faiths and would, to the best of his power, appoint honest and capable men as his representatives. But a spirit of dissatisfaction and discontent amongst his subjects was not merely disloyalty, it was a menace to the empire, for it tended to weaken the solidarity of governors and governed. To remove an official for abusing his trust was, in Valentinian's eyes, to prejudice men's respect for the state and thus the strain of brutality in his nature declared itself in his refusal to check stern measures or pitiless administration. To save the Roman world from disintegration, it must be cowed into unity. Without mercy to others, he never spared himself. As a restless and untiring leader, with no mean gifts of generalship and strategy, it was but natural that he should give preferment to his officers till contemporaries bitterly complained that never before had civilians been thus neglected or the army so highly privileged. It could indeed hardly be otherwise, for with every frontier threatened, it was the military captain who was indispensable. The emperor's efforts to suppress abuses were untiring. Simplicity characterised his court and strict economy was practised. His laws in the Theodosian Code or a standing witness to his passion for reform. He regulated the corn supply and the transport of the grain by sea. He made less burdensome the collection of the taxes levied in kind on the provincials. He exerted himself to protect the curials and the members of municipal senates. He settled barbarians as colonists on lands which were passing out of cultivation. He endeavoured to put a stop to the debasement of the coinage, while in the administration of justice he attempted to check the misuse of wealth and favour by insisting upon publicity of trial and by granting greater facilities for appeals. As a contemporary observes, Valentinian's one sore need was honest agents and upright administrators, and these he could not secure. 
men only sought for power in order to abuse it. Had the emperor been served by more men of the stamp of Theodosius, the respect to posterity might have given place to admiration. Even as it was in later days, when men praised Theodoric, they compared him with two great emperors of the past, with Trajan and Valentinian. At the time of the emperor's death, Gratian was far distant at Trier, and there was a general fear that the fickle Gallic troops now encamped on the left bank of the Danube might claim to raise to the throne some candidate whom they themselves had chosen. Perhaps Sebastianus, a man by nature inactive, but high in the favour of the army. Marabordes, the general in command, was therefore recalled as though by order of Valentinian, on a pretext of fresh disturbances upon the Rhine, and after prolonged consultation, it was decided to summon the late emperor's four-year-old son, Valentinian. The boy's uncle covered post-haste, the hundred Roman miles, which lay between Brigicio and the country house of Murasincta, where the young prince was living with his mother Justina. Valentinian was carried back to the camp in a litter, and six days after his father's death, was solemnly proclaimed Augustus. Gratian's kindly nature soon dispelled any fear that he would refuse to recognise this horrid election. The elder brother always showed towards the younger a father's care and affection. No partition of the West, however, took place at this time, and there could as yet be no question of the exercise of independent power by Valentinian II. Gratian ruled over all those provinces which had been subject to Valentinian I, and his infant colleague's name is not even mentioned in the constitutions before the year 379. Of the government of Gratian, however, we know but little. Its importance lies mainly in the fact that he was determined to be first and foremost an orthodox Christian emperor, and even refused to wear the robe or assume the title of Pontifex Maximus, probably 375. Meanwhile in the East, the fidelity of Pap grew suspect in the eyes of Rome. The unfavourable dispatches of Terentius, the murder of Catholicos Nursis, and the consecration of his successor by the king, without the customary appeal to Caesarea, Mazacar, led Valens to invite Pap to Tarsus, where he remained virtually a prisoner. Escaping to his own country, he fell a victim to Roman treachery, 375. Still, Rome and Persia negotiated, and at length, 376, Valens dispatched Victor and Arbiceus with an ultimatum. The emperor demanded that the fortresses which of right belonged to Saramaces should be evacuated by the beginning of 377. The claims of Rome were ignored, and Valens was planning at Hierapolis, July to August 377, a great campaign against Persia, when the news from Europe made it imperative to withdraw the Roman army of occupation from Armenia. For several years the European crisis engaged all the emperor's energies, and he was unable to interfere effectually in Eastern affairs. The Huns had burst into Europe, had conquered the Alans, subjected the East Goths, Ostrogoths, and driven the West Goths, Visigoths, to crave admission within the territory of Rome. Athanaric and Fritigern had become leaders of two distinct parties among the West Goths. Athanaric driven before the Huns, had lost much of his wealth, and as he was unable to support his followers, the greater number deserted their aged leader and joined Fritigern. It seems possible too that religious differences may have played their part in these dissensions. Athanaric may have stood at the head of those who were loyal to the old religion. Fritigern may have been willing to secure any advantage which the profession of the Christian faith might win from a devout emperor. Whether this be so or not, it was the tribesmen of Fritigern who appealed to Valens. 
It was no usual request. The settling of barbarians as colonists on Roman soil was of frequent occurrence, while the provision of barbarian recruits for the Roman army was a constant clause in the treaties of the 4th century. Valens and his ministers congratulated themselves that, without their seeking, so admirable an opportunity had presented itself of infusing new life and vigour into the northern provinces of the empire. The conditions for the reception of the Goths were that they should give up their arms and surrender many of their sons as hostages. The church historians add the stipulation that the Goths should adopt the Christian faith, but this would seem to have been only a pious hope and not a condition for the passage of the Danube. Although it was only natural that the Goths should affect to have assumed the religion of their new fellow countrymen, the conditions were stern enough, but the fate which threatened the barbarians at the hands of the Huns seemed even more unrelenting. The Goths accepted the terms, but for the Romans, the enforcement of their own requisitions was a work which demanded extraordinary tact and unremitting forethought. In face of this immense and sobering responsibility, which should have summoned forth all the energy and loyalty of which men were capable, the ministers of Valens, so far as we can see, did nothing. They left to chance alone the feeding of a multitude which none could number. It is not in their everyday peculations, nor in their habitual violence and oppression of the provincials, that the degradation of the bureaucracy of the empire is seen in its most hideous form. The weightiest count in the indictment is that when met by an extraordinary crisis which imperiled the existence of the empire itself, the agents of the state, with the danger in concrete form before their very eyes, failed to check their lust or bridle their avarice. Maximinus and Lupicinus kept the Goths upon the banks of the Danube in order to wring from them all they had to give, except their arms. Provisions failed utterly. For the body of a dog, a man would be bartered into slavery. As for the Goths, who remained north of the river, Athanarich, remembering that he had declined to meet Valens on Roman soil, thought it idle to pray for admission within the empire and retired, it would seem, into the highlands of Transylvania. Now, however, that the imperial garrisons had been withdrawn to watch the passage of the followers of Fritigern, the Grutungi under Alatheus and Saphrax crossed the Danube unmolested, although leave to cross the frontier had previously been refused them. Meanwhile, Fritigern slowly advanced on Marcianople, ready, if need be, to join his compatriots, who were now encamped on the south bank of the river. Still, the Goths took no hostile step, but their exclusion from Marcianople led to a brawl with Roman soldiers outside the walls. Within the city, the news reached Lupicinus, who was entertaining Alavio and Fritigern to a feast. Orders were hurriedly given for the massacre of the Gothic guardsmen who had accompanied their leaders. Fritigern, at the head of his men, fought his way back to camp, while Alavio seems to have fallen in the fray, for we hear of him no more. The peace was at an end. Nine miles from Marcianople, Lupicinus was repulsed with loss. The criminal folly of the authorities of Hadrianople forced into rebellion the loyal Gothic auxiliaries who were stationed in the town. Barbarians bartered as slaves rejoined their comrades, while labourers from the imperial gold mines played their part in spreading havoc through Thrace. Thus at last the Goths took their revenge, and only the walls of cities could resist their onset. From Asia, Valens dispatched Profetorus and Trajan to the province, and they at length succeeded in driving back the barbarian host beyond the Balkans. The Roman army occupied the passes. Gratian had sent reinforcements from the west under Frigeridus and Richoma, and the latter was associated with the generals of Valens. 
the barbarians drawing together their scattered bands, formed a huge wagon lager, Carago, at a spot called Ad Salices, not far from Tomai. The Romans were still much inferior in numbers and anxiously awaited an opportunity to pour down upon the enemy while on the march. For some time, however, the Goths made no move. When at length they attempted to seize the higher ground, the battle began. The Roman left wing was broken, and the legionaries were forced to retreat, but neither side gained any decisive advantage. The Goths remained for seven days longer within the shelter of their camp, while the Romans drove other troops of barbarians to the north of the mountain chain. Early autumn, 377. At this time, Richoma returned in order to secure further help from Gratian, while Saturninus arrived from Asia with the rank of Magister Equitum, in command, it would seem, of reinforcements. But the tide of fortune which had favoured the Romans during the previous months now ebbed. The Goths, despairing of breaking the cordon or piercing the Balkan passes by promises of unlimited booty, won over hordes of Huns and Alans to their side. Saturninus found that he could hold his position no longer and was thus forced to retire on the Rodope chain, save for a defeat at Debaltus near the sea coast, he successfully masked his retreat, while Frigeridus, who was stationed in the neighbourhood of Baroa, fell back before the enemy upon Illyricum, where he captured the barbarian leader, Phanobius, and defeated the Typhali. As in Valentinian's day, the captives were settled in the depopulated districts of Italy. The help, however, which was expected from the west, was long delayed. In February 378, the Lentienses chanced to hear from one of their fellow tribesmen, who was serving in the Roman army, that Gratian had been summoned to the east. Collecting allies from the neighbouring clans, they burst across the border some 40,000 strong. Panagyris said 70,000. Gratian was forced to recall the troops, who had already marched into Pannonia and in command of these, as well as of his Gallic legionaries, he placed Nanianus and the Frankish king Malabordes. At the Battle of Argentaria, near Colmar in Alsace, Priarius, the Bavarian king, was slain, and with him, it is said, more than 30,000 of the enemy. According to the Roman estimate, only some 5,000 escaped through the dense forests, into the shelter of the hills. Gratian in person then crossed the Rhine and after laborious operations among the mountains, starved the fugitives into surrender. By the terms of peace, they were bound to furnish recruits for the Roman army. The result of the campaign was a very real triumph for the youthful emperor of the West. Meanwhile, Sebastian, appointed in the East to succeed Trajan in the command of the infantry, was raising and training a small force of picked men with which to begin operations in the spring. In April 378, Valens left Antioch for the capital at the head of reinforcements drawn from Asia. He arrived on the 30th of May. The Goths now held the ship Pass and were stationed both north and south of the Balkans at Nicopolis and Baroa. Sebastian had successfully freed the country round Hadrianople from plundering bands, and Fritigern, concentrating the Gothic forces, had withdrawn north to Cabile. At the end of June, Valens advanced with his army from Melanthius, which lay some 15 miles west of Constantinople. Against the advice of Sebastian, the emperor determined upon an immediate march in order to reflect a junction with the forces of his nephew, who was now advancing by Lauriacum and Sirmium. The eastern army entered the Maritza Pass, but at the same time, Fritigern would seem to have dispatched some Goths southwards. These were sighted by the Roman scouts, and in fear that the passage should be blocked behind him, 
and his supplies cut off, the emperor retreated towards Hadrianople. Fritigern himself, meanwhile, marched south over the pass of Bujuk Durbant in the direction of Nyk, as though he would intercept communication between Valens and his capital. Two alternative courses were now open to the emperor. He might take up a strong position at Hadrianople and await the army of the west. This was Gratian's counsel brought by Richemer, who reached the camp on the 7th of August. Or he might at once engage the enemy. Valens adopted the latter alternative. It would seem that he underestimated the number of the Goths, and it is possible that he desired to show that he too could win victories in his own strength, as well as the Western Emperor. Sebastian, who had, at his own request, left the service of Gratian for that of Valens, may have sought to rob his former master of any further laurels. At dawn on the following morning, the 9th of August, the advance began. When about midday the armies came in sight of each other, probably near the modern Demeron Leisure, Fritigern, in order to gain time, entered into negotiations. But on the arrival of his cavalry, he felt sure of victory and struck the first blow. We cannot reconstruct the battle. Valens, Trajan and Sebastian all fell, and with them two-thirds of the Roman army. In the open country, no resistance could be offered to the victorious barbarians, but they were beaten back from the walls of Hadrianople, and a troop of Saracen horsemen repelled them from the capital. Victor bore the news of the appalling catastrophe to Gratian. In the face of hostile criticism, Valentinian had chosen Valens as his co-Augustus, intending that he should carry out in the east the same policy which he himself had planned for the west. His judgment was not at fault, for in the sphere of religion alone did the two emperors pursue different ends. Like an orderly, with unfailing loyalty, Valens obeyed his brother's instructions. He too strengthened the frontier with fortresses and lightened the burden of taxation, while under his care magnificent public buildings rose throughout the eastern provinces. But Valentinian's masterful decision of character was alien to Valens. His was a weaker nature, which under adversity easily yielded to despair. Severity, anxiously assumed, tended towards ferocity, and a consciousness of insecurity rendered him tyrannical when his life or throne was threatened. His subjects could neither forget nor forgive the horrible excuses which marked the suppression of the rebellion of Procopius or of the conspiracy of Theodorus. He was hated by the Orthodox as an Arian heretic and by the pagans as a Christian zealot, while it was upon the emperor that men laid the responsibility for the overwhelming disaster of Hadrianople. Thus there were few to judge him with impartial justice, and it is probable that even later historians have been unduly influenced by the invectives of his enemies. His imperious brother had made of an excellent civil servant an emperor who was no match for the crisis which he was fated to meet. On the news of the defeat at Hadrianople, Gratian at once turned to the general, who had shown such brilliant promise a few years before, in the defence of Moesia. The young Theodosius was recalled from his retirement in Spain and put in command of the Roman troops in Thrace. Here, it would appear, he was victorious over the Sarmatians and at Sirmium in the month of January 379, probably 19th of January 379. Gratian created him co-Augustus. It was only after long hesitation that Theodosius accepted the heavy task of restoring order in the eastern provinces. But the decision once taken there was no delay. Before the emperors parted company, their joint forces seemed to have defeated the Goths. Gratian then relinquished some of his troops in favour of Theodosius, 
and himself started with all speed for Gaul, where Franks and Vandals had crossed the Rhine. After defeating the invaders, Gratian went into winter quarters at Trier. Theodosius was left to rule the eastern prefecture, while it must perhaps remain a doubtful question whether eastern Illyricum was not also included within his jurisdiction. The course of events which led up to the final subjection of the Gothic invaders by Theodosius is for us a lost chapter in the story of East Rome. Some few disconnected fragments can, it is true, be recovered, but their setting is too often conjectural. Many have been the attempts to unravel the confused tangle of incidents which Zosimus offers in the place of an ordered history. But however the ingenuity of critics may amaze us, it rarely convinces. Even so bold a statement as that of the following paragraphs is, it must be confessed, in large measure but a hypothetical reconstruction. A pestilence had broken out amongst the barbarians besieging Thessalonica, and plague and famine drove them from the walls. The city could therefore be occupied without difficulty by Theodosius, who chose it for his base of operations. Its natural position made it an admirable centre. From it led the high road towards the north to the Danube, and towards the east to Constantinople. Its splendid harbour offered shelter to merchant ships from Asia and Egypt, and thus the army's stores and provisions could not be intercepted by the Goths while from this point military operations could be undertaken alike in Thrace and Illyricum. The first task to which Theodosius directed his commanding energy was the restoration of discipline among his disorganised troops. No longer did the emperor hold himself aloof, an unapproachable being hedged about with awe and majesty. The conception, which had, since Diocletian, become a court tradition, gave place to the liberality and friendliness of a captain in the midst of his men. Early in June, Theodosius reached Thessalonica and dispatched Moderes, a barbarian of royal blood, to sweep the Goths from Thrace. Falling upon the unsuspecting foe, the Romans massacred a host of marauders laden with the booty of the provinces. The legionaries recovered confidence in themselves and the main body of the invaders was driven northwards. The emperor himself, with Thessalonica secured and garrisoned, marched north towards the Danube to Scupai, Uscub, 6th of July, 379, and Vicus Augusti, 2nd of August. From the first he was determined to win the victory, if it were possible, rather by conciliation than armed force. It would seem probable that even in the year 379, he was enrolling Goths among his troops and converting bands of pillagers into Roman subjects. But in his winter quarters at Thessalonica, the emperor was struck down by disease and for long his life hung in the balance. February 380. He prepared himself for his end by baptism. The magical sacrament which obliterated all sin and was therefore postponed till the hour when life itself was ebbing. Military action was paralysed and the fruits of the previous year's campaign were lost. The Goths took fresh courage. Fritigern led one host into Thessaly, Epirus and Acacia and Achai. Another under Alatheus and Saphrax devastated Pannonia while Nicopolis was lost to the Romans. Gratian hastened perforce to the help of his disabled colleague. Bauto and Arbogast were dispatched to check the Goths in the north, and in the summer Gratian himself marched to Sirmium, where he concluded a truce with the barbarians, under which the Romans were to supply provisions, while the Goths furnished recruits for the army. It is probable that Gratian and Theodosius met in conference at Sirmium in September. The danger in the south was averted by the death of Fritigern. Without a leader, the Gothic host 
turned once more southwards. In the autumn, Theodosius was back in Thessalonica, and in November, he entered Constantinople in triumph. This fact of itself must signify that the immediate peril was past. End of section 27「Section 28 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. Section 28. Chapter 8, Part 3. The Dynasty of Valentinian and Theodosius the Great, by Norman H. Baines. Meanwhile, Sebastian, appointed in the east to succeed Trajan in the command of the infantry, was raising and training a small force of picked men, with which to begin operations in the spring. In April 378, Valens left Antioch for the capital, at the head of reinforcements drawn from Asia. He arrived on the 30th of May. The Goths now held the ship Capas and were stationed both north and south of the Balkans at Nicopolis and Baroa. Sebastian had successfully freed the country round Hadrianople from plundering bands and Fritigern concentrating the Gothic forces had withdrawn north to Cabile. At the end of June, Valens advanced with his army from Melanthius which lay some 15 miles west of Constantinople. Against the advice of Sebastian, the emperor determined upon an immediate march in order to reflect a junction with the forces of his nephew, who was now advancing by Lauriacum and Sirmium. The eastern army entered the Maritza Pass, but at the same time, Fritigern would seem to have dispatched some Goths southwards. These were sighted by the Roman scouts, and in fear that the passage should be blocked behind him and his supplies cut off, the emperor retreated towards Hadrianople. Fritigern himself, meanwhile, marched south over the pass of Bujuk Durbant in the direction of Nike, as though he would intercept communication between Valens and his capital. Two alternative courses were now open to the emperor. He might take up a strong position at Hadrianople and await the army of the west. This was Gratian's council brought by Richemer, who reached the camp on the 7th of August. Or he might at once engage the enemy. Valens adopted the latter alternative. It would seem that he underestimated the number of the Goths, and it is possible that he desired to show that he too could win victories in his own strength, as well as the Western Emperor. Sebastian, who had, at his own request, left the service of Gratian for that of Valens, may have sought to rob his former master of any further laurels. At dawn on the following morning, the 9th of August, the advance began. When, about midday, the armies came in sight of each other, probably near the modern Demeran Leisure, Fritigern, in order to gain time, entered into negotiations. But on the arrival of his cavalry, he felt sure of victory and struck the first blow. We cannot reconstruct the battle. Valens, Trajan and Sebastian all fell, and with them two-thirds of the Roman army. In the open country, no resistance could be offered to the victorious barbarians, but they were beaten back from the walls of Hadrianople and a troop of Saracen horsemen repelled them from the capital. Victor bore the news of the appalling catastrophe to Gratian. In the face of hostile criticism, Valentinian had chosen Valens as his co-Augustus, intending that he should carry out in the east the same policy which he himself had planned for the west. His judgment was not at fault, for in the sphere of religion alone, did the two emperors pursue different ends. Like an orderly, with unfailing loyalty, Valens obeyed his brother's instructions. 
he too strengthened the frontier with fortresses and lightened the burden of taxation. Security rendered him tyrannical when his life or throne was threatened. His subjects could neither forget nor forgive the horrible excuses which marked the suppression of the rebellion of Procopius or of the conspiracy of Theodorus. He was hated by the Orthodox as an Arian heretic and by the pagans as a Christian zealot, while it was upon the emperor that men laid the responsibility for the overwhelming disaster of Hadrianople. Thus there were few to judge him with impartial justice, and it is probable that even later historians have been unduly influenced by the invectives of his enemies. His imperious brother had made of an excellent civil servant an emperor who was no match for the crisis which he was fated to meet. On the news of the defeat at Hadrianople, Gratian at once turned to the general, who had shown such brilliant promise a few years before, in the defence of Moesia. The young Theodosius was recalled from his retirement in Spain and put in command of the Roman troops in Thrace. Here, it would appear, he was victorious over the Sarmatians and at Sirmium in the month of January 379, probably 19th of January 379. Gratian created him co-Augustus. It was only after long hesitation that Theodosius accepted the heavy task of restoring order in the eastern provinces. But the decision once taken there was no delay. Before the emperors parted company, their joint forces seemed to have defeated the Goths. Gratian then relinquished some of his troops in favour of Theodosius and himself started with all speed for Gaul, where Franks and Vandals had crossed the Rhine. After defeating the invaders, Gratian went into winter quarters at Trier. Theodosius was left to rule the eastern prefecture while it must perhaps remain a doubtful question whether eastern Illyricum was not also included within his jurisdiction. The course of events which led up to the final subjection of the Gothic invaders by Theodosius is for us a lost chapter in the story of East Rome. Some few disconnected fragments can, it is true, be recovered, but their setting is too often conjectural. Many have been the attempts to unravel the confused tangle of incidents which Zosimus offers in the place of an ordered history. But however the ingenuity of critics may amaze us, it rarely convinces. Even so bold a statement as that of the following paragraphs is, it must be confessed, in large measure but a hypothetical reconstruction. A pestilence had broken out amongst the barbarians besieging Thessalonica, and plague and famine drove them from the walls. The city could therefore be occupied without difficulty by Theodosius, who chose it for his base of operations. Its natural position made it an admirable centre. From it led the high road towards the north to the Danube, and towards the east to Constantinople. Its splendid harbour offered shelter to merchant ships from Asia and Egypt, and thus the army's stores and provisions could not be intercepted by the Goths, while from this point military operations could be undertaken alike in Thrace and Illyricum. The first task to which Theodosius directed his commanding energy was the restoration of discipline among his disorganised troops. No longer did the emperor hold himself aloof, an unapproachable being hedged about with awe and majesty, the conception which had, since Diocletian, become a court tradition, gave place to the liberality and friendliness of a captain in the midst of his men. Early in June, Theodosius reached Thessalonica and dispatched Moderes, a barbarian of royal blood, to sweep the Goths from Thrace. Falling upon the unsuspecting foe, the Romans massacred a host of marauders laden with the booty of the provinces. The legionaries recovered confidence in themselves and the main body of the invaders was driven northwards. The emperor himself, with Thessalonica secured and garrisoned, 
marched north towards the Danube to Skopai, Uskub, 6th of July, 379, and Vicus Augusti, 2nd of August. From the first, he was determined to win the victory, if it were possible, rather by conciliation than armed force. It would seem probable that even in the year 379, he was enrolling Goths among his troops and converting bands of pillagers into Roman subjects. But in his winter quarters at Thessalonica, the emperor was struck down by disease, and for long his life hung in the balance. February 380. He prepared himself for his end by baptism, the magical sacrament which obliterated all sin and was therefore postponed till the hour when life itself was ebbing. Military action was paralysed, and the fruits of the previous year's campaign were lost. The Goths took fresh courage. Fritigern led one host into Thessaly, Epirus and Acacia and Achai. Another under Alatheus and Saphrax devastated Pannonia, while Nicopolis was lost to the Romans. Gratian hastened perforce to the help of his disabled colleague. Bauto and Arbogast were dispatched to check the Goths in the north, and in the summer Gratian himself marched to Sirmium, where he concluded a truce with the barbarians, under which the Romans were to supply provisions, while the Goths furnished recruits for the army. It is probable that Gratian and Theodosius met in conference at Sirmium in September. The danger in the south was averted by the death of Fritigern. Without a leader, the Gothic host turned once more southwards. In the autumn, Theodosius was back in Thessalonica, and in November, he entered Constantinople in triumph. This fact of itself must signify that the immediate peril was past. End of section 28《Cambridge Medieval History》Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton《Cambridge Medieval History》Volume 1 Section 29 Chapter 8 The Dynasty of Valentinian and Theodosius the Great by Norman H. Baines Part 4. Fortune now favoured Theodosius. Fritigern, his most formidable opponent, was dead, and at length the pride of the aged Athanarich was broken. Wearied out by feuds among his own people, he, together with his followers, sought refuge amongst his foes. On the 11th of January, 381, he was welcomed beyond the city walls by Theodosius and escorted with all solemnity and kingly pomp into the capital. Fourteen days later he died and was buried by the emperor with royal honours. The magnanimity of Theodosius and the respect paid to their great chieftain did more than many military successes to subdue the stubborn Gothic tribesmen. We hear of no more battles and in the following year peace was concluded. Saturninus was empowered to offer the Goths new homes in the devastated districts of Thrace, and the victors of Hadrianople became the allies of the empire, pledged in the event of war to furnish soldiers for the imperial army. Themistius, the court orator, could express the hope that when once the wounds of strife were healed, Rome's bravest enemies would become her truest and most loyal friends. Peace was hardly won in the east before usurpation and murder threw the west into turmoil. In the early years of the reign of Gratian, Christian and pagan alike had been captivated by the grace and charm of their youthful ruler. His military success against the Lentiensis, his heroic efforts to bring help to the east in her darkest hour, and the loyal support which he had given to Theodosius, only served to heighten his popularity. The Orthodox found in him a fearless champion of their cause. The incomes of the Vestal Virgins were appropriated in part 
for the relief of the imperial treasury and in part for the purposes of the public post. In future, the immemorial sisterhood was to hold no real property whatever. The altar and statue of victory, which Julian had restored to the Senate House, and which the tolerance of Valentinian had permitted to stand undisturbed, were now ordered to be removed. 382. Damasus, Bishop of Rome, and Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, claiming to represent a Christian majority in the Senate, prevailed upon the Emperor to refuse to receive an embassy, headed by Symmachus, of the leading pagans in Rome, and the Church was overjoyed at the uncompromising zeal of their Emperor. But the radiant hopes which men had formed of Gratian were not fulfilled. His private life remained blameless, and he was still liberal and humane, but affairs of state failed to interest him, and he devoted his days to sport and exercise. His love for the chase became a passion, and he would take part in person in the wild beast hunts of the amphitheatre. Emergencies which, in the words of a contemporary, would have taxed the statementship of a Marcus Aurelius, were disregarded by the emperor. He alienated Roman sentiment by his devotion to his German troops, and although he might court popularity amongst the soldiers by permitting them to lay aside breastplate and helm and to carry the spiculum in place of the weighty pilum, yet the favours shown to the Alans outweighed all else and jealousy awoke disaffection amongst the legionaries. The malcontents were not long in finding a leader. Magnus Clemens Maximus, a Spaniard, who claimed kinship with Theodosius and had served with him in Britain, won a victory over the Picts and Scots. In spite of his protests, the Roman army in Britain held him as Augustus, early in 383, and leaving the island defenceless, he immediately crossed the channel, determined to strike the first blow. From the mouth of the Rhine, where he was welcomed by the troops Maximus marched to Paris, and here he met Gratian. For five days the armies skirmished, and then the emperor's Moorish cavalry went over to the usurper in a body. Gratian saw his forces melting away, and at length, with three hundred horsemen, fled headlong for the Alps. Nowhere could he find a refuge, for the cities of Gaul closed their gates at his approach. The accounts of his death are varied and inconsistent, but it would seem that Andragatheus was sent by Maximus, hot foot after the fugitive. At Lugdunum, by a bridge over the Rhone, Gratian was captured by means of a stratagem and was murdered within the city walls, assured of his life by a solemn oath, and thus lulled into a false security. He was treacherously stabbed by his host, while sitting at a banquet, 25th of August, 383. The murderer, who was perhaps Andragatheus himself, was highly rewarded by Maximus. Forthwith, the usurper sent his chamberlain to Theodosius to claim recognition and alliance. The historian notices, as a remarkable exception to the customs of the time, that this official was not a eunuch, and further states that Maximus would have no eunuchs about his court. Theodosius had planned a campaign of vengeance for the death of the young ruler to whom he owed so much, but on the arrival of the embassy, he temporised. It would be dangerous for him to leave the east. In Persia, Ardashir, 379-383, had just died, and the policy of the new monarch, Sapor III, 383 to 388, was quite unknown. Troubles had arisen on the frontier. The nomad Saracens had broken their treaty of alliance with Rome, and Richemer had marched on a punitive expedition. Although the Goths were now peacefully settled on Hamus and Hebrus, and had begun to cultivate their allotted lands, Although it was once more safe to travel by road, and not only by sea, yet for many years 
the Skyrie, the Carpi and the Huns broke ever and again across the boundaries of the empire and gave work to the generals of Theodosius. The newly won quiet and order in Thrace might easily have been imperiled by the absence of the emperor. With the deliberate caution that always characterised his action, save when he was seized by some gust of passion, Theodosius acknowledged his co-Augustus and ordered statues to be raised to him throughout the east. Africa, Spain, Gaul and Britain, it would seem, acknowledged Maximus, while even in Egypt the mob of Alexandria shouted for the Western Emperor. Meanwhile, upon his brother's death, Valentinian II began his personal rule in Italy. For the next few years, Ambrose and Justina fight a long-drawn duel to decide whether mother or bishop shall frame the young emperor's policy. On Justina's death, there remained no rival to challenge the influence of Ambrose. The latter was indeed throughout Valentinian's reign, the power behind the throne. Born probably in 340, the son of a Praetorian prefect of Gaul, he had been educated in Rome until in the year 374 he was appointed consularis of Emilia and Liguria. In this capacity he was present at the election, autumn 374, of a new bishop in Milan. While he was taking anxious precautions, lest the contest between Arian and Orthodox should end in bloodshed. A child's cry, says the legend, of Bishop Ambrose, suggested a candidate whom both factions agreed to accept. The city would take no refusal. Against his will, the statesman governor became the statesman bishop. Thus, in the winter of 383-4, to four, although Valentinian looked to Theodosius for help and counsel, Constantinople seemed to the court at Milan to lie at a hopeless distance, while Maximus in Gaul was perilously near. The emperor instinctively turned to Ambrose, his one powerful protector, while even Arianism forgot its feud with orthodoxy. At Justina's request, the bishop started on an embassy to secure peace between Gaul and Italy. Maximus, however, desired that Valentinian should leave Milan and that together they should consider the terms of their agreement. Ambrose objected that it was winter. How in such weather could a boy and his widowed mother cross the Alps? His own authority was only to treat for peace. He could promise nothing. Accordingly, Maximus sent his son Victor, shortly afterwards created Caesar, to Valentinian, to request his presence in Gaul. But the net had been spread in the sight of the bird, and Victor returned from his mission unsuccessful. When he arrived at Magontiacum, Ambrose left for Milan and met on the journey Valentinian's envoys bearing a formal reply to the proposals of Maximus. If the bishop's diplomacy had achieved nothing else, precious time had been gained for Bauto had occupied the Alpine passes and thus secured Italy from invasion. End of section 29section 30 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 30. Chapter 8. The Dynasty of Valentinian and Theodosius the Great by Norman H. Baines. Part 5. In the year 384, the pagan party in Rome had taken fresh heart. The emperor had raised two of their number to high office. Symmachus had been made urban prefect and pretextatus praetorian prefect. Men began to hope for a repeal of the hostile measures of Gratian. 
and a resolution of the Senate empowered Symmachus to present to Valentinian their plea for toleration and in especial for the restoration of the altar of victory. Gratian had thought, the prefect contended, that he was fulfilling the Senate's own desires, but the emperor had been misled. The Senate, nay Rome herself, prayed to retain that honoured symbol of her greatness, before which her sons for countless generations had pledged their fate. It was the loyalty to their past, and to that godhead before whom their ancestors had bowed, that had made the Roman masters of the world, and had filled their lands with increase. It was a high and noble argument, but it availed nothing before the scornful taunts of Ambrose, and Valentinian dismissed the ambassadors with a refusal. At this time, a Persian embassy arrived in Constantinople, 384, announcing the accession of Sir Paul III, 383 to 388, and bringing costly gifts for Theodosius, gems, silk and even elephants, while in 385, the emperor secured the submission of the revolted eastern tribes. In the following years, the disputed question of predominance in Armenia was revived. Stilicho was sent to represent Rome at the Persian court, and in 387, a treaty between the two great powers was concluded, whereby Armenia was partitioned. Some districts were annexed by Rome and some by Persia, while two vassal kings were in future to govern the country, some four-fifths of which was to acknowledge the supremacy of Persia, and the remaining one-fifth the lordship of Rome. Modern historians have condemned Theodosius for his acceptance of these terms, but he needed peace on the eastern frontier if he were to march against his western rival, and his predecessors had all experienced the extreme difficulty of retaining the loyalty of Armenian kings. Better a disadvantageous partition with security, he may have argued, than an independent state in secret alliance with the enemy. The emperor was, in fact, forced to recognise the strength of Persia's position. In the west, Ambrose once more travelled to Gaul, at Valentinian's request, upon a diplomatic mission, probably at the end of 385 or in 386. He sought the consent of Maximus to the burial of Gratian's corpse in Italian soil, but permission was refused. Maximus was heard to regret that he had not invaded Italy on Gratian's death. Ambrose and Bauto, he muttered, had foiled his schemes. When the bishop returned to Milan, he was convinced that the peace could not endure. Indeed, events showed the profound suspicion and mistrust which underlay fair-seeming concord. Bauto was still holding the Alpine passes when the Juthungi, a branch of the Alamanni, entered Raisha to rob and plunder. Bauto desired that domestic pillage should recall the tribesmen to their homes, and at his instigation, the Huns and Alans, who were approaching Gaul, were diverted and fell upon the territory of the Alamanni. Maximus complained that hordes of marauders were being brought to the confines of his territory, and Valentinian was forced to purchase the retreat of his own allies. Preparing for the coming struggle with Maximus, absorbed the attention of Theodosius in the east, and the exceptional expenditure placed a severe strain upon his resources. In one and the same year, it would seem, January 387, the emperor celebrated his own decennalia and the quinquennalia of his son Arcadius, who had been created Augustus in the year 383. On the occasion of this double festival, heavy sums in gold were needed for distribution as donatives among the troops. 
In consequence, an extraordinary tax was laid upon the city of Antioch, and the magnitude of the sum demanded reduced the senators and leading citizens to despair. But with the inherited resignation of the middle classes of the Roman Empire, they yielded to inexorable fate. Not so the populace. Turbulent spirits with little to lose, and led by foreigners, clamoured round the bishop Flavian's house. In his absence, their numbers swollen by fresh recruits from the city mob, they burst into the public baths intent on destruction, and then overturning the statues of the imperial family, dashed them to pieces. One house was already in flames, and a move had been made towards the imperial palace, when at length the authorities took action. The governor, or comms orientis, interfered and the crowd was dispersed. Immediately the citizens were seized with hopeless dismay as they realised the horror of their crime. A courier was forthwith dispatched with the news to the emperor, while the authorities, attempting to atone by feverish violence for past neglect, began with indiscriminate haste to condemn to death men, women and even children. Some were burned alive and others were given to the beasts in the arena. The glory of the East saw her streets deserted and men awaited in shuddering terror the arrival of the imperial commissioners. While Chrysostom, in his Lenten homilies, endeavoured to rouse his flock from their anguish of dread, while Libanius strove to stay the citizens from headlong flight, the aged Flavian, braving the hardships of winter, journeyed to Constantinople to plead with Theodosius. On Monday of the third week of the fast, the commissioners arrived, Caesarius, Magister Officiorum, and Helibicus, Magister Militia, bearing with them the Emperor's edict. Baths, circus and theatres were to be closed. The public distribution of grain was to cease, and Antioch was to lose her proud position and be subject to her rival, Laodicea. On the following Wednesday, the commission began its sittings. Confessions were wrung from the accused by torture and scourgings, but to the unbounded relief of all, no death sentences were passed, and judgment upon the guilty was left to the decision of Theodosius. Caesarius himself started with his report for the capital. Sleepless and unresting, he covered the distance between Antioch and Constantinople in the incredibly short space of six days. The prayers of Flavian had calmed the emperor's anger, and the passionate appeal of Caesarius carried the day. Already the principal offenders had paid the forfeit of their lives. The city, in its agony of terror, had drained its cup of suffering. Let Theodosius have mercy and stay his hand. The news of a complete amnesty was borne hot foot to Antioch, and to the joy of Easter were added the transports of a pardoned city. End of section 30section 31 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. Section 31. Chapter 8. The Dynasty of Valentinian and Theodosius the Great by Norman H. Baines. Chapter 8, Part 6. At length in the West, the formal peace was broken, and in 387, the army of Gaul invaded Italy. Of late, Justina's influence had gained the upper hand in Milan, and the Arianism of Valentinian afforded a laudable pretext for the action of Maximus. He came as the champion of oppressed orthodoxy. Previous warnings had produced no effect on the heretical court. It must be chastened by the scourge of God. 
It would seem that Valentinian's opposition to Ambrose had for the time alienated the bishop, and the emperor no longer chose him as his ambassador. Dominus sought to strengthen good relations between Trier and Milan, and asked that help should be given in the task of driving back the barbarians who threatened Pannonia. The cunning of Maximus seized the favourable moment. He detached a part of his own army with orders to march to the support of Valentinian. He himself, however, at the head of his troops, followed close behind and was thus able to force the passes of the Cotian Alps unopposed. This treacherous attack upon Valentinian was marked by the murder of Meribordes, the minister who had carried through the hasty election at Bregescio, autumn 387. From Milan, Justina and her son fled to Aquileia. From Aquileia to Thessalonica, where they were joined by Theodosius, who had recently married Gala, the sister of Valentinian II. Here it would seem that the Emperor of the East received an embassy from Maximus, the latter doubtless claiming that he had only acted in the interests of the Creed of Nicaea, of which his co-Augustus was so staunch a champion. The action of Theodosius was characteristic. He gave no definite reply, while he endeavoured to convert the fugitive emperor to orthodoxy. The whole winter through he made his preparations for the war, which he could no longer honourably escape. Goths, Huns and Alans readily enlisted. Pacatus tells us that from the Nile to the Caucasus, from the Taurus range to the Danube, men streamed to his standards. Promoters who had recently annihilated a host of Grutungi under Odotheus upon the Danube, 386, commanded the cavalry and Tamasius the infantry. Among the officers were Richemer and Arbogast. In June, Theodosius, with Valentinian, marched towards the west. He could look for no support from Italy, for Rome had fallen into the hands of Maximus during the preceding January, and the usurper's fleet was cruising in the Adriatic. Theodosius reached Stobai on June the 14th, and Scupai, or Scub, on June the 21st. It would seem that emissaries of Maximus had spread disaffection among the Germans in the Eastern Army. But a plot to murder Theodosius was disclosed in time, and the traitors were cut down in the swamps to which they had fled for refuge. The emperor advanced to Siscia on the save. Here, despite their inferiority in numbers, his troops swam the river and charged and routed the enemy. It is possible that in this engagement, Andragathius, the foremost general on the side of Maximus, met his death. Theodosius won a second victory at Poetovio, where the Western forces under the command of the usurper's brother, Marcellinus, fled in wild disorder. Many joined the victorious army, and Imana, Lyback, which had stubbornly withstood a long siege, welcomed Theodosius within its walls. Maximus retreated into Italy and encamped around Achelia, but he was allowed no opportunity to collect fresh forces wherewith to renew the struggle. Theodosius followed hard on the fugitive's track. Maximus, with the courage of despair, fell upon his pursuers, but was driven back into Achelia and forced to surrender. Three miles from the city walls, the captive was brought into the emperor's presence. The soldiers anticipated the victor's pity and hurried Maximus off to his death, probably 28th of July, 388. Only a few of his partisans, among them his Moorish guards, shared their leader's fate. His fleet was defeated off Sicily and Victor, who had been left as Augustus in Gaul, was slain by Arbogast. A general pardon quieted unrest in Italy, and Theodosius remained in Milan during the winter. Valentinian was restored to power, 
and with the death of his mother Justina, his conversion to orthodoxy was completed. Maximus had fallen, and for a court orator, his character possessed no redeeming feature. But from less prejudiced authorities, we seem to gain a picture of a man whose only fault was his enforced disloyalty to Theodosius, and of an emperor who showed himself a vigorous and upright ruler, and who could plead as excuse for his avarice the pressure of long-threatened war with his co-Augustus. From these exactions, which were perhaps unavoidable, Gaul suffered severely, and on his departure from the West, while Nanianus and Quintinus were acting as joint magistri militum, the Franks burst across the Rhine under Jena borders, Marcomere and Sunno, and threatened Cologne. After a Roman victory at the Silver Carvanaria near Tournai, Quintinus invaded barbarian territory from Novaceum, but the campaign was a disastrous failure. On the fall of Victor, Arbogast remained under the vague title of Cums or Count, the virtual ruler of Gaul, while Carietto and Cyrus succeeded as Magistri Militum, the nominees of Maximus. Arbogast, on his arrival, counselled a punitive expedition but it was seen that Theodosius did not accept the advice. A peace was concluded. Marcomir and Sunno gave hostages, and Arbogast himself retired to winter quarters in Trier. Valentinian remained with Theodosius in Milan during the winter of 388-9, to and was with him on the 13th of June 389, when he made his solemn entry into Rome accompanied by his five-year-old son, Honorius. On this, apparently his only visit to the western capital, he anxiously endeavoured to weaken the power and influence of paganism, while he effected reforms both in the social and municipal life of the city. To the stern and haughty Diocletian, the familiarity of the populace had been insufferable. Theodosius was liberal with his gifts, attended the public games and won all hearts by his ready courtesy and genial humanity. In the autumn of 389 he returned to Milan and there he remained during 390, that memorable year in which church and state met as opposing powers and a righteous victory lay with the church. In fact, he who would write of affairs of state during the last years of the 4th century must ever go borrowing from the church historians. He dare not at his peril omit the figure of the counsellor of emperor after emperor the fearless, tyrannous, passionate and loving bishop of Milan. Though the conduct of Ambrose may at times be arbitrary and repellent, the critic in his own despite admits perforce that he was a man worthy of a sovereign's trust and confidence. The facts of the massacre of Thessalonica are well known. Popular discontent had been aroused by the billeting upon the inhabitants of barbarian troops and resentment sought its opportunity. Botherich, captain of the garrison, imprisoned a favourite charioteer for gross immorality and refused to free him at the demand of the citizens. The mob seized the occasion, disappointed of its pleasure. It murdered Botherich with savage brutality. The anger of Theodosius was ungovernable, and the repeated prayers of Ambrose for mercy were of no avail. The court circle had long been jealous of the bishop's influence, and had endeavoured to exclude him from any interference with state policy. Ambrose knew well that he no longer enjoyed the full confidence of the emperor. Theodosius listened to his ministers, who urged an exemplary punishment, and the order was issued for a ruthless vengeance upon Thessalonica. The message cancelling the imperial command arrived too late to save the city. The emperor had decreed retribution, and his officers gave rein to their passions. Upon the people crowded in the circus, the soldiers poured and an indiscriminate slaughter ensued. At least 7,000 victims fell, 
before the troops stayed their hand. Ambrose, pleading illness, withdrew from Milan and refused to meet Theodosius. With his own hand he wrote a private letter to the emperor, acknowledging his zeal and love for God, but claiming that for such a crime of headlong passion there must be profound contrition. As David listened to Nathan, so let Theodosius hear God's minister. Until repentance he dare not offer the sacrifice in the emperor's presence. The letter is the appeal of undaunted courage to the essential nobility of the character of Theodosius. The gusts of fury passed and remorse issued in penitence. With his subjects around him in the Cathedral of Milan, the emperor, stripped of his royal purple, bowed himself in humility before the offended majesty of heaven. Men have sought to heighten the victory of the church, and fables have clustered round the story. But the dignity of fact, in its simplicity, is far more splendid than the ornate fancies of any legend. Bishop and emperor had proved each worthy of the other. In 391, Theodosius returned to Constantinople by way of Thessalonica, and Valentinian was left to rule the West. He did not reach Gaul till the autumn of 391. It was too late. Three years of undisputed power had left Arbogast without a rival in Gaul. It was not the troops alone who looked to their unconquered captain with blind admiration and unquestioning devotion. He was surrounded by a circle of Frankish fellow countrymen who owed to him their promotion, while his honourable character, his generosity and the sheer force of his personality had brought even the civil authorities to his side. There was one law in Gaul, and that was the will of Arbogast. There was only one superior whom Arbogast acknowledged, and he was the Emperor Theodosius, who had given the West into his charge. From the first, Valentinian's authority was flouted. His legislative power was allowed to rust unused. His orders were disobeyed, and his palace became his prison. Not even the imperial purple could protect Harmonius, who was slain by Arbogast's orders at the emperor's very feet. Valentinian implored support from Theodosius and contemplated seeking refuge in the east. He solemnly handed the haughty count his dismissal, but Arbogast tore the paper in pieces with the retort that he would only receive his discharge from the emperor who had appointed him. A letter was dispatched by Valentinian urging Ambrose to come to him with all speed to administer the sacrament of baptism. Clearly he thought his life was threatened. He hailed the pretext of barbarian disturbances about the Alpine passes and himself prepared to leave for Italy. But mortification and pride kept him still in Vienne. The pagan party considered restoration of the altar of victory, but the disciple of Ambrose refused the ambassador's request. A few days later it was known that Valentinian had been strangled. Contemporaries could not determine whether he had met his death by violence or by his own hand. 15th of May 392. Ambrose seems to have accepted the latter alternative and the guilt of Arbogast was never proven. With the longed-for rite of baptism so near at hand, suicide certainly appears improbable, but perhaps the strain and stress of those days of waiting broke down the emperor's endurance, and the mockery of his position became too bitter for a son of Valentinian I. His death, it must be admitted, did not find Arbogast unprepared. He could not declare himself emperor, for Christian hatred, Roman pride and Frankish jealousy barred the way. Thus he became the first of a long line of barbarian kingmakers. He overcame the reluctance of Eugenius and placed him on the throne. The first sovereign to be at once the nominee and puppet of a barbarian general was a man of good family formerly a teacher of rhetoric and later a high-placed secretary in the imperial service, the friend of Richemur, Ansimachus, 
and a peace-loving civilian, he would not endanger Arbogast's authority. Himself a Christian, although an associate of the pagan aristocrats in Rome, he was unwilling to alienate the sympathies of either party and adopted an attitude of impartial tolerance. He hoped to find safety in half measures. Rome saw a feverish revival of the old faith with strange processions of oriental deities, while Flavianus, a leading pagan, was made Praetorian prefect. The altar of victory was restored, but Eugenius sought to respect Christian prejudices, and the temples did not recover their confiscated revenues. These were granted as a personal gift to the petitioners. But in the 4th century, none save minorities would hear of toleration and men drew the inference that he who was no partisan was little better than a traitor. The Orthodox Church, in the person of Ambrose, withdrew from Eugenius, as from an apostate. The new emperor naturally recognised Theodosius and Arcadius as co-Augusti, but in all the transactions between the Western Court and Constantinople, the person of Arbogast was discreetly veiled. His name was not suggested for the consulship, and it was no Frankish soldier who headed the embassy to Theodosius. The wisdom of Athens in the person of Rufinus and the purity of Christian bishops attested the kingmaker's innocence, but the ambiguous reply of Theodosius hardly disguised his real intentions. The nomination of Eugenius was, it would seem, disregarded in the East, while in West and East alike, diplomacy was but a means for gaining time before the inevitable arbitrament of war. To secure Gaul during his absence, Arbogast determined to impress the barbarians with a wholesome dread of the power of Rome. In a winter campaign, he devastated the territories of Bructeri and Chamavai, while Alamanni and Franks were forced to accept terms of peace, whereby they agreed to furnish recruits for the Roman armies. Thus freed from anxiety in the west, Arbogast and Eugenius left with large reinforcements for Italy, where it seems that the new emperor had been acknowledged from the time of his accession, spring 393. In the following year, Theodosius marched from Constantinople, end of May, 394. Honorius, who had been created Augustus in January 393, was left behind with Arcadius in the capital. The emperor appointed Tomasius as general-in-chief with Stilicho for his subordinate. Immense preparations had been made for the campaign. Of the Goths alone, some 20,000 under the leadership of Saul. Gainus and Bacarius had been enlisted in the army. Arbogast, either through the claim of kinship or as virtual ruler of the West, could bring into the field large forces of both Franks and Gauls, but he was outnumbered by the troops of Theodosius. Eugenius did not leave Milan till the 1st of August. Flavianus, Flavianus as augur, declared the victory was assured. He had himself undertaken the defence of the passes of the Julian Alps, where he placed gilded statues of Jupiter to declare his devotion to paganism. Theodosius overcame all resistance with ease, and Flavianus, discouraged and ashamed, committed suicide. At about an equal distance between Aemona and Achillea, on the stream of the Frigidus, Whitbark, the decisive battle took place. The Western army was encamped in the plain, awaiting the descent of Theodosius from the heights. Arbogast had posted Arbicio in ambush with orders to fall upon the unsuspecting troops as they left the higher ground. The Goths led the van and were the first to engage the enemy. Despite their heroic valour, the attack was unsuccessful. Bacorius was slain, and 10,000 Goths lost their lives. Eugenius, as he rewarded his soldiers, 
considered the victory decisive, and the generals of Theodosius counselled retreat. Through the hours of the night, the emperor prayed alone, and in the morning, 6th of September, with the battle cry of, Where is the god of Theodosius? He renewed the struggle. Arbicio played the traitor's part, and leaving his hiding place joined the eastern army. But it was no human aid which decided the issue of the day. A tempestuous hurricane swept down upon the enemy, blinded by clouds of dust, their shields wrenched from their grasp, their missiles carried back upon themselves. The troops of Eugenius turned in panic flight. Theodosius had called on God, and heaven had answered. The moral effect was overwhelming. Eugenius was surrendered by his own soldiers and slain. Arbogast fled into the mountains and two days later fell by his own hand. Theodosius did not abuse his victory. He granted a general pardon. Even the usurper's ministers lost only their rank and titles, which were restored to them in the following year. But the fatigues and hardships of the war had broken down the emperor's health. Honorius was summoned from Constantinople and was present in Milan at his father's death, 17th of January 395. From the invective of heathen critics and the flattery of court orators, it is no easy task rightly to estimate the character and work of Theodosius. To the Christians he was naturally first and foremost the founder of an orthodox state, and the scourge of heretics and pagans. While to the worshippers of the older faith, it was precisely his religious views and the legislation inspired by them which inflamed their furious resentment. The judgment of both parties on the emperor's policy as a whole was determined by their religious preconceptions. Rome at least was his debtor, in the darkest hour after the disaster at Hadrianople, he had not despaired of the empire, but had proved himself at once statesman and general. The Goths might have become to the provinces of the east what the Alamanni had long been to Gaul. The fact that it was otherwise was primarily due to the diplomacy of Theodosius. Retrenchment and economy, a breathing space in which to recover from her utter exhaustion, were a necessity for the Roman world. A brilliant and meteoric sovereign would have been but an added peril. To the men of his time, the unwearying caution of Theodosius was a positive and precious virtue. His throne was supported by no hereditary dynastic sentiment, and he thus consciously and deliberately made a bid for public favour. He abandoned court tradition and appealed with the directness of a soldier to the sympathies of his subjects. In this he was justified. Throughout his reign it was only in the West that usurpers arose, and even they would have been content to remain his colleagues, had he only consented. But this was not the only result of his refusal to play the demigod. Valentinian had often been perforce, fool of his ministers, but Theodosius determined to gather his own information and to see for himself the abuses from which the empire suffered. His legislation is essentially detailed and practical. The accused must not be hailed off forthwith on information laid against him, but must be given 30 days to put his house in order. Provision is to be made for the children of the criminal, whether he be banished or executed for they are not to suffer for their father's sins. And some share of the convict's property is to pass to his issue. Men are not to be ruined by any compulsion to undertake high priestly offices, as that of the high priesthood of the province of Syria, which entailed the holding of costly public games. Provincials should not be driven to sell corn to the state below its market price while corn from seacoast lands is to be shipped to neighbouring seacoast towns and not to distant inland districts, in order that the cost of transport may not ruin the farmer. Fixed measures in metal and stone must be used by imperial tax collectors, 
that extortion may be made more difficult, while defensores are to be appointed to see to it that through the connivance of the authorities, robbers and highwaymen shall not escape unpunished. Theodosius himself had superintended the work of clearing Macedonia from troops of brigands, and he directed that men were to be permitted to take the law into their own hands if robbed on the high roads or in the villages by night, and might slay the offender where he stood. Examples might be increased at will, but such laws as these suffice to illustrate the point. In a word, Theodosius knew where the shoe pinched, and he did what he could to ease the pain. Even when claims of church and state conflicted, he refused to sacrifice justice to the demands of orthodox intolerance. In one case, the tyrannous insistence of Ambrose conquered, and Christian monks who had at Callinicum destroyed a Jewish synagogue were at last freed from the duty of making reparation. But even here the stubborn resistance of the emperor shows the general principles which governed his administration. Though naturally merciful, so that contemporaries wondered at his clemency towards the followers of defeated rivals, yet when seized by some sudden outburst of passion, he could be terrible in his ferocity. He himself was conscious of his great failing, and when his anger had passed, men knew that he was the readier to pardon. Prerogativa ignocendi, irat indignatum fuis. But with every acknowledgement made of his weakness, he served the empire well. He brought the East from chaos into order, and even if it be on other grounds, Posterity can hardly dispute the judgment of the church or deny that the emperor has been rightly styled Theodosius the Great. End of section 31